how this book was written, and why. In 1909, I was one of the unhappiest lads in New York. I was selling motor trucks for a living. I didn't know what made a motor truck run, and that wasn't all. I didn't want to know. I despised my job. I despised living in a cheap furnished room on West 56th Street, a room infested with cockroaches. I still remember that I had a bunch of neckties hanging on the walls, and when I reached out of the morning to get a fresh necktie, the cockroaches scattered in all directions. I despised having to eat in cheap, dirty restaurants that were also probably infested with cockroaches. I came home to my lonely room each night with a sick headache, a headache bred and fed by disappointment, worry, bitterness, and rebellion. I was rebelling because the dreams I had nourished back in my college days had turned into nightmares. Was this life? Was this the vital adventure to which I had looked forward so eagerly? Was this all life would ever mean to me, working at a job I despised, living with cockroaches, eating vile food, and with no hope for the future? I longed for the leisure to read and to write the books I had dreamed of writing back in my college days. I knew I had everything to gain and nothing to lose by giving up the job I despised. I wasn't interested in making a lot of money, but I was interested in making a lot of living. In short, I had come to the Rubicon, to that moment of decision which faces most young people when they start out in life. So I made my decision, and that decision completely altered my future. It has made the rest of my life happy and rewarding beyond my most utopian aspirations. My decision was this. I would give up the work I loathed, and since I had spent four years studying in the State Teachers College in Warrensburg, Missouri, preparing to teach, I would make my living teaching adult classes in night schools. Then I'd have my days free to read books, prepare lectures, write novels and short stories. I wanted to live to write and write to live. What subject should I teach to adults at night? As I look back and evaluated my own college training, I saw that the training and experience I had had in public speaking had been of more practical value to me in business and in life than everything else I had studied in college all put together. Why? Because it had wiped out my timidity and lack of self-confidence and given me the courage and assurance to deal with people. It had also made clear that leadership usually gravitates to the man who can get up and say what he thinks. I applied for a position teaching public speaking in the night extension courses both at Columbia University and New York University, but these universities decided they could struggle along somehow without my help. I was disappointed then, but now I thank God that they did turn me down, because I started teaching at YMCA night schools, where I had to show concrete results and show them quickly. What a challenge that was! These adults didn't come to my classes because they wanted college credits or social prestige. They came for one reason only. They wanted to solve their problems. They wanted to be able to stand up on their feet and say a few words at a business meeting without fainting from fright. Salesmen wanted to be able to call on a tough customer without having to walk around the block three times to get up courage. They wanted to develop poise and self-confidence. They wanted to get ahead in business. They wanted to have more money for their families. And since they were paying for their tuition on an installment basis, and they stopped paying if they didn't get results, and since I was being paid not a salary but a percentage of the profits, I had to be practical if I wanted to eat. I felt at the time that I was teaching under a handicap, but I realize now that I was getting priceless training. I had to motivate my students. I had to help them solve their problems. I had to make each session so inspiring that they wanted to continue coming. It was exciting work. I loved it. I was astounded at how quickly these businessmen developed self-confidence and how quickly many of them secured promotions and increased pay. The classes were succeeding far beyond my most optimistic hopes. Within three seasons, the YMCA's, which had refused to pay me $5 a night in salary, were paying me $30 a night on a percentage basis. 
At first, I taught only public speaking, but as the years went by, I saw that these adults also needed the ability to win friends and influence people. Since I couldn't find an adequate textbook on human relations, I wrote one myself. It was written. Uh, no, it wasn't written in the usual way. It grew and evolved out of the experiences of the adults in these classes. I called it "How to Win Friends and Influence People." Since it was written solely as a textbook for my own adult classes, and since I had written four other books that no one had ever heard of, I never dreamed that it would have a large sale. I am probably one of the most astonished authors now living. As the years went by, I realized that another of the biggest problems of these adults was worry. A large majority of my students were businessmen, executives, salesmen, engineers, accountants, a cross section of all the trades and professions, and most of them had problems. There were women in the classes, business women and housewives. They too had problems. Clearly, what I needed was a textbook on how to conquer worry. So again, I tried to find one. I went to New York's great public library at Fifth Avenue and Forty Second Street, and discovered, to my astonishment, that this library had only twenty-two books listed under the title "Worry." I also noticed, to my amusement, that it had one hundred eighty-nine books listed under "Worms," almost nine times as many books about worms as about worry. Astounding, isn't it? Since worry is one of the biggest problems facing mankind, you'd think, wouldn't you, that every high school and college in the land would give a course on how to stop worrying? Yet, if there is even one course on that subject in any college in the land, I have never heard of it. No wonder David Seabury said in his book "How to Worry Successfully." We come to maturity with as little preparation for the pressures of experience as a bookworm asked to do a ballet. The result: more than half our hospital beds are occupied by people with nervous and emotional troubles. I looked over these twenty-two books on worry reposing on the shelves of the New York Public Library. In addition, I purchased all the books on worry I could find. Yet I couldn't discover even one that I could use as a text in my course for adults. So I resolved to write one myself. I began preparing myself to write this book seven years ago. How? By reading what the philosophers of all ages have said about worry. I also read hundreds of biographies, all the way from Confucius to Churchill. I also interviewed scores of prominent people in many walks of life, such as Jack Dempsey, General Omar Bradley, General Mark Clark, Henry Ford, Eleanor Roosevelt, and Dorothy Dix. But that was only a beginning. I also did something else that was far more important than the interviews and the reading. I worked for five years in a laboratory for conquering worry, a laboratory conducted in our own adult classes. As far as I know, it was the first and only laboratory of its kind in the world. This is what we did: we gave students a set of rules on how to stop worrying, and asked them to apply these rules in their own lives, and then talk to the class on the results they had obtained. Others reported on techniques they'd used in the past. As a result of this experience, I presume I have listened to more talks on how I conquered worry than has any other individual who ever walked this earth. In addition, I read hundreds of other talks on how I conquered worry, talks that were sent to me by mail, talks that had won prizes in our classes that are held throughout the world. So this book didn't come out of an ivory tower. Neither is it an academic preachment on how worry might be conquered. Instead, I've tried to write a fast-moving, concise, documented report on how worry has been conquered by thousands of adults. One thing is certain: this book is practical. You can set your teeth in it. Science, said the French philosopher Valéry, is a collection of successful recipes. That's what this book is: a collection of successful and time-tested recipes to rid our lives of worry. However, let me warn you: you won't find anything new in it, but you will find much that's not generally applied. And when it comes to that, you and I don't need to be told anything new. We already know enough to lead perfect lives. We've all read the Golden Rule and the Sermon on the Mount. Our trouble is not ignorance, but inaction. 
The purpose of this book is to restate, illustrate, streamline, air condition, and glorify a lot of ancient and basic truths and kick you in the shins and make you do something about applying them. You didn't pick up this book to read about how it was written. You're looking for action. All right, let's go. Please read parts one and two of this book, and then if by that time you don't feel you've acquired a new power and a new inspiration to stop worry and enjoy life, then toss this book away. It is no good for you. How to Stop Worrying and Start Living by Dale Carnegie Part one. Fundamental Facts You Should Know About Worry Chapter 1 Live in Day-Tight Compartments In the spring of 1871, a young man picked up a book and read 21 words that had a profound effect on his future. A medical student at the Montreal General Hospital, he was worried about passing the final examination, worried about what to do, where to go, how to build up a practice, how to make a living. The 21 words that this young medical student read in 1871 helped him to become the most famous physician of his generation. He organized the world-famous Johns Hopkins School of Medicine. He became Regius Professor of Medicine at Oxford, the highest honor that can be bestowed upon any medical man in the British Empire. He was knighted by the King of England. When he died, two huge volumes containing 1,466 pages were required to tell the story of his life. His name was Sir William Osler. Here are the 21 words that he read in the spring of 1871, 21 words from Thomas Carlyle that helped him lead a life free from worry. Our main business is not to see what lies dimly at a distance, but to do what lies clearly at hand. Forty-two years later, on a soft spring night when the tulips were blooming on the campus, this man, Sir William Osler, addressed the students of Yale University. He told those Yale students that a man like himself, who had been a professor in four universities and had written a popular book, was supposed to have brains of a special quality. He declared that this was untrue. He said that his intimate friends knew that his brains were of the most mediocre character. What then was the secret of his success? He stated that it was owing to what he called living in day-tight compartments. What did he mean by that? A few months before he spoke at Yale, Sir William Osler had crossed the Atlantic on a great ocean liner, where the captain, standing on the bridge, could press a button, and presto, there was a clanging of machinery, and various parts of the ship were immediately shut off from one another, shut off into watertight compartments. Now, each one of you, Dr. Osler said to these Yale students, is a much more marvelous organization than the great liner, and bound on a longer voyage. What I urge is that you so learn to control the machinery as to live with day-tight compartments as the most certain way to ensure safety on the voyage. Get on the bridge and see that at least the great bulkheads are in working order. Touch a button and hear at every level of your life the iron doors shutting out the past, the dread yesterdays. Touch another and shut off with a metal curtain the future, the unborn tomorrows. Then you are safe, safe for today. Shut off the past. Let the dead past bury its dead. Shut out the yesterdays which have lighted fools the way to dusty death. The load of tomorrow added to that of yesterday, carried today, makes the strongest falter. Shut off the future as tightly as the past. The future is today. There is no tomorrow. The day of man's salvation is now. Waste of energy... Mental distress, nervous worries dog the steps of a man who is anxious about the future. Shut close, then, the great fore and aft bulkheads, and prepare to cultivate the habit of a life of day-tight compartments. Did Dr. Osler mean to say that we should not make any effort to prepare for tomorrow? No, not at all. But he did go on in that address to say that the best possible way to prepare for tomorrow is to concentrate with all your intelligence, all your enthusiasm, on doing today's work superbly today. 
That's the only possible way you can prepare for the future. Sir William Osler urged the students at Yale to begin the day with Christ's prayer, Give us this day our daily bread. Remember that the prayer asks only for today's bread. It doesn't complain about the stale bread we had to eat yesterday, and it doesn't say, Oh God, it has been pretty dry out in the wheat belts lately, and we may have another drought, and then how will I get my bread to eat next fall? Or, suppose I lose my job, oh God, how could I get bread then? No, this prayer teaches us to ask for today's bread only. Today's bread is the only kind of bread you can possibly eat. Years ago, a penniless philosopher was wandering through stony country where the people had a hard time making a living. One day a crowd gathered about him on a hill, and he gave what is probably the most quoted speech ever delivered anywhere at any time. This speech contains twenty-six words that have gone ringing down across the centuries. Take, therefore, no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Many men have rejected those words of Jesus, Take no thought for the morrow. They have rejected those words as a counsel of perfection, as a bit of mysticism. I must take thought for the morrow, they say. I must take out insurance to protect my family. I must lay aside money for my old age. I must plan and prepare to get ahead. Right, of course you must. The truth is that those words of Jesus, translated over three hundred years ago, don't mean today what they meant during the reign of King James. Three hundred years ago, the word thought frequently meant anxiety. Modern versions of the Bible quote Jesus more accurately as saying, Have no anxiety for the tomorrow. By all means, take thought for tomorrow. Yes, careful thought and planning and preparation, but have no anxiety. During the Second World War, our military leaders planned for the morrow, but they could not afford to have any anxiety. I have supplied the best men with the best equipment we have, said Admiral Ernest J. King, who directed the United States Navy, and have given them what seems to be the wisest mission. That is all I can do. Whether in war or peace, good thinking deals with causes and effects and leads to logical, constructive planning. Bad thinking frequently leads to tension and nervous breakdown. I had the privilege of interviewing Arthur Hayes Salzberger, publisher from 1935 to 1961 of one of the most famous newspapers in the world, the New York Times. Mr. Salzberger told me that when the Second World War flamed across Europe, he was so stunned, so worried about the future, that he found it almost impossible to sleep. He would frequently get out of bed in the middle of the night, take some canvas and tubes of paint, look in the mirror, and try to paint a portrait of himself. He didn't know anything about painting, but he painted anyway, to get his mind off his worries. Mr. Salzberger told me that he was never able to banish his worries and find peace until he had adopted as his motto five words from a church hymn, One Step Enough for Me. Lead kindly light, keep thou my feet. I do not ask to see the distant scene, one step enough for me. At about the same time, a young man in uniform somewhere in Europe was learning the same lesson. His name was Ted Benjamino of Baltimore, Maryland, and he had worried himself into a first-class case of combat fatigue. In April 1945, wrote Ted Benjamino, I had worried until I had developed what doctors called a spasmodic transverse colon, a condition that produced intense pain. If the war hadn't ended when it did, I'm sure I would have had a complete physical breakdown. I was utterly exhausted. I was a Graves Registration Non-Commissioned Officer for the 94th Infantry Division. My work was to help set up and maintain records of all men killed in action, missing in action, and hospitalized. I also had to help disinter the bodies of both Allied and enemy soldiers who had been killed and hastily buried in shallow graves during the pitch of battle. I had to gather up the personal effects of these men and see that they were sent back to parents or closest relatives who would prize these personal effects so much. 
I was constantly worried for fear we might be making embarrassing and serious mistakes. I was worried about whether or not I would come through all this. I was worried about whether I would live to hold my only child in my arms, a son of sixteen months whom I had never seen. I was so worried and exhausted that I lost thirty-four pounds. I was so frantic that I was almost out of my mind. I looked at my hands. They were hardly more than skin and bones. I was terrified at the thought of going home a physical wreck. I broke down and sobbed like a child. I was so shaken that tears welled up every time I was alone. There was one period soon after the Battle of the Bulge started that I wept so often that I almost gave up hope of ever being a normal human being again. I ended up in an army dispensary. An army doctor gave me some advice, which has completely changed my life. After giving me a thorough physical examination, he informed me that my troubles were mental. Ted, he said, I want you to think of your life as an hourglass. You know there are thousands of grains of sand in the top of the hourglass, and they all pass slowly and evenly through the narrow neck in the middle. Nothing you or I could do would make more than one grain of sand pass through this narrow neck without impairing the hourglass. You and I and everyone else are like this hourglass. When we start in the morning, there are hundreds of tasks which we feel that we must accomplish that day. But if we do not take them one at a time and let them pass through the day slowly and evenly, as do the grains of sand passing through the narrow neck of the hourglass, then we're bound to break our own physical or mental structure. I've practiced that philosophy ever since that memorable day that an army doctor gave it to me. One grain of sand at a time, one task at a time. That advice saved me physically and mentally during the war, and it has also helped me in my present position as public relations and advertising director for the Ad Crafters Printing and Offset Company, Incorporated. I found the same problem arising in business that had arisen during the war. A score of things had to be done at once, and there was little time to do them. We were low in stocks. We had new forms to handle, new stock arrangements, changes of address, opening and closing offices, and so on. Instead of getting taut and nervous, I remembered what the doctor had told me. One grain of sand at a time, one task at a time. By repeating those words to myself over and over, I accomplished my tasks in a more efficient manner, and I did my work without the confused, jumbled feeling that had almost wrecked me on the battlefield. One of the most appalling comments on our present way of life is that at one time, half of all the beds in our hospitals were reserved for patients with nervous and mental troubles. Patients who had collapsed under the crushing burden of accumulated yesterdays and fearful tomorrows. Yet a vast majority of those people could have avoided those hospitals, could have led happy, useful lives if they had only heeded the words of Jesus. Have no anxiety about the morrow. Or the words of Sir William Osler. Live in day-tight compartments. You and I are standing this very second at the meeting place of two eternities, the vast past that has endured forever and the future that is plunging on to the last syllable of recorded time. We can't possibly live in either of those eternities, no, not even for one split second. But by trying to do so, we can wreck both our bodies and our minds. So let's be content to live the only time we can possibly live from now until bedtime. Anyone can carry his burden, however hard, until nightfall, wrote Robert Louis Stevenson. Anyone can do his work, however hard, for one day. Anyone can live sweetly, patiently, lovingly, purely, till the sun goes down. And this is all that life really means. Yes, that is all that life requires of us. But Mrs. E. K. Shields of Saginaw, Michigan, was driven to despair, even to the brink of suicide, before she learned to live just till bedtime. In 1937, I lost my husband, Mrs. Shields said, as she told me her story. I was very depressed and almost penniless. I wrote my former employer, Mr. Leon Roach of the Roach Fowler Company of Kansas City, and got my old job back. 
I had formerly made my living selling world books to rural and town school boards. I had sold my car two years previously when my husband became ill, but I managed to scrape together enough money to put a down payment on a used car and started out to sell books again. I had thought that getting back on the road would help relieve my depression, but driving alone and eating alone was almost more than I could take. Some of the territory was not very productive, and I found it hard to make those car payments, small as they were. In the spring of 1938, I was working out of Versailles, Missouri. The schools were poor, the roads bad, and I was so lonely and discouraged that at one time I even considered suicide. It seemed that success was impossible. I had nothing to live for. I dreaded getting up each morning and facing life. I was afraid of everything. Afraid I could not meet the car payments. Afraid I could not pay my room rent. Afraid I would not have enough to eat. I was afraid my health was failing, and I had no money for a doctor. All that kept me from suicide were the thoughts that my sister would be deeply grieved, and that I didn't have enough money to pay my funeral expenses. Then one day, I read an article that lifted me out of my despondence and gave me the courage to go on living. I shall never cease to be grateful for one inspiring sentence in that article. It said, Every day is a new life to a wise man. I typed that sentence out and pasted it on the windshield of my car, where I saw it every minute I was driving. I found it wasn't so hard to live only one day at a time. I learned to forget the yesterdays, and not to think of the tomorrows. Each morning I said to myself, Today is a new life. I have succeeded in overcoming my fear of loneliness, my fear of want. I am happy and fairly successful now, and have a lot of enthusiasm and love for life. I know now that I shall never again be afraid, regardless of what life hands me. I know now that I won't have to fear the future. I know now that I can live one day at a time, and that every day is a new life to a wise man. Who do you suppose wrote this verse? Happy the man, and happy he alone, he who can call today his own, he who, secure within, can say, Tomorrow do thy worst for I have lived today. Those words sound modern, don't they? Yet they were written thirty years before Christ was born by the Roman poet Horace. One of the most tragic things I know about human nature is that all of us tend to put off living. We're all dreaming of some magical rose garden over the horizon instead of enjoying the roses that are blooming outside our windows today. Why are we such fools, such tragic fools? How strange it is, our little procession of life, wrote Stephen Leacock. The child says, when I am a big boy, but what is that? The big boy says, when I grow up, and then grown up, he says, when I get married. But to be married, what is that, after all? The thought changes to, when I'm able to retire... And then, when retirement comes, he looks back over the landscape traversed. A cold wind seems to sweep over it. Somehow he has missed it all, and it is gone. Life, we learn too late, is in the living, in the tissue of every day and hour. The late Edward S. Evans of Detroit almost killed himself with worry before he learned that life is in the living, in the tissue of every day and hour. Brought up in poverty, Edward Evans made his first money by selling newspapers, then worked as a grocer's clerk. Later, with seven people dependent upon him for bread and butter, he got a job as an assistant librarian. Small as the pay was, he was afraid to quit. Eight years passed before he could summon up the courage to start out on his own. But once he started... He built up an original investment of 55 borrowed dollars into a business of his own that made him $20,000 a year. Then came a frost, a killing frost. He endorsed a big note for a friend, and the friend went bankrupt. Quickly on top of that disaster came another. The bank in which he had all his money collapsed. He not only lost every cent he had, but was plunged into debt for $16,000. His nerves couldn't take it. I couldn't sleep or eat, he told me. I became strangely ill. 
Worry, and nothing but worry, he said, brought on this illness. One day, as I was walking down the street, I fainted and fell on the sidewalk. I was no longer able to walk. I was put to bed, and my body broke out in boils. These boils turned inward until just lying in bed was agony. I grew weaker every day. Finally, my doctor told me that I had only two more weeks to live. I was shocked. I drew up my will, and then lay back in bed to await my end. No use to struggle now or worry. I gave up, relaxed, and went to sleep. I hadn't slept two hours in succession for weeks, but now, with my earthly problems drawing to an end, I slept like a baby. My exhausting weariness began to disappear. My appetite returned. I gained weight. A few weeks later, I was able to walk with crutches. Six weeks later, I was able to go back to work. I'd been making $20,000 a year, but I was glad now to get a job for $30 a week. I got a job selling blocks to put behind the wheels of automobiles when they're shipped by freight. I'd learned my lesson now. No more worry for me. No more regret about what had happened in the past. No more dread of the future. I concentrated all my time, energy, and enthusiasm into selling those blocks. Edward S. Evans shot up fast now. In a few years, he was president of the company, the Evans Products Company. It's been listed on the New York Stock Exchange for years. If you ever fly over Greenland, you may land on Evans Field, a flying field named in his honor. Yet Edward S. Evans never would have achieved these victories if he hadn't learned to live in daytight compartments. You'll recall that the White Queen said, The rule is jam tomorrow and jam yesterday, but never jam today. Most of us are like that, stewing about yesterday's jam and worrying about tomorrow's jam instead of spreading today's jam thick on our bread right now. Even the great French philosopher Montaigne made that mistake. My life, he said, has been full of terrible misfortunes, most of which never happened. So has mine. So has yours. Think, said Dante, that this day will never dawn again. Life is slipping away with incredible speed. We're racing through space at a rate of 19 miles every second. Today is our most precious possession. It is our only sure possession. That's the philosophy of Lowell Thomas. I recently spent a weekend at his farm and noticed that he had these words from Psalm 118 framed and hanging on the wall of his broadcasting studio, where he would see them often. This is the day which the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. The writer John Ruskin had on his desk a simple piece of stone on which was carved one word, Today. And while I haven't a piece of stone on my desk, I do have a poem pasted on my mirror where I can see it when I shave every morning, a poem that Sir William Osler always kept on his desk, a poem written by the famous Indian dramatist Kalidasa. Salutation to the Dawn Look to this day, for it is life, the very life of life. In its brief course lie all the verities and realities of your existence, the bliss of growth, the glory of action, the splendor of beauty. For yesterday is but a dream, and tomorrow is only a vision. But today, well lived, makes every yesterday a dream of happiness, and every tomorrow a vision of hope. Look well, therefore, to this day. Such is the salutation to the dawn. So, the first thing you should know about worry is this. If you want to keep it out of your life, do what Sir William Osler did. 1. Shut the iron doors on the past and the future. Live in daytight compartments. Why not ask yourself these questions and write down the answers? 1. Do I tend to put off living in the present in order to worry about the future or to yearn for some magical rose garden over the horizon? 2. Do I sometimes embitter the present by regretting things that happened in the past that are over and done with? 3. Do I get up in the morning determined to seize the day, to get the utmost out of these 24 hours? 4. 
Can I get more out of life by living in day-tight compartments? 5. When shall I start to do this? Next week? Tomorrow? Today? Chapter 2. A Magic Formula for Solving Worry Situations would you like a quick, sure-fire recipe for handling worry situations? A technique you can start using right away, before you go any further in reading this book. Then let me tell you about the method worked out by Willis H. Carrier, the brilliant engineer who launched the air conditioning industry and who headed the world-famous Carrier Corporation in Syracuse, New York. It's one of the best techniques I ever heard of for solving worry problems, and I got it from Mr. Carrier personally when we were having lunch together one day at the Engineers Club in New York. When I was a young man, Mr. Carrier said, I worked for the Buffalo Forge Company in Buffalo, New York. I was handed the assignment of installing a gas cleaning device in a plant of the Pittsburgh Plate Glass Company at Crystal City, Missouri, a plant costing millions of dollars. The purpose of this installation was to remove the impurities from the gas so it could be burned without injuring the engines. This method of cleaning gas was new. It had been tried only once before and under different conditions. In my work at Crystal City, Missouri, unforeseen difficulties arose. It worked after a fashion, but not well enough to meet the guarantees we had made. I was stunned by my failure. It was almost as if someone had struck me a blow on the head. My stomach, my insides began to twist and turn. For a while, I was so worried I couldn't sleep. Finally, common sense reminded me that worry wasn't getting me anywhere, so I figured out a way to handle my problem without worrying. It worked superbly. I've been using this same anti-worry technique for more than 30 years. It is simple. Anyone can use it. It consists of three steps. Step 1. I analyzed the situation fearlessly and honestly and figured out what was the worst that could possibly happen as a result of this failure. No one was going to jail me or shoot me, that was certain. True, there was also a chance that I would lose my position, and there was also a chance that my employers would have to remove the machinery and lose the $20,000 we had invested. Step 2. After figuring out what was the worst that could possibly happen, I reconciled myself to accepting it, if necessary. I said to myself, this failure will be a blow to my record, and it might possibly mean the loss of my job. But if it does, I can always get another position. Conditions could be much worse, and as far as my employers are concerned, well, they realize that we are experimenting with a new method of cleaning gas, and if this experience costs them $20,000, they can charge it up to research, for it's an experiment. After discovering the worst that could possibly happen and reconciling myself to accepting it, if necessary, an extremely important thing happened. I immediately relaxed and felt a sense of peace that I hadn't experienced in days. Step 3. From that moment on, I calmly devoted my time and energy to trying to improve upon the worst which I had already accepted mentally. I now tried to figure out ways and means by which I might reduce the loss of $20,000 that we faced. I made several tests and finally figured out that if we spent another 5000 for additional equipment, our problem would be solved. We did this, and instead of the firm losing 20000 we made 15000 I probably would never have been able to do this if I had kept on worrying because one of the worst features about worrying is that it destroys our ability to concentrate. When we worry, our minds jump here and there and everywhere, and we lose all power of decision. However, when we force ourselves to face the worst and accept it mentally, we then eliminate all these vague imaginings and put ourselves in a position in which we are able to concentrate on our problem. Now, this incident that I have related occurred many years ago, it worked so superbly that I've been using it ever since. And as a result, my life has been almost completely free from worry. Now, why is Willis H. Carrier's magic formula so valuable and so practical, psychologically speaking? Because it yanks us down out of the great gray clouds in which we fumble about when we're blinded by worry. It plants our feet good and solid on the earth. 
we know where we stand. And if we haven't solid ground under us, how in creation can we ever hope to think anything through? Professor William James, the father of applied psychology, has been dead since 1910. But if he were alive today and could hear this formula for facing the worst, he would heartily approve it. How do I know that? Because he told his own students, Be willing to have it so. Be willing to have it so, he said, because acceptance of what has happened is the first step in overcoming the consequences of any misfortune. Would you like to see how someone adopted Willis H. Carrier's magic formula and applied it to his own problem? Well, here's one example from a New York oil dealer who was a student in my classes. I was being blackmailed, this student began. I didn't believe it was possible. I didn't believe it could happen outside of the movies, but I was actually being blackmailed. What happened was this. The oil company, of which I was the head, had a number of delivery trucks and a number of drivers. At that time, war regulations were strictly in force, and we were rationed on the amount of oil we could deliver to any one of our customers. I didn't know it, but it seems that certain of our drivers had been delivering oil short to our regular customers and then reselling the surplus to customers of their own. The first inkling I had of these illegitimate transactions was when a man who claimed to be a government inspector came to see me one day and demanded hush money. He had got documentary proof of what our drivers had been doing, and he threatened to turn this proof over to the district attorney's office if I didn't cough up. I knew, of course, that I had nothing to worry about, personally at least, but I also knew that the law says a firm is responsible for the actions of its employees. What's more, I knew that if the case came to court and it was aired in the newspapers, the bad publicity would ruin my business. And I was proud of my business. It had been founded by my father twenty-four years before. I was so worried I was sick. I didn't eat or sleep for three days and nights. I kept going around in crazy circles. Should I pay the money, five thousand dollars, or should I tell this man to go ahead and do his damnedest? Either way, I tried to make up my mind. It ended in a nightmare. Then on Sunday night, I happened to pick up the booklet on how to stop worrying, which I had been given in my Carnegie class in public speaking. I started to read it and came across the story of Willis H. Carrier, Face the worst, it said. So I asked myself, what's the worst that could happen if I refuse to pay up and these blackmailers turn their records over to the district attorney? The answer to that was, the ruin of my business. That's the worst that can happen. I can't go to jail. All that can happen is that I shall be ruined by the publicity. I then said to myself, all right, the business is ruined. I accept that mentally. What happens next? Well, with my business ruined, I would probably have to look for a job. That wasn't bad. I knew a lot about oil. There were several firms that might be glad to employ me. I began to feel better. The blue funk I had been in for three days and nights began to lift a little. My emotions calmed down, and to my astonishment, I was able to think. I was clear-headed enough now to face step three, improve on the worst. As I thought of solutions, an entirely new angle presented itself to me. If I told my attorney the whole situation, he might find a way out which I hadn't thought of. I know it sounds stupid to say that this hadn't even occurred to me before, but of course I hadn't been thinking. I had only been worrying. I immediately made up my mind that I would see my attorney first thing in the morning, and then I went to bed and slept like a log. How did it end? Well, the next morning, my lawyer told me to go and see the district attorney and tell him the truth. I did precisely that. When I finished, I was astonished to hear the D.A. say that this blackmail racket had been going on for months, and that the man who claimed to be a government agent was a crook wanted by the police. What a relief to hear all this after I had tormented myself for three days and nights wondering whether I should hand over $5,000 to this professional swindler. This experience taught me a lasting lesson. Now, whenever I face a pressing problem that threatens to worry me, I give it what I call the old Willis H. Carrier formula. If you think Willis H. Carrier had troubles, listen, you ain't heard nothing yet. Here's the story of Earl P. Haney of Winchester, Massachusetts. 
Here's the story as he told it to me himself on November 17, 1948, in the Hotel Statler in Boston. Back in the 20s, he said, I was so worried that ulcers began eating the lining of my stomach. One night I had a terrible hemorrhage. I was rushed to a hospital connected with the School of Medicine of Northwestern University of Chicago. My weight dropped from 175 pounds to 90 pounds. I was so ill, I was warned not even to lift my hand. Three doctors, including a celebrated ulcer specialist, said my case was incurable. I lived on alkaline powders and a tablespoonful of half milk and half cream every hour. A nurse put a rubber tube down into my stomach every night and morning and pumped out the contents. This went on for months. Finally, I said to myself, Look here, Earl Haney, if you have nothing to look forward to except a lingering death, you might as well make the most of the little time you have left. You have always wanted to travel around the world before you die, so if you're ever going to do it, you'll have to do it now. When I told my physicians I was going to travel around the world and pump out my own stomach twice a day, they were shocked. Impossible. They'd never heard of such a thing. They warned me that if I started around the world, I would be buried at sea. No, I won't, I replied. I have promised my relative that I will be buried in the family plot in Broken Bow, Nebraska, so I'm going to take my casket with me. I arranged for a casket put it aboard a ship, and then made arrangements with the steamship company in the event of my death to put my corpse in a freezing compartment and keep it there till the liner returned home. I set out on my trip imbued with the spirit of old Omar. Ah, make the most of what we yet may spend before we too into the dust descend. Dust into dust and under dust to lie, sans wine, sans song, sans singer, and sans end. The moment I boarded the SS President Adams in Los Angeles and headed for the Orient, I felt better. I gradually gave up my alkaline powders and my stomach pump. I was soon eating all kinds of food, even strange native mixtures and concoctions that were guaranteed to kill me. As the weeks went by, I even smoked long black cigars and drank highballs. I enjoyed myself more than I had in years. We ran into monsoons and typhoons, which should have put me in my casket, if only from fright, but I got an enormous kick out of all this adventure. I played games aboard the ship, sang songs, made new friends, stayed up half the night. When we reached China and India... I realized that the business cares that I had faced back home were paradise compared to the poverty and hunger in the Orient. I stopped all my senseless worrying and felt fine. When I got back to America, I had gained 90 pounds and had almost forgotten I even had a stomach ulcer. I had never felt better in my life. I went back to business and haven't been ill a day since. Earl P. Haney told me he realizes now that he was unconsciously using the self-same principles that Willis H. Carrier used to conquer worry. First, I asked myself, what is the worst that could possibly happen? The answer was death. Second, I prepared myself to accept death. I had to. There was no choice. The doctors said my case was hopeless. Third, I tried to improve the situation by getting the utmost enjoyment out of life for the short time I had left. If, he continued, if I had gone on worrying after boarding that ship, I have no doubt that I would have made the return voyage inside my coffin. But I relaxed. I forgot all my troubles. And this calmness of mind gave me a new burst of energy which actually saved my life. So, rule two is this. If you have a worry problem, apply the magic formula of Willis H. Carrier by doing these three things. One, ask yourself, what is the worst that can possibly happen? Two, prepare to accept it if you have to. Three, then calmly proceed to improve on the worst. Part 2. Basic Techniques in Analyzing Worry Chapter 4. 
How to analyze and solve worry problems. I keep six honest serving men. They taught me all I knew. Their names are what and why and when and how and where and who. Rudyard Kipling. Will the magic formula of Willis H. Carrier, described in Part One, Chapter Two, solve all worry problems? No, of course not. Then what is the answer? The answer is that we must equip ourselves to deal with different kinds of worries by learning the three basic steps of problem analysis. The three steps are: one, get the facts; two, analyze the facts; three, arrive at a decision and then act on that decision. Obvious stuff, yes. Aristotle taught it and used it, and you and I must use it too if we're going to solve the problems that are harassing us and turning our days and nights into veritable hells. Let's take the first rule: get the facts. Why is it so important to get the facts? Because unless we have the facts, we can't possibly even attempt to solve our problems intelligently. Without the facts, all we can do is stew around in confusion. My idea? No, that was the idea of the late Herbert E. Hawks, dean of Columbia College, Columbia University, for 22 years. He had helped 200,000 students solve their worry problems, and he told me that confusion is the chief cause of worry. He put it this way. He said, "Half the worry in the world is caused by people trying to make decisions before they have sufficient knowledge on which to base a decision." For example, he said, "If I have a problem which has to be faced at three o'clock next Tuesday, I refuse to even try to make a decision about it until next Tuesday arrives. In the meantime, I concentrate on getting all the facts that bear on the problem. I don't worry," he said. "I don't agonize over my problem. I don't lose any sleep. I simply concentrate on getting the facts." And by the time Tuesday rolls around, if I've got all the facts, the problem usually solves itself. I asked Dean Hawks if he meant he had licked worry entirely. Yes, he said. I think I can honestly say that my life is now almost totally devoid of worry. I found, he went on, that if a man will devote his time to securing facts in an impartial, objective way, his worries will usually evaporate in the light of knowledge. Let me repeat that. If a man will devote his time to securing facts in an impartial, objective way, his worries will usually evaporate in the light of knowledge. But what do most of us do? If we bother with facts at all, and Thomas Edison said in all seriousness, there is no expedient to which a man will not resort to avoid the labor of thinking. If we bother with facts at all. We hunt like bird dogs after the facts that bolster up what we already think, and ignore all the others. We want only the facts that justify our acts, the facts that fit in conveniently with our wishful thinking, and justify our preconceived prejudices. As Andre Marwa put it, everything that is in agreement with our personal desires seems true; everything that is not puts us into a rage. Is it any wonder then that we find it so hard to get at the answers to our problems? Wouldn't we have the same trouble trying to solve a second-grade arithmetic problem if we went ahead on the assumption that two plus two equals five? Yet there are a lot of people in this world who make life a hell for themselves and others by insisting that two plus two equals five, or maybe five hundred. What can we do about it? We have to keep our emotions out of our thinking, and as Dean Hawks put it, we must secure the facts in an impartial, objective manner. That's not an easy task when we're worried. When we're worried, our emotions are riding high. But here are two ideas that I've found helpful when trying to step aside from my problems in order to see the facts in a clear, objective manner. One. When trying to get the facts, I pretend that I'm collecting this information not for myself but for some other person. This helps me to take a cold, impartial view of the evidence. This helps me eliminate my emotions. Two, while trying to collect the facts about the problem that is worrying me, I sometimes pretend that I'm a lawyer preparing to argue the other side of the issue. In other words, I try to get all the facts against myself, all the facts that are damaging to my wishes, 
all the facts I don't like to face. Then I write down both my side of the case and the other side of the case, and I generally find that the truth lies somewhere in between these two extremities. Here's the point I'm trying to make. Neither you, nor I, nor Einstein, nor the Supreme Court of the United States is brilliant enough to reach an intelligent decision on any problem without first getting the facts. Thomas Edison knew that. At the time of his death, he had 2,500 notebooks filled with facts about the problems he was facing. So rule one for solving our problems is, get the facts. Let's do what Dean Hawks did. Let's not even attempt to solve our problems without first collecting all the facts in an impartial manner. However, getting all the facts in the world won't do us any good until we analyze them and interpret them. I have found from costly experience that it's much easier to analyze the facts after writing them down. In fact, merely writing the facts on a piece of paper and stating our problem clearly goes a long way toward helping us reach a sensible decision. As Charles Kettering puts it, a problem well stated is a problem half solved. Let me show you all of this as it works out in practice. Since the Chinese say one picture is worth 10,000 words, suppose I show you a picture of how one man put exactly what we're talking about into concrete action. Let's take the case of Galen Litchfield, a man I've known for several years, one of the most successful American businessmen in the Far East. Mr. Litchfield was in China in 1942 when the Japanese invaded Shanghai. And here's his story as he told it to me while a guest in my home. Shortly after the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor, Galen Litchfield began, they came swarming into Shanghai. I was the manager of the Asia Life Insurance Company in Shanghai. They sent us an army liquidator. He was really an admiral and gave me orders to assist this man in liquidating our assets. I didn't have any choice in the matter. I could cooperate or else, and the or else was certain death. I went through the motions of doing what I was told because I had no alternative. But there was one block of securities worth $750,000, which I left off the list I gave to the admiral. I left that block of securities off the list because they belonged to our Hong Kong organization and had nothing to do with the Shanghai assets. All the same, I feared I might be in hot water if the Japanese found out what I'd done, and they soon found out. I wasn't in the office when the discovery was made, but my head accountant was there. He told me that the Japanese admiral flew into a rage and stamped and swore and called me a thief and a traitor. I had defied the Japanese army. I knew what that meant. I would be thrown into the bridge house. The bridge house, the torture chamber of the Japanese Gestapo. I had had personal friends who had killed themselves rather than be taken to that prison. I had other friends who had died in that place after ten days of questioning and torture. Now I was slated for the bridge house myself. What did I do? I heard the news on Sunday afternoon. I suppose I should have been terrified, and I would have been terrified if I hadn't had a definite technique for solving my problems. For years, whenever I was worried, I had always gone to my typewriter and written down two questions, and the answer to these questions. One, what am I worrying about? Two, what can I do about it? I used to try to answer those questions without writing them down, but I stopped that years ago. I found that writing down both the questions and the answers clarifies my thinking. So that Sunday afternoon, I went directly to my room at the Shanghai YMCA and got out my typewriter. I wrote, One, what am I worrying about? I am afraid I will be thrown into the bridge house tomorrow morning. Then I typed out the second question. Two, what can I do about it? I spent hours thinking out and writing down the four courses of action I could take and what the probable consequences of each action would be. One, I can try to explain to the Japanese admiral, but he doesn't speak English. If I try to explain to him through an interpreter, I may stir him up again. That might mean death, for he is cruel, would rather dump me in the bridge house than bother talking about it. Two, I can try to escape. Impossible. They keep track of me all the time. I have to check in and out of my room at the YMCA. If I try to escape, I'll probably be captured and shot. 
Three, I can stay here in my room and not go near the office again. If I do, the Japanese admiral will be suspicious, will probably send soldiers to get me and throw me into the bridge house without giving me a chance to say a word. Four, I can go down to the office as usual on Monday morning. If I do, there's a chance that the Japanese admiral may be so busy that he will not think of what I did. Even if he does think of it, he may have cooled off and may not bother me. If this happens, I'm all right. Even if he does bother me, I'll still have a chance to try to explain to him. So going down to the office as usual on Monday morning and acting as if nothing had gone wrong gives me two chances to escape the bridge house. As soon as I thought it all out and decided to accept the fourth plan, to go down to the office as usual on Monday morning, I felt immensely relieved. When I entered the office the next morning, the Japanese admiral sat there with a cigarette dangling from his mouth. He glared at me, as he always did, and said nothing. Six weeks later, thank God, he went back to Tokyo, and my worries were ended. As I've already said, I probably saved my life by sitting down that Sunday afternoon and writing out all the various steps I could take and then writing down the probable consequences of each step and calmly coming to a decision. If I hadn't done that, I might have floundered and hesitated and done the wrong thing on the spur of the moment. If I hadn't thought out my problem and come to a decision, I would have been frantic with worry all Sunday afternoon. I wouldn't have slept that night. I would have gone down to the office Monday morning with a harassed and worried look, and that alone might have aroused the suspicion of the Japanese admiral and spurred him to act. Experience has proved to me, time after time, the enormous value of arriving at a decision. It is the failure to arrive at a fixed purpose, the inability to stop going round and round in maddening circles, that drives men to nervous breakdowns and living hells. I find that 50% of my worries vanish once I arrive at a clear, definite decision, and another 40% usually vanish once I start to carry out that decision. So I banish about 90% of my worries by taking these four steps. 1. Writing down precisely what I am worrying about. 2. Writing down what I can do about it. 3. Deciding what to do. 4 starting immediately to carry out that decision. Galen Litchfield became the Far Eastern Director for Star, Park, and Freeman Incorporated, representing large insurance and financial interests. This made him one of the most important American businessmen in Asia, and he confessed to me that he owed a large part of his success to this method of analyzing worry and meeting it head-on. Why is his method so superb? Because it's efficient concrete, and goes directly to the heart of the problem. On top of all that, it is climaxed by the third and indispensable rule, do something about it. Unless we carry out our action, all our fact-finding and analysis is whistling up wind. It's a sheer waste of energy. William James said this, When once a decision is reached, and execution is the order of the day, dismiss absolutely all responsibility and care about the outcome. In this case, William James undoubtedly used the word care as a synonym for anxiety. He meant, once you've made a careful decision based on facts, go into action. Don't stop to reconsider. Don't begin to hesitate, worry, and retrace your steps. Don't lose yourself in self-doubting, which begets other doubts. Don't keep looking back over your shoulder. I once asked Wade Phillips, one of Oklahoma's most prominent oil men, how he carried out decisions. He replied, I find that to keep thinking about our problems beyond a certain point is bound to create confusion and worry. There comes a time when any more investigation and thinking are harmful. There comes a time when we must decide and act and never look back. Why don't you employ Galen Litchfield's technique to one of your worries right now? And write down the answers to these four questions. Here's question number one. What am I worrying about? Question number two. What can I do about it? Question number three. Here's what I am going to do about it. Question number four. When am I going to start doing it?
Chapter 5. How to Eliminate 50% of Your Business Worries If you're in business, you're probably saying to yourself right now, the title of this chapter is ridiculous. I've been running my business for 19 years, and I certainly know the answers, if anybody does. The idea of anybody trying to tell me how I can eliminate 50% of my business worries, it's absurd. Fair enough. I would have felt exactly the same way myself a few years ago if I'd seen this title on a chapter. It promises a lot, and promises are cheap. But let's be very frank about it. Maybe I won't be able to help you eliminate 50% of your business worries. In the last analysis, no one can do that except yourself. But what I can do is show you how other people have done it and leave the rest up to you. You may recall that earlier in this book I quoted the world-famous Dr. Alexis Carroll as saying, Those who do not know how to fight worry die young. Since worry is that serious, wouldn't you be satisfied if I could help you eliminate even 10% of your worries? Yes? Good. Well, I'm going to show you how one business executive eliminated not 50% of his worries, but 75% of all the time he formerly spent in conferences trying to solve business problems. Furthermore, I'm not going to tell you this story about a Mr. Jones or a Mr. X or a man I knew in Ohio, vague stories that you can't check up on. It concerns a very real person. Leon Shimkin, a former partner and general manager of one of the foremost publishing houses in these United States, Simon & Schuster, Rockefeller Center, New York. Here is Leon Shimkin's experience in his own words. For 15 years, I spent almost half of every business day holding conferences, discussing problems. Should we do this or that or nothing at all? We would get tense twist in our chairs, walk the floor, argue and go around in circles. When night came, I would be utterly exhausted. I fully expected to go on doing this sort of thing for the rest of my life. I'd been doing it for 15 years, and it never occurred to me that there was a better way of doing it. If anyone had told me that I could eliminate three-fourths of all the time I spent in these worried conferences and three-fourths of my nervous strain, I would have thought he was a wild-eyed, slap-happy armchair optimist. Yet I devised a plan that did just that. I've been using this plan for eight years. It has performed wonders for my efficiency, my health, and my happiness. It sounds like magic, but like all magic tricks, it's extremely simple when you see how it's done. Here's the secret. First, I immediately stopped the procedure I had been using in my conferences for 15 years, a procedure that began with my troubled associates reciting all the details of what had gone wrong and ended up by asking, what shall we do? Second, I made a new rule, a rule that everyone who wishes to present a problem to me must first prepare and submit a memorandum answering these four questions. Question 1. What is the problem? In the old days, we used to spend an hour or two in a worried conference without anyone's knowing specifically and concretely what the real problem was. We used to work ourselves into a lather discussing our troubles without ever troubling to write out specifically what our problem was. Question 2. What is the cause of the problem? As I look back over my career, I'm appalled at the wasted hours I've spent in worried conferences without ever trying to find out clearly the conditions which lay at the root of the problem. Question 3. What are all the possible solutions of the problem? In the old days, one man in the conference would suggest one solution, someone else would argue with him, tempers would flare, we would often get clear off the subject, and at the end of the conference no one would have written down all the various things we could do to attack the problem. Question 4. What solution do you suggest? I used to go into a conference with a man who'd spent hours worrying about a situation and going around in circles without ever once thinking through all possible solutions and then writing down, this is the solution I recommend. My associates rarely come to me now with their problems. Why? Because they've discovered that in order to answer those four questions, they have to get all the facts and think their problems through. 
And after they've done that, they find in three-fourths of the cases they don't have to consult me at all, because the proper solution has popped out like a piece of bread popping out from an electric toaster. Even in those cases where consultation is necessary, the discussion takes about one-third of the time formerly required, because it proceeds along an orderly, logical path to a reasoned conclusion. Much less time is now consumed in the house of Simon and Schuster, and worrying and talking about what's wrong, a lot more action is obtained toward making those things right. My friend Frank Betker, one of the top insurance men in America, told me he not only reduced his business worries, but nearly doubled his income by a similar method. Years ago, said Frank Betker, when I first started to sell insurance, I was filled with a boundless enthusiasm and love for my work, and then something happened. I became so discouraged that I despised my work and thought of giving it up. I think I would have quit if I hadn't got the idea one Saturday morning of sitting down and trying to get at the root of my worries. One, I asked myself first, just what is the problem? The problem was that I was not getting high enough returns for the staggering amount of calls I was making. I seemed to do pretty well at selling a prospect until the moment came for closing a sale. Then the customer would say, well, I'll think it over, Mr. Betker, come in and see me again. It was the time I wasted on these follow-up calls that was causing my depression. Two, I asked myself, what are the possible solutions? But to get the answer to that one, I had to study the facts. I got out my record book for the last 12 months and studied the figures. I made an astounding discovery. Right there in black and white, I discovered that 70% of my sales had been closed on the very first interview. 23% of my sales had been closed on the second interview, and only 7% of my sales had been closed on those third, fourth, fifth, etc. interviews, which were running me ragged and taking up time. In other words, I was wasting fully one half of my working day on a part of my business which was responsible for only 7% of my sales. 3. What is the answer? The answer was obvious. I immediately cut out all the visits beyond the second interview and spent the extra time building up new prospects. The results were unbelievable. In a very short time, I had doubled the cash value of every visit I made. As I said, Frank Betker became one of the best-known life insurance salesmen in the country. But he was on the point of giving up. He was on the point of admitting failure until analyzing the problem gave him a boost on the road to success. Can you apply these questions to your business problems? To repeat my challenge, they can reduce your worries by 50%. Here they are again. 1. What is the problem? 2. What is the cause of the problem? 3. What are all possible solutions to the problem? 4. What solution do you suggest? Part 2 in a Nutshell Basic Techniques in Analyzing Worry Rule 1. Get the Facts Remember that Dean Hawks of Columbia University said that half the worry in the world is caused by people trying to make decisions before they have sufficient knowledge on which to base a decision. Rule 2. After carefully weighing all the facts, come to a decision. Rule 3. Once a decision is carefully reached, act. Get busy carrying out your decision and dismiss all anxiety about the outcome. Rule 4. When you or any of your associates are tempted to worry about a problem, write out and answer the following questions. A. What is the problem? B. What is the cause of the problem? C. What are all possible solutions? D. What is the best solution? Part 3. How to Break the Worry Habit Before It Breaks You Chapter 6. How to Crowd Worry Out of Your Mind I shall never forget one night when Marion J. Douglas was a student in one of my classes. I have not used his real name. He requested me for personal reasons not to reveal his identity. But here is his real story as he told it to the class. He told us how tragedy had struck at his home not once, but twice. The first time, he had lost his five-year-old daughter, a child he adored. 
He and his wife thought they couldn't endure that first loss, but as he said, ten months later God gave us another little girl, and she died in five days. This double bereavement was almost too much to bear. I couldn't take it, this father told us. I couldn't sleep, I couldn't eat, I couldn't rest or relax. My nerves were utterly shaken, and my confidence gone. At last he went to the doctor's. One recommended sleeping pills, and another recommended a trip. He tried both, but neither remedy helped. He said, My body felt as if it were encased in a vice, and the jaws of the vice were being drawn tighter and tighter. The tension of grief, if you've ever been paralyzed by sorrow, you know what he meant. But thank God I had one child left, a four-year-old son. He gave me the solution to my problem. One afternoon, as I sat around feeling sorry for myself, he asked, Daddy, will you build a boat for me? I was in no mood to build a boat. In fact, I was in no mood to do anything. But my son is a persistent little fellow. I had to give in. Building that toy boat took about three hours. By the time it was finished, I realized that those three hours spent building that boat were the first hours of mental relaxation and peace that I had had in months. That discovery jarred me out of my lethargy and caused me to do a bit of thinking, the first real thinking I had done in months. I realized that it's difficult to worry if you're busy doing something that requires planning and thinking. In my case, building the boat had knocked worry out of the ring, so I resolved to keep busy. The following night, I went from room to room in the house, compiling a list of jobs that ought to be done. Scores of items needed to be repaired. Bookcases, stair steps, storm windows, window shades, knobs, locks, leaky faucets. Astonishing as it seems, in the course of two weeks, I had made a list of 242 items that needed attention. During the last two years, I have completed most of them. Besides, I have filled my life with stimulating activities. Two nights per week, I attend adult education classes in New York. I have gone in for civic activities in my hometown, and I am now chairman of the school board. I attend scores of meetings. I help collect money for the Red Cross and other activities. I am so busy now that I have no time for worry. No time for worry. That's exactly what Winston Churchill said when he was working 18 hours a day at the height of the war. When he was asked if he worried about his tremendous responsibilities, he said, I'm too busy. I have no time for worry. Charles Kettering was in the same fix when he started out to invest in a self-starter for automobiles. Mr. Kettering was, until his retirement, vice president of General Motors in charge of the world-famous General Motors Research Corporation. But in those days, he was so poor that he had to use the hayloft of a barn as a laboratory. To buy groceries, he had to use $1,500 that his wife had made by giving piano lessons. Later, he had to borrow $500 on his life insurance. I asked his wife if she wasn't worried at a time like that. Yes, she replied, I was so worried I couldn't sleep. But Mr. Kettering wasn't. He was too absorbed in his work to worry. The great scientist Pasteur spoke of the peace that is found in libraries and laboratories. Why is peace found there? Because the men in libraries and laboratories are usually too absorbed in their tasks to worry about themselves. Research men rarely have nervous breakdowns. They haven't time for such luxuries. Why does such a simple thing as keeping busy help to drive out anxiety? because of a law, one of the most fundamental laws ever revealed by psychology. And that law is that it is utterly impossible for any human mind, no matter how brilliant, to think of more than one thing at any given time. You don't quite believe it. Very well, then, let's try an experiment. Suppose you lean back right now, close your eyes, and try at the same instant to think of the Statue of Liberty and of what you plan to do tomorrow morning. Go ahead, try it. You found out, didn't you, that you could focus on either thought in turn, but never on both simultaneously. Well, the same thing is true in the field of emotions. We cannot be pepped up and enthusiastic about doing something exciting and feel dragged down by worry at the very same time. One kind of emotion drives out the other. 
and it was that simple discovery that enabled army psychiatrists to perform such miracles during the Second World War. When men came out of battle, so shaken by the experience that they were called psychoneurotic, army doctors prescribed keep them busy as the cure. Every waking minute of these nerve-shocked men was filled with activity, usually outdoor activities such as fishing, hunting, playing ball, golf, taking pictures, making gardens, and dancing. They were given no time for brooding over their terrible experiences. Occupational therapy is the term now used by psychiatry when work is prescribed as though it were a medicine. It is not new. The old Greek physicians were advocating it 500 years before Christ was born. The Quakers were using it in Philadelphia in Ben Franklin's time. A man who visited a Quaker sanitarium in 1774 was shocked to see that the patients who were mentally ill were busy spinning flax. He thought these poor unfortunates were being exploited, until the Quakers explained that they found that their patients actually improved when they did a little work. It was soothing to the nerves. Any psychiatrist will tell you that work, keeping busy, is one of the best anesthetics ever known for sick nerves. Henry W. Longfellow found that out for himself when he lost his young wife. His wife had been melting some sealing wax at a candle one day when her clothes caught on fire. Longfellow heard her cries and tried to reach her in time, but she died from the burns. For a while, Longfellow was so tortured by the memory of that dreadful experience that he nearly went insane. But fortunately for him, his three small children needed his attention. In spite of his own grief, Longfellow undertook to be father and mother to his children. He took them for walks, told them stories, played games with them, and immortalized their companionship in his poem, The Children's Hour. He also translated Dante, and all these duties combined kept him so busy that he forgot himself entirely and regained his peace of mind. As Tennyson declared when he lost his most intimate friend, Arthur Hallam, I must lose myself in action, lest I wither in despair. Most of us have little trouble losing ourselves in action while we have our noses to the grindstone and are doing our day's work, but the hours after work, they are the dangerous ones. Just when we're free to enjoy our own leisure and ought to be the happiest, that's when the blue devils of worry attack us. That's when we begin to wonder whether we're getting anywhere in life, whether we're in a rut, whether the boss meant anything by that remark he made today, or whether we're losing our sex appeal. When we're not busy, our minds tend to become a near vacuum. Every student of physics knows that nature abhors a vacuum. The nearest thing to a vacuum that you and I will probably ever see is inside of an incandescent electric light bulb. Break that bulb, and nature forces air in to fill the theoretical empty space. Nature also rushes in to fill the vacant mind. With what? Usually with emotions. Why? Because emotions of worry, fear, hate, jealousy, and envy are driven by primeval vigor and the dynamic energy of the jungle. Such emotions are so violent that they tend to drive out of our minds all peaceful, happy thoughts and emotions. James L. Mercell, professor of education, Teachers College, Columbia, put it very well when he said, Worry is most apt to ride you ragged not when you're in action, but when the day's work is done. Your imagination can run riot then and bring up all sorts of ridiculous possibilities and magnify each little blunder. At such a time, he continued, your mind is like a motor operating without its load. It races and threatens to burn out its bearings or even to tear itself to bits. The remedy for worry is to get completely occupied doing something constructive. But you don't have to be a college professor to realize this truth and put it into practice. During the Second World War, I met a housewife from Chicago who told me how she discovered for herself that the remedy for worry is to get completely occupied doing something constructive. I met this woman and her husband in the dining car while I was traveling from New York to my farm in Missouri. This couple told me that their son had joined the armed forces the day after Pearl Harbor. The woman told me that she had almost wrecked her health, worrying over that only son. 
Where was he? Was he safe or in action? Would he be wounded or killed? When I asked her how she overcame her worry, she replied, I got busy. She told me that at first she had dismissed her maid and tried to keep busy by doing all her housework herself, but that didn't help much. The trouble was, she said, that I could do my housework almost mechanically, without using my mind, so I kept on worrying while making the beds and washing the dishes. I realized I needed some new kind of work that would keep me busy, both mentally and physically, every hour of the day. So I took a job as a saleswoman in a large department store. That did it, she said. I immediately found myself in a whirlwind of activity. Customers swarming around me asking for prices, sizes, colors, never a second to think of anything except my immediate duty. And when night came, I could think of nothing except getting off my aching feet. As soon as I ate dinner, I fell into bed and instantly became unconscious. I had neither the time nor the energy to worry. She discovered for herself what John Cowper Powis meant when he said, in the art of forgetting the unpleasant, a certain comfortable security, a certain profound inner peace, a kind of happy numbness soothes the nerves of the human animal when absorbed in its allotted tasks. And what a blessing that it is so. Osa Johnson, one of the world's most famous women explorers, told me how she found release from worry and grief. You may have read the story of her life. It's called I Married Adventure. If any woman ever married adventure, she certainly did. Martin Johnson married her when she was 16 and lifted her feet off the sidewalks of Chanute, Kansas, and set them down on the wild jungle trails of Borneo. For a quarter of a century, this Kansas couple traveled all over the world, making motion pictures of the vanishing wildlife of Asia and Africa. Some years later, they were on a lecture tour showing their famous films. They took a plane out of Denver bound for the coast. The plane plunged into a mountain. Martin Johnson was killed instantly. The doctors said Osa would never leave her bed again. But they didn't know Osa Johnson. Three months later, she was in a wheelchair, lecturing before large audiences. In fact, she addressed over a hundred audiences that season, all from a wheelchair. When I asked her why she did it, she replied, I did it so I would have no time for sorrow and worry. Osa Johnson had discovered the same truth that Tennyson had sung about a century earlier. I must lose myself in action, lest I wither in despair. Admiral Byrd discovered this same truth when he lived all alone for five months in a shack that was literally buried in the great glacial ice cap that covers the South Pole, an ice cap that holds nature's oldest secrets, an ice cap covering an unknown continent larger than the United States and Europe combined. Admiral Byrd spent five months there alone. No other living creature of any kind existed within a hundred miles. The cold was so intense that he could hear his breath freeze and crystallize as the wind blew it past his ears. In his book, Alone, Admiral Byrd tells all about those five months he spent in bewildering and soul-shattering darkness. The days were as black as the nights. He had to keep busy to preserve his sanity. At night, he says, before blowing out the lantern, I formed the habit of blocking out the morrow's work. It was a case of assigning myself an hour, say, to the escape tunnel, half an hour to leveling drift, an hour to straightening up the fuel drums, an hour to cutting bookshelves in the walls of the food tunnel, and two hours to renew a broken bridge in the man-hauling sledge. It was wonderful, he says, to be able to dole out the time in this way. It brought me an extraordinary sense of command over myself. And he adds, Without that, or an equivalent, the days would have been without purpose, and without purpose they would have ended, as such days always end, in disintegration. And note that last again. Without purpose, the days would have ended, as such days always end, in disintegration. If you and I are worried, let's remember that we can use good old-fashioned work as a medicine. That was said by no less an authority than the late Dr. Richard C. Cabot, formerly professor of clinical medicine at Harvard. 
In his book, What Men Live By, Dr. Cabot says, As a physician, I have had the happiness of seeing work cure many persons who have suffered from trembling palsy of the soul, which results from overmastering doubts, hesitations, vacillation, and fear. Courage given us by our work is like the self-reliance which Emerson has made forever glorious. If you and I don't keep busy, if we sit around and brood, we will hatch out a whole flock of what Charles Darwin used to call the wibber-jibbers. And the wibber-jibbers are nothing but old-fashioned gremlins that will run us hollow and destroy our power of action and our power of will. I know a businessman in New York who fought the wibber-jibbers by getting so busy that he had no time to fret and stew. His name is Tremper Ongman. He was a student in one of my classes, and his talk on conquering worry was so interesting, so impressive, that I asked him to have a late supper with me after class, and we sat in a restaurant until long past midnight discussing his experiences. Here's the story he told me. Eighteen years ago, I was so worried I had insomnia. I was tense, irritated, and jittery. I felt I was headed for a nervous breakdown. Well, I had reason to be worried. I was treasurer of the Crown Fruit and Extract Company. We had half a million dollars invested in strawberries packed in gallon tins. For twenty years, we'd been selling these gallon tins of strawberries to manufacturers of ice cream. Suddenly, our sales stopped because the big ice cream makers, such as National Dairy and Borden's, were rapidly increasing their production and were saving money and time by buying strawberries packed in barrels. Not only were we left with half a million dollars of berries we couldn't sell, but we were also under contract to buy a million dollars more of strawberries in the next twelve months. We had already borrowed $350,000 from the banks. We couldn't possibly pay off or renew these loans. No wonder I was worried. I rushed out to Watsonville, California, where our factory was located, and tried to persuade our president that conditions had changed, that we were facing ruin. He refused to believe it. He blamed our New York office for all the trouble, poor salesmanship. After days of pleading, I finally persuaded him to stop packing more strawberries and sell our new supply on the fresh berry market in San Francisco. That almost solved our problems. I should have been able to stop worrying then, but I couldn't. Worry is a habit, and I had that habit. When I returned to New York, I began worrying about everything. The cherries we were buying in Italy, the pineapples we were buying in Hawaii, and so on. I was tense, jittery, couldn't sleep, and as I've already said, I was heading for a nervous breakdown. In despair, I adopted a way of life that cured my insomnia and stopped my worries. I got busy. I got so busy with problems demanding all my faculties that I had no time to worry. I'd been working seven hours a day. I now began working fifteen and sixteen hours a day. I got down to the office every morning at eight o'clock and stayed there every night until almost midnight. I took on new duties, new responsibilities. When I got home at midnight, I was so exhausted when I fell in bed that I became unconscious in a few seconds. I kept up this program for about three months. I had broken the habit of worry by that time, so I returned to a normal working day of seven or eight hours. This event occurred eighteen years ago. I have never been troubled with insomnia or worry since then. George Bernard Shaw was right. He summed it all up when he said, The secret of being miserable is to have the leisure to bother about whether you are happy or not. So don't bother to think about it. Spit on your hands and get busy. Your blood will start circulating, your mind will start ticking, and pretty soon this whole positive upsurge of life in your body will drive worry from your mind. Get busy, keep busy. It's the cheapest kind of medicine there is on this earth, and one of the best. To break the worry habit, here is rule one. Keep busy. The worried person must lose himself in action, lest he wither in despair. Chapter 7. Don't Let the Beatles Get You Down Here's a dramatic story that I'll probably remember as long as I live. It was told to me by Robert Moore of Maplewood, New Jersey. I learned the biggest lesson of my life in March 1945, he said. 
I learned it under 276 feet of water off the coast of Indochina. I was one of 88 men aboard the submarine Baya SS-318. We had discovered by radar that a small Japanese convoy was coming our way. As daybreak approached, we submerged to attack. I saw through the periscope a Japanese destroyer escort, a tanker, and a mine layer. We fired three torpedoes at the destroyer escort, but missed. Something went haywire in the mechanics of each torpedo. The destroyer, not knowing that she had been attacked, continued on. We were getting ready to attack the last ship, the mine layer, when suddenly she turned and came directly at us. A Japanese plane had spotted us under 60 feet of water and had radioed our position to the Japanese mine layer. We went down to 150 feet to avoid detection and rigged for depth charge. We put extra bolts on the hatches, and in order to make our sub absolutely silent, we turned off the fans, the cooling system, and all electrical gear. Three minutes later, all hell broke loose. Six depth charges exploded all around us and pushed us down to the ocean floor, a depth of 276 feet. We were terrified. To be attacked in less than a thousand feet of water is dangerous. Less than 500 is almost always fatal. And we were being attacked in a trifle more than half of 500 feet of water, just about knee-deep as far as safety was concerned. For 15 hours, that Japanese mine layer kept dropping depth charges. If a depth charge explodes within 17 feet of a sub, the concussion will blow a hole in it. Scores of these depth charges exploded within 50 feet of us. We were ordered to secure, to lie quietly in our bunks and remain calm. I was so terrified I could hardly breathe. This is death, I kept saying to myself over and over. This is death. This is death. With the fans and cooling system turned off, the air inside the sub was over a hundred degrees, but I was so chilled with fear that I put on a sweater and a fur-lined jacket, and I still trembled with cold. My teeth chattered. I broke out in a cold, clammy sweat. The attack continued for fifteen hours, then ceased suddenly. Apparently, the Japanese mine layer had exhausted its supply of depth charges and steamed away. Those fifteen hours of attack seemed like fifteen million years. All my life passed before me in review. I remembered all the bad things I had done, all the little absurd things that I had worried about. I had been a bank clerk before I joined the Navy. I had worried about the long hours, the poor pay, the poor prospect of advancement. I had worried because I couldn't own my own home, couldn't buy a new car, couldn't buy my wife nice clothes. How I had hated my old boss, who was always nagging and scolding. I remembered how I would come home at night, sore and grouchy, and quarrel with my wife over trifles. I had worried about a scar on my forehead, a nasty cut from an auto accident. How big all those worries seemed years ago. How absurd they seemed when depth charges were threatening to blow me to kingdom come. I promised myself then and there that if I ever saw the sun and stars again, I would never, never worry again. Never, never, never. I learned more about the art of living in those fifteen terrible hours in that submarine than I had learned by studying books for four years in Syracuse University. We often face the major disasters of life bravely and then let the trifles, the pains in the neck, get us down. For example, Samuel Pepys tells in his diary about seeing Sir Harry Vane's head chopped off in London. As Sir Harry mounted the platform, he was not pleading for his life, but was pleading with the executioner not to hit the painful boil on his neck. And that was another thing that Admiral Byrd discovered down in the terrible cold and darkness of the polar nights, that his men fussed more about the pains in the neck than about the big things. They bore without complaining the dangers, the hardships, and the cold that was often eighty degrees below zero. But, says Admiral Byrd, I know of bunkmates who quit speaking to each other because each suspected the other of inching his gear into the other's allotted space. And I knew of one who could not eat unless he could find a place in the mess hall out of sight of the Fletcherist who solemnly chewed his food twenty-eight times before swallowing. 
In a polar camp, says Admiral Byrd, little things like that have the power to drive even disciplined men to the edge of insanity. And you might have added, Admiral Byrd, that little things in marriage drive people to the edge of insanity and cause half the heartaches in the world. At least that's what the authorities say. For example, Judge Joseph Sabbath of Chicago, after acting as arbiter in more than 40,000 unhappy marriages, declared, Trivialities are at the bottom of most marital unhappiness. And Frank S. Hogan, former district attorney of New York County, says, Fully half the cases in our criminal courts originate in little things. Barroom bravado, domestic wrangling, an insulting remark, a disparaging word, a rude action, those are the little things that lead to assault and murder. Very few of us are cruelly and greatly wronged. It is the small blows to our self-esteem, the indignities, the little jolts to our vanity, which cause half the heartaches in the world. When Eleanor Roosevelt was first married, she was worried for days because her new cook had served a poor meal. But if that happened now, Mrs. Roosevelt said, I would shrug my shoulders and forget it. Good. That is acting like an adult emotionally. Even Catherine the Great, an absolute autocrat, used to laugh the thing off when the cook spoiled a meal. Mrs. Carnegie and I had a dinner at a friend's house in Chicago. While carving the meat, he did something wrong. I didn't notice it, and I wouldn't have cared even if I had noticed it. But his wife saw it and jumped down his throat right in front of us. John, she cried, watch what you're doing. Can't you ever learn to serve properly? And then she said to us, he's always making mistakes. He just doesn't try. Maybe he didn't try to carve but I certainly give him credit for trying to live with her for twenty years. Frankly, I would rather have eaten a couple of hot dogs with mustard in an atmosphere of peace than to have dined on Peking duck and shark fins while listening to her scolding. Shortly after that experience, Mrs. Carnegie and I had some friends at our home for dinner. Just before they arrived, Mrs. Carnegie found that three of the napkins didn't match the tablecloth. I rushed to the cook, she told me later, and found that the other three napkins had gone to the laundry. The guests were at the door. There was no time to change. I felt like bursting into tears. All I could think was, why did this stupid mistake have to spoil my whole evening? Then I thought, well, why let it? I went in to dinner, determined to have a good time, and I did. I would much rather our friends think I'm a sloppy housekeeper, she told me, than a nervous, bad-tempered one. And anyhow, as far as I could make out, no one noticed the napkins. A well-known legal maxim says, De minimis non curat lex, the law does not concern itself with trifles. And neither should the worrier, if he wants peace of mind. Much of the time, all we need to overcome the annoyance of trifles is to effect a shifting of emphasis, set up a new and pleasurable point of view in the mind. My friend Homer Croy, who wrote... They Had to See Paris, and a dozen other books, gives a wonderful example of how this can be done. He used to be driven half crazy while working on a book by the rattling of the radiators in his New York apartment. The steam would bang and sizzle, and he would sizzle with irritation as he sat at his desk. Then, says Homer Croy, I went with some friends on a camping expedition. While listening to the limbs crackling in the roaring fire, I thought how much they sounded like the crackling of the radiators. Why should I like one and hate the other? When I went home, I said to myself, the crackling of the limbs in the fire was a pleasant sound. The sound of the radiators is about the same. I'll go to sleep and not worry about the noise. And I did. For a few days, I was conscious of the radiators, but soon I forgot all about them. And so it is with many petty worries. We dislike them and get into a stew, all because we exaggerate their importance. Disraeli said, Life is too short to be little. Those words, said André Marois in This Week magazine, have helped me through many a painful experience. Often we allow ourselves to be upset by small things we should despise and forget. Here we are on this earth with only a few more decades to live, and we lose many irreplaceable hours brooding over grievances that in a year's time will be forgotten by us and by everybody. 
No, let's devote our life to worthwhile actions and feelings, to great thoughts, real affections, and enduring undertakings, for life is too short to be little. Even so illustrious a figure as Rudyard Kipling forgot at times that life is too short to be little, and the result? He and his brother-in-law fought the most famous court battle in the history of Vermont, a battle so celebrated that a book has been written about it, Rudyard Kipling's Vermont Feud. The story goes like this. Kipling married a Vermont girl, Caroline Ballastier, built a lovely home in Brattleboro, Vermont, settled down and expected to spend the rest of his life there. His brother-in-law, Beatty Ballastier, became Kipling's best friend. Two of them worked and played together. And then Kipling bought some land from Ballastier, with the understanding that Ballastier would be allowed to cut hay off it each season. One day, Ballastier found Kipling laying out a flower garden on his hay field. His blood boiled. He hit the ceiling. Kipling fired right back. The air over the green mountains of Vermont turned blue. A few days later, when Kipling was out riding his bicycle, his brother-in-law drove a wagon and a team of horses across the road suddenly and forced Kipling to take a spill. And Kipling, the man who wrote, If you can keep your head when all about you are losing theirs and blaming it on you, he lost his own head and swore out a warrant for Ballastier's arrest. A sensational trial followed. Reporters from the big cities poured into the town. The news flashed around the world. And nothing was settled. This quarrel caused Kipling and his wife to abandon their American home for the rest of their lives. All that worry and bitterness over a mere trifle, a load of hay. Pericles said, twenty-four centuries ago, Come, gentlemen, we sit too long on trifles. We do indeed. Here's one of the most interesting stories that Dr. Harry Emerson Fosdick ever told a story about the battles won and lost by a giant of the forest. On the slope of Long's Peak in Colorado lies the ruin of a gigantic tree. Naturalists tell us that it stood for some four hundred years. It was a seedling when Columbus landed at San Salvador, and half-grown when the pilgrims settled at Plymouth. During the course of its long life it was struck by lightning fourteen times, and the innumerable avalanches and storms of four centuries thundered past it. It survived them all. In the end, however, an army of beetles attacked the tree and leveled it to the ground. The insects ate their way through the bark and gradually destroyed the inner strength of the tree by their tiny but incessant attacks. A forest giant, which age had not withered, nor lightning blasted, nor storm subdued, fell at last before beetles so small that a man could crush them between his forefinger and his thumb. Aren't we all like that battling giant of the forest? Don't we manage somehow to survive the rare storms and avalanches and lightning blasts of life, only to let our hearts be eaten out by little beetles of worry, little beetles that could be crushed between a finger and a thumb? I traveled through the Teton National Park in Wyoming with Charles Seifred, highway superintendent for the state of Wyoming, and some of his friends. We were all going to visit the John D. Rockefeller estate in the park. But the car in which I was riding took the wrong turn, got lost, and drove up to the entrance of the estate an hour after the other cars had gone in. Mr. Seifred had the key that unlocked the private gate, so he waited in the hot, mosquito-infested woods for an hour until we arrived. The mosquitoes were enough to drive a saint insane, but they couldn't triumph over Charles Seifred. While waiting for us, he cut a limb off an aspen tree and made a whistle of it. When we arrived, was he cussing the mosquitoes? No, he was playing his whistle. I have kept that whistle as a memento of a man who knew how to put trifles in their place. To break the worry habit before it breaks you, here is rule two. Let's not allow ourselves to be upset by small things we should despise and forget. Remember, life is too short to be little.
Chapter 8 A Law That Will Outlaw Many of Your Worries As a child, I grew up on a Missouri farm, and one day, while helping my mother pit cherries, I began to cry. My mother said, Dale, what in the world are you crying about? I blubbered, I'm afraid I'm going to be buried alive. I was full of worries in those days. When thunderstorms came, I worried for fear I would be killed by lightning. When hard times came, I worried for fear we wouldn't have enough to eat. I worried for fear I would go to hell when I died. I was terrified for fear of an older boy, Sam White, would cut off my big ears, as he threatened to do. I worried for fear girls would laugh at me if I tipped my hat to them. I worried for fear no girl would ever be willing to marry me. I worried about what I would say to my wife immediately after we were married. I imagined that we would be married in some country church, and then get in a surrey with a fringe on top and ride back to the farm. But how would I be able to keep the conversation going on that ride back to the farm? How? How? I pondered over that earth-shaking problem for many an hour as I walked behind the plow. As the years went by, I gradually discovered that 99% of the things I worried about never happened. For example, as I've already said, I was once terrified of lightning. But I now know that the chances of my being killed by lightning in any one year are, according to the National Safety Council, only one in 350,000. My fear of being buried alive was even more absurd. I don't imagine that even back in the days before embalming was the rule, that one person in ten million was buried alive, yet I once cried for fear of it. One person out of every eight dies of cancer. If I had wanted something to worry about, I should have worried about cancer instead of being killed by lightning or being buried alive. To be sure, I've been talking about the worries of youth and adolescence, but many of our adult worries are almost as absurd. You and I could probably eliminate nine-tenths of our worries right now if we would cease our fretting long enough to discover whether, by the law of averages, there was any real justification for our worries. The most famous insurance company on earth, Lloyd's of London, has made countless millions of dollars out of the tendency of everybody to worry about things that rarely happen. Lloyd's of London bets people that the disasters they're worrying about will never occur. However, they don't call it betting, they call it insurance. But it is really betting based on the law of averages. This great insurance firm has been going strong for over 200 years. And unless human nature changes, it will still be going strong 50 centuries from now by insuring shoes and ships and sealing wax against disasters that, by the law of averages, don't happen nearly so often as people imagine. If we examine the law of averages, we will often be astounded at the facts we uncover. For example, if I knew that during the next five years I would have to fight in a battle as bloody as the Battle of Gettysburg, I would be terrified. I would take out all the life insurance I could get. I would draw up my will and set all my earthly affairs in order. I would say, I'll probably never live through that battle, so I had better make the most of the few years I have left. Yet the facts are that according to the law of averages, it is just as dangerous, just as fatal, to try to live from age 50 to age 55 in peacetime as it was to fight in the Battle of Gettysburg. What I'm trying to say is this. In times of peace, just as many people die per thousand between the ages of 50 and 55, as were killed per thousand among the 163,000 soldiers who fought at Gettysburg. I wrote several chapters of this book at James Simpson's Numtiga Lodge on the shores of Bow Lake in the Canadian Rockies. While stopping there one summer, I met Mr. and Mrs. Herbert H. Salinger of San Francisco. Mrs. Salinger, a poised, serene woman, gave me the impression that she had never worried. One evening, in front of the roaring fireplace, I asked her if she had ever been troubled by worry. Troubled by it, she said. My life was almost ruined by it. Before I learned to conquer worry, I lived through eleven years of self-made hell. 
I was irritable and hot-tempered. I lived under terrific tension. I would take the bus every week from my home in San Mateo to shop in San Francisco. But even while shopping, I worried myself into a dither. Maybe I had left the electric iron connected on the ironing board. Maybe the house had caught fire. Maybe the maid had run off and left the children. Maybe they had been out on their bicycles and been killed by a car. In the midst of my shopping, I would often worry myself into a cold perspiration and rush out and take the bus home to see if everything was all right. No wonder my first marriage ended in disaster. My second husband is a lawyer, a quiet, analytical man who never worries about anything. When I became tense and anxious, he would say to me, Relax. Let's think this thing out. What are you really worrying about? Let's examine the law of averages and see whether or not it is likely to happen. For example, I remember the time we were driving from Albuquerque, New Mexico, to the Carlsbad Caverns, driving on a dirt road when we were caught in a terrible rainstorm. The car was slithering and sliding. We couldn't control it. I was positive we would slide off into one of the ditches that flanked the road, but my husband kept repeating to me, I am driving very slowly. Nothing serious is likely to happen. Even if the car does slide into the ditch, by the law of averages, we won't be hurt. His calmness and confidence quieted me. One summer, we were on a camping trip in the Token Valley of the Canadian Rockies. One night, we were camping 7,000 feet above sea level when a storm threatened to tear our tent to shreds. The tents were tied with guy ropes to a wooden platform. The outer tent shook and trembled and screamed and shrieked in the wind. I expected every minute to see our tent torn loose and hurled through the sky. I was terrified. But my husband kept saying, Look, my dear, we are traveling with Brewster's guides. Brewster's know what they're doing. They've been pitching tents in these mountains for sixty years. This tent has been here for many seasons. It hasn't blown down yet, and by the law of averages, it won't blow away tonight. And even if it does, we can take shelter in another tent. So relax. I did, and I slept soundly the balance of the night. A few years ago, an infantile paralysis epidemic swept over our part of California. In the old days, I would have been hysterical. But my husband persuaded me to act calmly. We took all the precautions we could. We kept our children away from crowds, away from school and the movies. By consulting the Board of Health, we found out that even during the worst infantile paralysis epidemic that California had ever known up to that time, only 1,835 children had been stricken in the entire state of California, and that the usual number was around 200 or 300. As tragic as those figures are, we nevertheless felt that, according to the law of averages, the chances of any one child being stricken were remote. By the law of averages, it won't happen. That phrase has destroyed 90% of my worries and has made the past 20 years of my life beautiful and peaceful beyond my highest expectations. It has been said that nearly all of our worries and unhappiness come from our imagination and not from reality. As I look back across the decades, I can see that is where most of my worries came from also. Jim Grant told me that that had been his experience, too. He owned the James A. Grant Distributing Company of New York City. He ordered from 10 to 15 carloads of Florida oranges and grapefruit at a time. He told me that he used to torture himself with such thoughts as, What if there's a train wreck? What if my fruit is strewn all over the countryside? What if a bridge collapses as my cars are going over it? Of course, the fruit was insured, but he feared that if he didn't deliver his fruit on time, he might risk the loss of his market. He worried so much that he feared he had stomach ulcers and went to a doctor. The doctor told him there was nothing wrong with him except jumpy nerves. I saw the light then, he said, and began to ask myself questions. I said to myself, Look here, Jim Grant, how many fruit cars have you handled over the years? The answer was about 25,000. Then I asked myself, How many of those cars were ever wrecked? The answer was, oh, maybe five. Then I said to myself, only five out of 25,000. 
Do you know what that means? A ratio of 5,000 to 1. In other words, by the law of averages, based on experience, the chances are 5,000 to 1 against one of your cars ever being wrecked. So what are you worried about? And then I said to myself, well, a bridge may collapse. Then I asked myself, how many cars have you actually lost from a bridge collapsing? The answer was, none. And then I said to myself, aren't you a fool to be worrying yourself into stomach ulcers over a bridge which has never yet collapsed and over a railroad wreck when the chances are 5,000 to 1 against it? When I looked at it that way, Jim Grant told me, I felt pretty silly. I decided then and there to let the law of averages do the worrying for me, and I have not been troubled with my stomach ulcer since. When Al Smith was governor of New York, I heard him answer the attacks of his political enemies by saying over and over, let's examine the record, let's examine the record. Then he proceeded to give the facts. The next time you and I are worrying about what may happen, let's take a tip from wise old Al Smith. Let's examine the record and see what basis there is, if any, for our gnawing anxieties. That's precisely what Frederick J. Malstead did when he feared he was lying in his grave. Here's his story as he told it to one of our classes in New York. Early in June 1944, I was lying in a slit trench near Omaha Beach, I was with the 999th Signal Service Company. We'd just dug in in Normandy. As I looked around to that slit trench, just a rectangular hole in the ground, I said to myself, this looks just like a grave. When I lay down and tried to sleep in it, it felt like a grave. I couldn't help saying to myself, maybe this is my grave. When the German bombers began coming over at 11 p.m. and the bombs started falling, I was scared stiff. For the first two or three nights, I couldn't sleep at all. By the fourth or fifth night, I was almost a nervous wreck. I knew that if I didn't do something, I would go stark crazy. So I reminded myself that five nights had passed, and I was still alive, and so was every man in our outfit. Only two had even been injured, and they had been hurt not by the German bombs, but by falling flak from our own anti-aircraft guns. I decided to stop worrying by doing something constructive, so I built a thick wooden roof over my slit trench to protect myself from flak. I thought of the vast area over which my unit was spread. I told myself that the only way I could be killed in that deep, narrow slit trench was by a direct hit, and I figured out that the chance of a direct hit on me was not one in ten thousand. After a couple of nights of looking at it in this way, I calmed down and slept even through the bomb raids. The United States Navy used the statistics of the law of averages to buck up the morale of their men. One ex-sailor told me that when he and his shipmates were assigned to high-octane tankers, they were worried stiff. They all believed that if a tanker loaded with high-octane gasoline was hit by a torpedo, it exploded and blew everybody to kingdom come. But the U.S. Navy knew otherwise. So the Navy issued exact figures showing that out of 100 tankers hit by torpedoes, 60 stayed afloat. And of the 40 that did sink, only 5 sank in less than 10 minutes. That meant time to get off the ship. It also meant casualties were exceedingly small. Did this help morale? And this knowledge of the law of averages wiped out my jitters, said Clyde W. Moss of St. Paul, Minnesota, the man who told the story. The whole crew felt better. We knew we had a chance and that by the law of averages we probably wouldn't be killed. To break the worry habit before it breaks you, here is rule three. Let's examine the record. Let's ask ourselves, what are the chances, according to the law of averages, that this event I am worrying about will ever occur? Chapter 9. Cooperate with the Inevitable when I was a little boy, I was playing with some of my friends in the attic of an old abandoned log house in northwest Missouri. As I climbed down out of the attic, I rested my feet on a windowsill for a moment and then jumped. I had a ring on my left forefinger, and as I jumped, the ring caught on a nail head and tore off my finger. I screamed. I was terrified. I was positive I was going to die. 
But after the hand healed, I never worried about it for one split second. What would have been the use? I accepted the inevitable. And now I often go for a month at a time without even thinking about the fact that I have only three fingers and a thumb on my left hand. A few years ago, I met a man who was running a freight elevator in one of the downtown office buildings in New York. I noticed that his left hand had been cut off at the wrist. I asked him if the loss of that hand bothered him. He said, oh, no, I hardly ever think about it. I'm not married. The only time I ever think about it is when I try to thread a needle. It's astonishing how quickly we can accept almost any situation, if we have to, and adjust ourselves to it and forget about it. I often think of an inscription on the ruins of a 15th-century cathedral in Amsterdam, Holland. This inscription says in Flemish, It is so. It cannot be otherwise. As you and I march across the decades of time, we're going to meet a lot of unpleasant situations that are so. They cannot be otherwise. We have our choice. We can either accept them as inevitable and adjust ourselves to them, or we can ruin our lives with rebellion and maybe end up with a nervous breakdown. Here's a bit of sage advice from one of my favorite philosophers, William James. Be willing to have it so, he said. Acceptance of what has happened is the first step to overcoming the consequences of any misfortune. Elizabeth Conley of Portland, Oregon, had to find that out the hard way. Here's a letter that she wrote me. On the very day that America was celebrating the victory of our armed forces in North Africa, the letter says, I received a telegram from the War Department. My nephew, the person I loved most, was missing in action. A short time later, another telegram arrived saying he was dead. I was prostrate with grief. Up to that time, I had felt that life had been very good to me. I had a job I loved. I'd helped to raise this nephew. He represented to me all that was fine and good in young manhood. I'd felt that all the bread I had cast upon the waters was coming back to me as cake. Then came this telegram. My whole world collapsed. I felt there was nothing left to live for. I neglected my work, neglected my friends. I let everything go. I was bitter and resentful. Why did my loving nephew have to be taken? Why did this good boy, with life all before him, why did he have to be killed? I couldn't accept it. My grief was so overwhelming that I decided to give up my work and go away and hide myself in tears and bitterness. I was clearing out my desk, getting ready to quit, when I came across a letter that I had forgotten, a letter from this nephew who had been killed, a letter he'd written to me when my mother had died a few years ago. Of course we will all miss her, the letter said, and especially you, but I know you'll carry on. Your own personal philosophy will make you do that. I shall never forget the beautiful truths you taught me. Wherever I am, or how far apart we may be, I shall always remember that you taught me to smile and to take whatever comes like a man. I read and reread that letter. It seemed as if he were there beside me, speaking to me. He seemed to be saying to me, Why don't you do what you taught me to do? Carry on, no matter what happens. Hide your private sorrows under a smile and carry on. So I went back to my work. I stopped being bitter and rebellious. I kept saying to myself, It is done. I can't change it. But I can and will carry on as he wished me to do. I threw all my mind and strength into my work. I wrote letters to soldiers, to other people's boys. I joined an adult education class at night, seeking out new interests and making new friends. I can hardly believe the change that has come over me. I have ceased mourning over the past that is forever gone. I am living each day now with joy, just as my nephew would have wanted me to do. I have made peace with life. I have accepted my fate. I am now living a fuller and more complete life than I have ever known. Elizabeth Conley learned what all of us will have to learn sooner or later, namely that we must accept and cooperate with the inevitable. It is so. It cannot be otherwise. Now that's not an easy lesson to learn. Even kings on their thrones have to keep reminding themselves of it. The late George V had these framed words hanging on the wall of his library at Buckingham Palace. Teach me neither to cry for the moon nor over spilt milk. The same thought is expressed by Schopenhauer in this way. 
a good supply of resignation is of the first importance in providing for the journey of life. Obviously, circumstances alone do not make us happy or unhappy. It is the way we react to circumstances that determines our feelings. Jesus said that the kingdom of heaven is within you. That is where the kingdom of hell is, too. We can all endure disaster and tragedy and triumph over them if we have to. We may not think we can, but we have surprisingly strong inner resources that will see us through if we will only make use of them. We are stronger than we think. The late Booth Tarkington always said, I could take anything that life could force upon me except one thing, blindness. I could never endure that. Then one day, when he was along in his sixties, Tarkington glanced down at the carpet on the floor. The colors were blurred. He couldn't see the pattern. He went to a specialist. He learned the tragic truth. He was losing his sight. One eye was nearly blind, and the other would follow. That which he feared most had come upon him. How did Tarkington react to this worst of all disasters? Did he feel, this is it, this is the end of my life? No. To his amazement, he felt quite gay. He even called upon his humor. Floating specks annoyed him. They would swim across his eyes and cut off his vision. Yet when the largest of these specks would swim across his sight, he would say, Hello, there's Grandfather again. Wonder where he's going this fine morning. How could fate ever conquer a spirit like that? Well, the answer is, it couldn't. When total darkness closed in, Tarkington said, I found I could take the loss of my eyesight just as a man can take anything else. If I lost all five of my senses, I know I could live on inside my mind. For it is in the mind we see and in the mind we live, whether we know it or not. In the hope of restoring his eyesight, Tarkington had to go through more than twelve operations within one year, with local anesthetic. Did he rail against this? He knew it had to be done. He knew he couldn't escape it, so the only way to lessen his suffering was to take it with grace. He refused a private room at the hospital and went into a ward where he could be with other people who had troubles too. He tried to cheer them up and when he had to submit to repeated operations, fully conscious of what was being done to his eyes, he tried to remember how fortunate he was. How wonderful, he said, how wonderful that science now has the skill to operate on anything so delicate as the human eye. The average man would have been a nervous wreck if he had had to endure more than twelve operations and blindness. Yet Tarkington said, I would not exchange this experience for a happier one. It taught him acceptance. It taught him that nothing life could bring him was beyond his strength to endure. It taught him, as John Milton discovered, that it is not miserable to be blind. It is only miserable not to be able to endure blindness. Margaret Fuller, the famous New England feminist, once offered as her credo, I accept the universe. When grouchy old Thomas Carlyle heard that in England, he snorted, By gad, she'd better. Yes, and by gad, you and I had better accept the inevitable, too. If we rail and kick against it and grow bitter, we won't change the inevitable, but we will change ourselves. I know. I've tried it. I once refused to accept an inevitable situation with which I was confronted. I played the fool and railed against it and rebelled. It ruined my nights into hells of insomnia. I brought upon myself everything I didn't want. Finally, after a year of self-torture, I had to accept what I knew from the outset I couldn't possibly alter. I should have cried out years ago with old Walt Whitman, Oh, to confront night, storms, hunger, ridicule, accident, rebuffs, as the trees and animals do. I spent twelve years working with cattle, yet I never saw a Jersey cow running a temperature because the pasture was burning up from a lack of rain, or because of sleet and cold, or because her boyfriend was paying too much attention to another heifer. The animals confront night, storms, and hunger calmly, so they never have nervous breakdowns or stomach ulcers, and they never go insane. Am I advocating that we simply bow down to all the adversities that come our way? Not by a long shot. That's mere fatalism. 
As long as there's a chance we can save a situation, let's fight. But when common sense tells us that we're up against something that is so and cannot be otherwise, then in the name of our sanity, let's not look before and after and pine for what is not. The late Dean Hawks of Columbia University told me that he had taken a mother goose rhyme as one of his mottos. For every ailment under the sun there is a remedy, or there is none. If there be one, try to find it. If there be none, never mind it. While writing this book, I interviewed a number of the leading business executives of America, and I was impressed by the fact that they cooperated with the inevitable and led lives singularly free from worry. If they hadn't done that, they would have cracked under the strain. Now, here are a few examples of what I mean. J.C. Penney, founder of the nationwide chain of Penny stores, said to me, I wouldn't worry if I lost every dollar I have, because I don't see what is to be gained by worrying. I do the best job I possibly can and leave the results in the laps of the gods. Henry Ford told me much the same thing. When I can't handle events, he said, I let them handle themselves. When I asked K.T. Keller, then president of the Chrysler Corporation, how he kept from worrying, he replied, When I'm up against a tough situation, if I can do anything about it, I do it. If I can't, I just forget it. I never worry about the future, because I know no man living can possibly figure out what's going to happen in the future. There are so many forces that will affect the future. Nobody can tell what prompts these forces or understands them, so why worry about them? K.T. Keller would be embarrassed if you told him he's a philosopher, he's just a good businessman. Yet he has stumbled onto the same philosophy that Epictetus taught in Rome 19 centuries ago. There is only one way to happiness, Epictetus taught the Romans, and that is to cease worrying about things which are beyond the power of our will. Sarah Bernhardt, the divine Sarah, was an illustrious example of a woman who knew how to cooperate with the inevitable. For half a century, she had been the reigning queen of the theater on four continents, the best-loved actress on earth. Then, when she was seventy-one and broke, she had lost all her money. Her physician, Professor Posey of Paris, told her he would have to amputate her leg. While crossing the Atlantic, she had fallen on deck during a storm and injured her leg severely. Phlebitis developed. Her leg shrank. The pain became so intense that the doctors felt her leg had to be amputated. He was almost afraid to tell the stormy, tempestuous, divine Sarah what had to be done. He fully expected that the terrible news would set off an explosion of hysteria. But he was wrong. Sarah looked at him a moment and then said quietly, if it has to be, it has to be. It was fate. As she was being wheeled away to the operating room, her son stood weeping. She waved to him with a gay gesture and said cheerfully, Don't go away, I'll be right back. On the way to the operating room, she recited a scene from one of her plays. Someone asked her if she were doing this to cheer herself up. She said, No, to cheer up the doctors and nurses. It will be a strain on them. After recovering from the operation, Sarah Bernhardt went on touring the world and enchanting audiences for another seven years. When we stop fighting the inevitable, said Elsie McCormick in a Reader's Digest article, we release energy which enables us to create a richer life. No one living has enough emotion and vigor to fight the inevitable, and at the same time enough left over to create a new life. Choose one or the other. You can either bend with the inevitable sleet storms of life, or you can resist them and break. I saw that happen on a farm I own in Missouri. I planted a score of trees on that farm. At first they grew with astonishing rapidity. Then a sleet storm encrusted each twig and branch with a heavy coating of ice. Instead of bowing gracefully to their burden, these trees proudly resisted and broke and split under the load and had to be destroyed. They hadn't learned the wisdom of the forests of the north. I've traveled hundreds of miles through the evergreen forests of Canada, yet I have never seen a spruce or a pine broken by sleet or ice. These evergreen forests know how to bend, how to bow down their branches, how to cooperate with the inevitable. 
the masters of jiu-jitsu teach their pupils to bend like the willow, don't resist like the oak. Why do you think your automobile tires stand up on the road and take so much punishment? At first, the tire manufacturers tried to make a tire that would resist the shocks of the road. It was soon cut to ribbons. Then they made a tire that would absorb the shocks of the road. That tire could take it. Now, you and I will last longer and enjoy smoother riding if we learn to absorb the shocks and jolts along the rocky road of life. What will happen to you and me if we resist the shocks of life instead of absorbing them? What will happen if we refuse to bend like the willow and insist on resisting like the oak? Well, the answer is easy. We will set up a series of inner conflicts. We will be worried, tense, strained, and neurotic. If we go still further and reject the harsh world of reality and retreat into a dream world of our own making, we will then be insane. During the war, millions of frightened soldiers had either to accept the inevitable or break under the strain. To illustrate, let's take the case of William H. Cassilis of Glendale, New York. Here's a prize-winning talk he gave before one of my classes in New York. Shortly after I joined the Coast Guard, I was assigned to one of the hottest spots on this side of the Atlantic. I was made a supervisor of explosives. Imagine it, me, a cracker salesman, becoming a supervisor of explosives. The very thought of finding yourself standing on top of thousands of tons of TNT is enough to chill the marrow in a cracker salesman's bones. I was given only two days of instruction, and what I learned filled me with even more terror. I'll never forget my first assignment. On a dark, cold, foggy day, I was given my orders on the open pier of Caven Point, Bayonne, New Jersey. I was assigned to hold number five on my ship. I had to work down in that hold with five longshoremen. They had strong backs, but they knew nothing whatever about explosives, and they were loading blockbusters, each one of which contained a ton of TNT, enough explosive to blow that old ship to kingdom come. These blockbusters were being lowered by two cable slings. I kept saying to myself, suppose one of those cables slipped or broke. Oh, boy, I was scared. I trembled, my mouth was dry, my knees sagged, my heart pounded. But I couldn't run away. That would be desertion. I would be disgraced. My parents would be disgraced, and I might be shot for desertion. I couldn't run. I had to stay. I kept looking at the careless way those longshoremen were handling those blockbusters. The ship might blow up any minute. After an hour or more of this spine-chilling terror, I began to use a little common sense. I gave myself a good talking to. I said, look here, so you're blown up, so what? You'll never know the difference. It'll be an easy way to die, much better than dying by cancer. Don't be a fool. You can't expect to live forever. You've got to do this job or be shot, so you might as well like it. I talked to myself like that for hours, and I began to feel at ease. Finally, I overcame my worry and fears by forcing myself to accept an inevitable situation. I'll never forget that lesson. Every time I'm tempted now to worry about something I can't possibly change, I shrug my shoulders and say, forget it. I find that it works, even for a cracker salesman. Hooray, let's give three cheers and one cheer more for the cracker salesman of the pinafore. Outside the crucifixion of Jesus... The most famous death scene in all history was the death of Socrates. Ten thousand centuries from now, men will still be reading and cherishing Plato's immortal description of it, one of the most moving and beautiful passages in all literature. Certain men of Athens, jealous and envious of old barefooted Socrates, trumped up charges against him and had him tried and condemned to death. When the friendly jailer gave Socrates the poison cup to drink, the jailer said, Try to bear lightly what needs must be. Socrates did. He faced death with a calmness and resignation that touched the hem of divinity. Try to bear lightly what needs must be. Those words were spoken 399 years before Christ was born, but this worrying old world needs those words today more than ever before. Try to bear lightly what needs must be. I've been reading practically every book and magazine article I could find that dealt even remotely with banishing worry. 
Would you like to know what the best single bit of advice about worry that I've discovered in all that reading? Well, here it is, summed up in 27 words, words that you and I ought to paste on our bathroom mirror so that each time we wash our faces, we could also wash away all worry from our minds. This priceless prayer was written by Dr. Reinhold Niebuhr. God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. To break the worry habit before it breaks you, rule four is cooperate with the inevitable. Chapter 10. Put a stop-loss order on your worries. Would you like to know how to make money in Wall Street? Well, so would a million other people. And if I knew the answer, this book would sell for $10,000 a copy. However, there's one good idea that some successful operators use. This story was told to me by Charles Roberts, an investment counselor. I originally came up to New York from Texas with $20,000, which my friends had given me to invest in the stock market, Charles Roberts told me. I thought, he continued, that I knew the ropes in the stock market, but I lost every cent. True, I made a lot of profits on some deals, but I ended up by losing everything. I did not mind so much losing my own money, Mr. Roberts explained, but I felt terrible about having lost my friend's money, even though they could well afford it. I dreaded facing them again after our venture had turned out so unfortunately, but to my astonishment, they not only were good sports about it, but proved to be incurable optimists. I knew I'd been trading on a hit-or-miss basis, and depending largely on luck and other people's opinions, I had been playing the stock market by ear. I began to think over my mistakes, and I determined that before I went back into the market again, I would try to find out what it was all about. So I sought out and became acquainted with one of the most successful speculators who ever lived, Burton S. Castles. I believed I could learn a great deal from him because he had long enjoyed the reputation of being successful year after year, and I knew that such a career was not the result of mere chance or luck. He asked me a few questions about how I had traded before, then told me what I believe is the most important principle in trading. He said, I put a stop-loss order on every market commitment I make. If I buy a stock at, say, $50 a share, I immediately place a stop-loss order on it at 45 That means that when and if the stock should decline by as much as five points below its cost, it would be sold automatically, thereby limiting the loss to five points. If your commitments are intelligently made in the first place, the old master continued, your profits will average 10, 25, or even 50 points. Consequently, by limiting your losses to 5 points, you can be wrong more than half the time and still make plenty of money. I adopted that principle immediately and have used it ever since. It has saved my clients and me many thousands of dollars. After a while, I realized that the stop-loss principle could be used in other ways besides in the stock market. I began to place stop-loss orders on other worries besides financial ones. I began to place a stop-loss order on any and every kind of annoyance and resentment that came to me. It has worked like magic. For example, I often have a luncheon date with a friend who's rarely on time. In the old days, he used to keep me stewing around for half my lunch hours before he showed up. Finally, I told him about my stop-loss orders on my worries. I said, Bill, my stop-loss order on waiting for you is exactly ten minutes. If you arrive more than ten minutes late, our luncheon engagement will be sold down the river, and I'll be gone. <laughs> Man alive, how I wish I had the sense years ago to put stop-loss orders on my impatience on my temper, on my desire for self-justification, on my regrets, and on all my mental and emotional strains. Why didn't I have the horse sense to size up each situation that threatened to destroy my peace of mind and say to myself, See here, Dale Carnegie, this situation is worth just so much fussing about and no more. Why didn't I? However, I must give myself credit for a little sense on one occasion at least. 
And it was a serious occasion, too. A crisis in my life. A crisis when I stood watching my dreams and my plans for the future and the work of years vanish into thin air. It happened like this. In my early thirties, I decided to spend my life writing novels. I was going to be a second Frank Narrowist or Jack London or Thomas Hardy. I was so in earnest that I spent two years in Europe, where I could live cheaply with dollars during the period of wild printing press money that followed the First World War. I spent two years there, writing my magnum opus. I called it The Blizzard. The title was a natural, for the reception it got among the publishers was as cold as any blizzard that ever howled across the plains of the Dakotas. When my literary agent told me it was worthless, that I had no gift, no talent for fiction, my heart almost stopped. I left his office in a daze. I couldn't have been more stunned if he had hit me across the head with a club. I was stupefied. I realized that I was standing at the crossroads of life and had to make a tremendous decision. Which way should I turn? Weeks passed before I came out of the daze. At that time, I had never heard of the phrase, put a stop-loss order on your worries, but as I look back now, I can see that I did just that. I wrote off my two years of sweating over that novel for just what they were worth, a noble experiment, and went forward from there. I returned to my work of organizing and teaching adult education classes, and wrote biographies in my spare time, biographies and non-fiction books, such as the one you're reading now. Am I glad now that I made that decision? Glad. Every time I think about it now, I feel like dancing in the street for sheer joy. I can honestly say that I have never spent a day or an hour since lamenting the fact that I am not another Thomas Hardy. One night a century ago, when a screech owl was screeching in the woods along the shores of Walden Pond, Henry Thoreau dipped his goose quill into his homemade ink and wrote in his diary, the cost of a thing is the amount of what I call life, which is required to be exchanged for it immediately or in the long run. To put it another way, we are fools when we overpay for a thing in terms of what it takes out of our very existence. Yet that is precisely what Gilbert and Sullivan did. They knew how to create gay words and gay music, but they knew distressingly little about how to create gaiety in their own lives. They created some of the loveliest light operas that ever delighted the world, Patience, Pinafore, the Mikado. But they couldn't control their tempers. They embittered their years over nothing more than the price of a carpet. Sullivan ordered a new carpet for the theater they'd bought. When Gilbert saw the bill, he hit the roof. They battled it out in court and never spoke to one another again as long as they lived. When Sullivan wrote the music for a new production, he mailed it to Gilbert, and when Gilbert wrote the words, he mailed them back to Sullivan. Once they had to take a curtain call together, but they stood on opposite sides of the stage and bowed in different directions so they wouldn't see one another. They hadn't the sense to put a stop-loss order on their resentments, as Lincoln did. Once during the Civil War, when some of Lincoln's friends were denouncing his bitter enemies, Lincoln said, You have more of a feeling of personal resentment than I have. Perhaps I have too little of it, but I never thought it paid. A man doesn't have the time to spend half his life in quarrels. If any man ceases to attack me, I never remember the past against him. I wish an old aunt of mine, Aunt Edith, had had Lincoln's forgiving spirit. She and Uncle Frank lived on a mortgaged farm that was infested with cockleburs and cursed with poor soil and ditches. They had tough going, had to squeeze every nickel. But Aunt Edith loved to buy a few curtains and other small items to brighten up their bare home. She bought these small luxuries on credit at Dan Eversole's dry goods store in Maryville, Missouri. Uncle Frank worried about their debts. He had a farmer's horror of running up bills, so he secretly told Dan Eversole to stop letting his wife buy on credit. And when she heard that, she hit the roof, and she was still hitting the roof about it almost fifty years after it had happened. 
I've heard her tell the story not once, but many times. The last time I ever saw her, and she was in her late seventies, I said to her, Aunt Edith, Uncle Frank did wrong to humiliate you, but don't you honestly feel that your complaining about it, almost half a century after it happened, is infinitely worse than what he did? I might as well have said it to the moon. Aunt Edith paid dearly for the grudges and bitter memories that she nourished. She paid for them with her own peace of mind. When Benjamin Franklin was seven years old, he made a mistake that he remembered for seventy years. When he was a lad of seven, he fell in love with a whistle. He was so excited about it that he went into the toy shop, piled his coppers on the counter, and demanded the whistle without even asking its price. I then came home, he wrote to a friend seventy years later, and went whistling all over the house, much pleased with my whistle. But when his older brothers and sisters found out that he had paid far more for his whistle than he should have paid, they gave him the horse laugh, and, as he said, I cried with vexation. Years later, when Franklin was a world-famous figure, an ambassador to France, he still remembered that the fact that he had paid too much for his whistle had caused him more chagrin than the whistle gave him pleasure. But the lesson it taught Franklin was cheap in the end. As I grew up, he said, and came into the world and observed the actions of men, I thought I met with many, very many, who gave too much for the whistle. In short, I conceived that a great part of the miseries of mankind are brought upon them by the false estimates they have made of the value of things, and by their giving too much for their whistles. Gilbert and Sullivan paid too much for their whistles, and so did Aunt Edith, so did Dale Carnegie on many occasions, and so did the immortal Leo Tolstoy, author of two of the world's greatest novels, War and Peace and Anna Karenina. According to the Encyclopedia Britannica, Leo Tolstoy was, during the last twenty years of his life, probably the most venerated man in the whole world. For twenty years before he died, from 1890 to 1910, an unending stream of admirers made pilgrimages to his home in order to catch a glimpse of his face, to hear the sound of his voice, or even touch the hem of his garment. Every sentence he uttered was taken down in a notebook, almost as if it were a divine revelation. But when it came to living, to ordinary living, well, Tolstoy had even less sense at seventy than Franklin had at seven. He had no sense at all. Here's what I mean. Tolstoy married a girl he loved very dearly. In fact, they were so happy together that they used to get on their knees and pray to God to let them continue their lives in such sheer heavenly ecstasy. But the girl Tolstoy married was jealous by nature. She used to dress herself up as a peasant and spy on his movements, even out in the woods. They had fearful rows. She became so jealous even of her own children that she grabbed a gun and shot a hole in her daughter's photograph. She even rolled on the floor with an opium bottle held to her lips and threatened to commit suicide, while the children huddled in a corner of the room and screamed with terror. And what did Tolstoy do? Well, I don't blame the man for up and smashing the furniture. He had good provocation, but he did far worse than that. He kept a private diary. Yes, a diary in which he placed all the blame on his wife. That was his whistle. He was determined to make sure that coming generations would exonerate him and put the blame on his wife. What did his wife do in answer to this? Why, she tore pages out of his diary and burned them, of course. She started a diary of her own, in which she made him the villain. She even wrote a novel entitled Whose Fault, in which she depicted her husband as a household fiend and herself as a martyr. All to what end? Why did these two people turn the only home they had into what Tolstoy himself called a lunatic asylum? Obviously, there were several reasons. One of those reasons was their burning desire to impress you and me. Yes, we are the posterity whose opinions they were worried about. Do we give a hoot in Hades about which one was to blame? No, we're too concerned with our own problems to waste a minute thinking about the Tolstoys. What a price these two wretched people paid for their whistle. Fifty years of living in a veritable hell just because neither of them had the sense to say, Stop! 
because neither of them had enough judgment of values to say, let's put a stop-loss order on this thing instantly. We are squandering our lives. Let's say enough now. Yes, I honestly believe that this is one of the greatest secrets to true peace of mind, a decent sense of values. And I believe we can annihilate 50% of all our worries at once if we would develop a sort of private gold standard, a gold standard of what things are worth to us in terms of our lives. So, to break the worry habit before it breaks you, here is rule five. Whenever we are tempted to throw good money after bad in terms of human living, let's stop and ask ourselves these three questions. One, how much does this thing I am worrying about really matter to me? Two, at what point shall I set a stop-loss order on this worry and forget it? Three, exactly how much shall I pay for this whistle? Have I already paid more than it is worth? Chapter 11. Don't try to saw sawdust. As I write this sentence, I can look out of my window and see some dinosaur tracks in my garden, dinosaur tracks embedded in shale and stone. I purchased those dinosaur tracks from the Peabody Museum of Yale University, and I have a letter from the curator of the Peabody Museum saying that those tracks were made 180 million years ago. Even a Mongolian idiot wouldn't dream of trying to go back 180 million years to change those tracks. Yet that would not be any more foolish than worrying because we can't go back and change what happened 180 seconds ago. And a lot of us are doing just that. To be sure, we may do something to modify the effects of what happened 180 seconds ago, but we can't possibly change the event that occurred then. There is only one way on God's green footstool that the past can be constructive, and that is by calmly analyzing our past mistakes and profiting by them and forgetting them. I know that is true, but have I always had the courage and sense to do it? To answer that question, let me tell you about a fantastic experience I had years ago. I let more than $300,000 slip through my fingers without making a penny's profit. It happened like this. I launched a large-scale enterprise in adult education, opened branches in various cities, and spent money lavishly in overhead and advertising. I was so busy with teaching that I had neither the time nor the desire to look after finances. I was too naive to realize that I needed an astute business manager to watch expenses. Finally, after about a year, I discovered a sobering and shocking truth. I discovered that in spite of our enormous intake, we had not netted any profit whatever. After discovering that, I should have done two things. First, I should have had the sense to do what George Washington Carver did when he lost $40,000 in a bank crash, the savings of a lifetime. When someone asked him if he knew he was bankrupt, he replied, Yes, I heard, and went on with his teaching. He wiped the loss out of his mind so completely that he never mentioned it again. Here's the second thing I should have done. I should have analyzed my mistakes and learned a lasting lesson. But frankly, I didn't do either one of these things. Instead, I went into a tailspin of worry. For months, I was in a daze. I lost sleep and I lost weight. Instead of learning a lesson from this enormous mistake, I went right ahead and did the same thing again on a smaller scale. It is embarrassing for me to admit all this stupidity, but I discovered long ago that it is easier to teach twenty what were good to be done than to be one of the twenty to follow my own teaching. How I wish I had had the privilege of attending the George Washington High School here in New York and studying under Dr. Paul Brandwine, the same teacher who taught Alan Saunders of New York. Mr. Saunders told me that the teacher of his hygiene class, Dr. Paul Brandwine, taught him one of the most valuable lessons he had ever learned. I was only in my teens, said Alan Saunders, as he told me the story, but I was a worrier even then. I used to stew and fret about the mistakes I had made. If I turned in an examination paper, I used to lie awake and chew my fingernails for fear I hadn't passed. I was always living over the things I had done and wishing I had done them differently, thinking over the things I had said and wishing I had said them better. 
Then one morning, our class filed into the science laboratory, and there was the teacher, Dr. Paul Brandwine, with a bottle prominently displayed on the edge of the desk. We all sat down, staring at the milk and wondering what it had to do with the hygiene course he was teaching. Then, all of a sudden, Dr. Paul Brandwine stood up, swept the bottle of milk with a crash into the sink, and shouted, Don't cry over spilt milk. He then made us all come to the sink and look at the wreckage. Take a good look, he told us, because I want you to remember this lesson the rest of your lives. That milk is gone. You can see it down the drain. And all the fussing and hair-pulling in the world won't bring back a drop of it. With a little thought and prevention, that milk might have been saved, but it's too late now. All we can do is write it off, forget it, and go on to the next thing. That one little demonstration, Alan Saunders told me, stuck with me long after I'd forgotten my solid geometry and Latin. In fact, it taught me more about practical living than anything else in my four years of high school. It taught me to keep from spilling milk if I could, but to forget it completely once it was spilled and had gone down the drain. Now, some readers are going to snort at the idea of making so much over a hackneyed proverb like don't cry over spilt milk. I know it's trite, commonplace, and a platitude. I know you've heard it a thousand times, but I also know that these hackneyed proverbs contain the very essence of the distilled wisdom of all ages. They have come out of the fiery experience of the human race and have been handed down through countless generations. If you were to read everything that has ever been written about worry by the greatest scholars of all time, you would never read anything more basic or more profound than such hackneyed proverbs as don't cross your bridges till you come to them and don't cry over spilt milk. If we only applied those two proverbs instead of snorting at them, we wouldn't need this book at all. In fact, if we applied most of the old proverbs, we would lead almost perfect lives. However, knowledge isn't power until it's applied, and the purpose of this book is not to tell you something new. The purpose of this book is to remind you of what you already know, and to kick you in the shins and inspire you to do something about applying it. I have always admired a man like the late Fred Fuller Shedd, who had a gift for stating an old truth in a new and picturesque way. While editor of the Philadelphia Bulletin and addressing a college graduating class, he asked, How many of you have ever sawed wood? Let's see your hands. Most of them had. Then he inquired, How many of you have ever sawed sawdust? No hands went up. Of course you can't saw sawdust, Mr. Shedd exclaimed. It's already sawed, and it's the same with the past. When you start worrying about things that are over and done with, you're merely trying to saw sawdust. When Connie Mack, the grand old man of baseball, was 81 years old, I asked him if he had ever worried over games that were lost. Oh, yes, I used to, Connie Mack told me, but I got over that foolishness long years ago. I found out it didn't get me anywhere at all. You can't grind any grain, he said, with water that has already gone down the creek. No, you can't grind any grain, and you can't saw any logs with water that has already gone down the creek. But you can saw wrinkles in your face and ulcers in your stomach. I had dinner with Jack Dempsey one Thanksgiving, and he told me over the turkey and cranberry sauce about the fight in which he lost the heavyweight championship to Tunney. Naturally, it was a blow to his ego. In the midst of that fight, he told me, I suddenly realized I had become an old man. At the end of the tenth round, I was still on my feet, but that was about all. My face was puffed and cut, and my eyes were nearly closed. I saw the referee raise Gene Tunney's hand in a token of victory. I was no longer champion of the world. I started back in the rain, back through the crowd to my dressing room. As I passed, some people tried to grab my hand. Others had tears in their eyes. A year later, I fought Tunney again, but it was no use. I was through forever. It was hard to keep from worrying about it all, but I said to myself, I'm not going to live in the past or cry over spilt milk. I'm going to take this blow on the chin and not let it floor me. And that is precisely what Jack Dempsey did. How? 
by saying to himself over and over, I won't worry about the past. No, that would merely have forced him to think of his past worries. He did it by accepting and writing off his defeat and then concentrating on plans for the future. He did it by running the Jack Dempsey restaurant on Broadway and the Great Northern Hotel on 57th Street. He did it by promoting prize fights and giving boxing exhibitions. He did it by getting so busy on something constructive that he had neither the time nor the temptation to worry about the past. I have had a better time during the last ten years, Jack Dempsey said, than I had when I was champion. Mr. Dempsey told me that he had not read many books, but without knowing it he was following Shakespeare's advice. Wise men ne'er sit and wail their loss, but cheerily seek how to redress their harms. As I read history and biography and observe people under trying circumstances, I'm constantly astonished and inspired by some people's ability to write off their worries and tragedies and go on living fairly happy lives. I once paid a visit to Sing Sing, and the thing that astonished me most was that the prisoners there appeared to be about as happy as the average person on the outside. I commented on it to Louis E. Laws, then warden of Sing Sing, and he told me that when criminals first arrive at Sing Sing, they are likely to be resentful and bitter. But after a few months, the majority of the more intelligent ones write off their misfortunes and settle down and accept prison life calmly and make the best of it. Warden Laws told me about one Sing Sing prisoner, a gardener, who sang as he cultivated the vegetables and flowers inside the prison walls. That Sing Sing prisoner who sang as he cultivated the flowers showed a lot more sense than most of us do. He knew that the moving finger writes, and having writ moves on, nor all your piety nor wit shall lure it back to cancel half a line, nor all your tears wash out a word of it. So why waste the tears? Of course we have been guilty of blunders and absurdities, and so what? Who hasn't? Even Napoleon lost one-third of all the important battles he fought. Perhaps our batting average is no worse than Napoleon's, who knows? And anyhow, all the king's horses and all the king's men can't put the past back together again. So, let's remember Rule 6. Don't try to saw sawdust. Part 3 in a Nutshell How to Break the Worry Habit Before It Breaks You Rule 1. Crowd worry out of your mind by keeping busy. Plenty of action is one of the best therapies ever devised for curing wibber-jibbers. Rule 2. Don't fuss about trifles. Don't permit little things, the mere termites of life, to ruin your happiness. Rule 3. Use the law of averages to outlaw your worries. Ask yourself, what are the odds against this thing's happening at all? Rule 4. Cooperate with the inevitable. If you know a circumstance is beyond your power to change or revise, say to yourself, it is so, it cannot be otherwise. Rule 5. Put a stop-loss order on your worries. Decide just how much anxiety a thing may be worth and refuse to give it any more. Rule 6. Let the past bury its dead. Don't saw sawdust. Part 4. Seven Ways to Cultivate a Mental Attitude That Will Bring You Peace and Happiness Chapter 12. Eight Words That Can Transform Your Life A few years ago, I was asked to answer this question on a radio program. What is the biggest lesson you have ever learned? That was easy. By far the most vital lesson I have ever learned is the importance of what we think. If I knew what you think, I would know what you are. Our thoughts make us what we are. 
Our mental attitude is the X factor that determines our fate. Emerson said, A man is what he thinks about all day long. How could he possibly be anything else? I now know with a conviction beyond all doubt that the biggest problem you and I have to deal with, in fact, almost the only problem we have to deal with, is choosing the right thoughts. If we can do that, we will be on the high road to solving all our problems. The great philosopher who ruled the Roman Empire, Marcus Aurelius, summed it up in eight words, eight words that can determine your destiny. Our life is what our thoughts make it. Yes, if we think happy thoughts, we will be happy. If we think miserable thoughts, we will be miserable. If we think fear thoughts, we will be fearful. If we think sickly thoughts, we will probably be ill. If we think failure, we will certainly fail. If we wallow in self-pity, everyone will want to shun us and avoid us. You are not, said Norman Vincent Peale, you are not what you think you are, but what you think you are. Am I advocating an habitual Pollyanna attitude toward all our problems? No, unfortunately life isn't so simple as all that. But I am advocating that we assume a positive attitude instead of a negative attitude. In other words, we need to be concerned about our problems, but not worried. What is the difference between concern and worry? Let me illustrate. Every time I cross the traffic-jammed streets of New York, I'm concerned about what I'm doing, but not worried. Concern means realizing what the problems are and calmly taking steps to meet them. Worrying means going around in maddening, futile circles. A man can be concerned about his serious problems and still walk with his chin up and a carnation in his buttonhole. Now, I've seen Lowell Thomas do just that. I once had the privilege of being associated with Lowell Thomas in presenting his famous films on the Allen B. Lawrence campaigns in World War I. He and his assistants had photographed the war on half a dozen fronts, and best of all, had brought back a pictorial record of T. E. Lawrence and his colorful Arabian army, and a film record of Allen B.'s conquest of the Holy Land. His illustrated talks entitled, With Allenby in Palestine and Lawrence in Arabia, were a sensation in London and around the world. The London opera season was postponed for six weeks so that he could continue telling his tale of high adventure and showing his pictures at Covent Garden Royal Opera House. After his sensational success in London came a triumphant tour of many countries. Then he spent two years preparing a film record of life in India and Afghanistan. After a lot of incredibly bad luck, the impossible happened. He found himself broke in London. I was with him at the time. I remember we had to eat cheap meals at the Lion's Corner House restaurants. We couldn't have eaten even there if Mr. Thomas had not borrowed money from a Scotsman, James McBay, the renowned artist. Now here's the point of the story. Even when Lowell Thomas was facing huge debts and severe disappointments, he was concerned but not worried. He knew that if he let his reverses get him down, he would be worthless to everyone, including his creditors. So each morning, before he started out, he bought a flower, put it in his buttonhole, and went swinging down Oxford Street with his head high and his step spirited. He thought positive, courageous thoughts and refused to let defeat defeat him. To him, being licked was all a part of the game, the useful training you had to expect if you wanted to get to the top. Our mental attitude has an almost unbelievable effect even on our physical powers. The famous British psychiatrist J. A. Hadfield gives a striking illustration of that fact in his splendid 54-page booklet, The Psychology of Power. I asked three men, he writes, to submit themselves to test the effect of mental suggestion on their strength, which was measured by gripping a dynamometer. He told them to grip the dynamometer with all their might. He had them do this under three different sets of conditions. When he tested them under normal waking conditions, their average grip was 101 pounds. When he tested them, after he had hypnotized them and told them that they were very weak, they could grip only 29 pounds, less than a third of their normal strength. One of these men was a prize fighter, 
and when he was told under hypnosis that he was weak, he remarked that his arm felt tiny, just like a baby's. When Captain Hadfield then tested these men a third time, telling them under hypnosis that they were very strong, they were able to grip an average of 142 pounds. When their minds were filled with positive thoughts of strength, they increased their actual physical powers almost 50 percent. Such is the incredible power of our mental attitude. To illustrate the magic power of thought, let me tell you one of the most astounding stories in the annals of America. I could write a book about it, but let's be brief. On a frosty October night, shortly after the close of the Civil War, a homeless, destitute woman, who was little more than a wanderer on the face of the earth, knocked at the door of Mother Webster, the wife of a retired sea captain living in Amesbury, Massachusetts. Opening the door, Mother Webster saw a frail little creature, scarcely more than a hundred pounds of frightened skin and bones. The stranger, a Mrs. Glover, explained that she was seeking a home where she could think and work out a great problem that absorbed her day and night. Oh, why not stay here, Mrs. Webster replied. I'm all alone in this big house. Mrs. Glover might have remained indefinitely with Mother Webster if the latter son-in-law, Bill Ellis, hadn't come up from New York for a vacation. When he discovered Mrs. Glover's presence, he shouted, I'll have no vagabonds in this house, and he shoved this homeless woman out of the door. A driving rain was falling. She stood shivering in the rain for a few minutes and then started down the road looking for shelter. Here's the astonishing part of the story. That vagabond, whom Bill Ellis put out of the house, was destined to have as much influence on the thinking of the world as any other woman who ever walked this earth. She is now known to millions of devoted followers as Mary Baker Eddy, the founder of Christian Science. Yet until this time, she had known little in life except sickness, sorrow, and tragedy. Her first husband had died shortly after their marriage. Her second husband had deserted her and eloped with a married woman. He later died in a poorhouse. She had only one child, a son, and she was forced because of poverty, illness, and jealousy to give him up when he was four years old. She lost all track of him and never saw him again for thirty-one years. Because of her own ill health, Mrs. Eddy had been interested for years in what she called the science of mind healing. But the dramatic turning point in her life occurred in Lynn, Massachusetts. Walking downtown one cold day, she slipped and fell on the icy pavement and was knocked unconscious. Her spine was so injured that she was convulsed with spasms. Even the doctor expected her to die. If by some miracle she lived, he declared that she would never walk again. Lying on what was supposed to be her deathbed, Mary Baker Eddy opened her Bible and was led, she declared, by divine guidance to read these words from St. Matthew. And behold, they brought to him a man sick of the palsy lying on a bed. And Jesus said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, be of good cheer, thy sins be forgiven thee. Arise, take up thy bed, and go unto thine house. And he arose and departed to his house. These words of Jesus, she declared, produced within her such a strength, such a faith, such a surge of healing power that she immediately got out of bed and walked. That experience, Mrs. Eddy declared, was the falling apple that led me to the discovery of how to be well myself and how to make others so. I gained the scientific certainty that all causation was mind, and every effect a mental phenomenon. Such was the way in which Mary Baker Eddy became the founder and high priestess of a new religion, Christian Science, the only great religious faith ever established by a woman, a religion that has encircled the globe. You're probably saying to yourself by now, this man Carnegie is proselytizing for Christian science. And no, you're wrong. I am not a Christian scientist, but the longer I live, the more deeply I am convinced of the tremendous power of thought. As a result of many years spent in teaching adults, I know men and women can banish worry, fear, and various kinds of illnesses, 
and can transform their lives by changing their thoughts. I know, I know, I know. I have seen such incredible transformations performed hundreds of times. I have seen them so often that I no longer wonder at them. For example, one of these incredible transformations which illustrate the power of thought happened to one of my students. He had a nervous breakdown. What brought it on? A worry. This student told me, I worried about everything. I worried because I was too thin, because I thought I was losing my hair, because I feared I would never make enough money to get married, because I felt I would never make a good father, because I feared I was losing the girl I wanted to marry, because I felt I was not living a good life. I worried about the impression I was making on other people. I worried because I thought I had stomach ulcers. I could no longer work. I, I gave up my job. I built up tension inside me until I was like a boiler without a safety valve. The pressure got so unbearable that something had to give. And it did. If you have ever had a nervous breakdown, pray God that you never do, for no pain of the body can exceed the excruciating pain of an agonized mind. My breakdown was so severe that I couldn't talk, even to my own family. I had no control over my thoughts. I was filled with fear. I would jump at the slightest noise. I avoided everybody. I would break out crying for no apparent reason at all. Every day was one of agony. I felt that I was deserted by everybody, even God. I was tempted to jump into the river and end it all. I decided instead to take a trip to Florida, hoping that a change of scene would help me. As I stepped on the train, my father handed me a letter and told me not to open it until I reached Florida. I landed in Florida during the height of the tourist season. Since I couldn't get in a hotel, I rented a sleeping room in a garage. I tried to get a job on a tramp freighter out of Miami, but had no luck, so I spent my time on the beach. I was more wretched in Florida than I had been at home, so I opened the envelope to see what Dad had written. His note said, Son, you are 1,500 miles from home, and you don't feel any different, do you? I knew you wouldn't, because you took with you the one thing that is the cause of all your trouble, that is, yourself. There is nothing wrong with either your body or your mind. It is not the situations you have met that have thrown you. It is what you think of these situations. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. When you realize that, son, come home, for you will be cured. Dad's letter made me angry. I was looking for sympathy, not instruction. I was so mad that I decided then and there that I would never go home. That night, as I was walking down one of the side streets of Miami, I came to a church where services were going on. Having no place to go, I drifted in and listened to the sermon on the text, He who conquers his spirit is mightier than he who taketh a city. Sitting in the sanctity of the house of God, and hearing the same thoughts that my dad had written in his letter, all this swept the accumulated litter out of my brain. I was able to think clearly and sensibly for the first time in my life. I realized what a fool I had been. I was shocked to see myself in my true light. Here I was, wanting to change the whole world and everyone in it, when the only thing that needed changing was the focus of the lens of the camera, which was my mind. The next morning, I packed and started home. A week later, I was back on the job. Four months later, I married the girl I had been afraid of losing. We now have a happy family of five children. God has been good to me, both materially and mentally. At the time of the breakdown, I was a night foreman of a small department handling 18 people. I am now superintendent of Carton Manufacture in charge of over 450 people. Life is much fuller and friendlier. I believe I appreciate the true values of life now. When moments of uneasiness try to creep in, as they will in everyone's life, I tell myself to get that camera back in focus, and everything is okay. I can honestly say that I am glad I had the breakdown, because I found out the hard way what power our thoughts can have over our mind and body. Now I can make my thoughts work for me instead of against me. I can see now that Dad was right when he said it wasn't outward situations that had caused all my suffering, but what I thought of those situations. And as soon as I realized that, I was cured, and stayed cured. 
Such was the experience of this student. I'm deeply convinced that our peace of mind and the joy we get out of living depends not on where we are or what we have or who we are, but solely upon our mental attitude. Outward conditions have very little to do with it. For example, let's take the case of old John Brown, who was hanged for seizing the United States arsenal at Harper's Ferry and trying to incite the slaves to rebellion. He rode away to the gallows, sitting on his coffin. The jailer who rode beside him was nervous and worried, but old John Brown was calm and cool. Looking up at the Blue Ridge Mountains of Virginia, he exclaimed, What a beautiful country! I never had an opportunity to really see it before. Or take the case of Robert Falcon Scott and his companions, the first Englishman ever to reach the South Pole. Their return trip was probably the cruelest journey ever undertaken by man. Their food was gone, and so was their fuel. They could no longer march because a howling blizzard roared down over the rim of the earth for eleven days and nights, a wind so fierce and sharp that it cut ridges in the polar ice. Scott and his companions knew they were going to die, and they had brought a quantity of opium along for just such an emergency. A big dose of opium, and they could all lie down to pleasant dreams, never to wake again. But they ignored the drug and died singing ringing songs of cheer. We know they did because of a farewell letter found with their frozen bodies by a searching party eight months later. Yes, if we cherish creative thoughts of courage and calmness, we can enjoy the scenery while sitting on our coffin, riding to the gallows, or we can fill our tents with ringing songs of cheer while starving and freezing to death. Milton, in his blindness, discovered that same truth three hundred years ago. The mind is its own place, and in itself can make a heaven of hell a hell of heaven. Napoleon and Helen Keller are perfect illustrations of Milton's statement. Napoleon had everything men usually crave, glory, power, riches. Yet he said at St. Helena, I have never known six happy days in my life, while Helen Keller, blind, deaf, dumb, declared, I have found life so beautiful. If half a century of living has taught me anything at all, it has taught me that nothing can bring you peace but yourself. I'm merely trying to repeat what Emerson said so well in the closing words of his essay on self-reliance. A political victory, a rise in rents, the recovery of your sick or the return of your absent friend, or some other quite external event raises your spirits, and you think good days are preparing for you. Do not believe it. It can never be so. Nothing can bring you peace but yourself. Epictetus, the great Stoic philosopher, warned that we ought to be more concerned about removing wrong thoughts from the mind than about removing tumors and abscesses from the body. Epictetus said that nineteen centuries ago, but modern medicine would back him up. Dr. G. Canby Robinson declared that four out of five patients admitted to Johns Hopkins Hospital were suffering from conditions brought on in part by emotional strains and stresses. This was often true, even in cases of organic disturbances. Eventually, he declared, these traced back to maladjustments to life and its problems. Montaigne, the great French philosopher, adopted these seventeen words as the motto of his life. A man is not hurt so much by what happens as by his opinion of what happens, and our opinion of what happens is entirely up to us. And what do I mean? Have I the colossal effrontery to tell you to your face when you're mowed down by troubles and your nerves are sticking out like wires and curling up at the ends? Have I the colossal effrontery to tell you that under those conditions you can change your mental attitude by an effort of the will? Yes, I mean precisely that. And that is not all. I am going to show you how to do it. It may take a little effort, but the secret is simple. William James, who has never been topped in his knowledge of practical psychology, once made this observation. Action seems to follow feeling, but really action and feeling go together. 
and by regulating the action, which is under the more direct control of the will, we can indirectly regulate the feeling, which is not. In other words, William James tells us that we cannot instantly change our emotions just by making up our minds to, but that we can change our actions, and that when we change our actions, we will automatically change our feelings. Thus, he explains, the sovereign voluntary path to cheerfulness, if your cheerfulness be lost, is to set up cheerfully and to act and speak as if cheerfulness were already there. Does that simple trick work? Try it yourself. Put a big, broad, honest-to-God smile on your face. Throw back your shoulders, take a good deep breath, and sing a snatch of song. If you can't sing, whistle. If you can't whistle, hum. You will quickly discover what William James was talking about, that it is physically impossible to remain blue or depressed while you're acting out the symptoms of being radiantly happy. This is one of the little basic truths of nature that can easily work miracles in all our lives. I know a woman in California, I won't mention her name, who could wipe out all of her miseries in 24 hours if she only knew this secret. She's old and she's a widow, and that's sad, I admit. But does she try to act happy? No, if you ask her how she is feeling, she says, Oh, I'm all right. But the expression on her face and the whine in her voice say, Oh, God, if you only knew the troubles I've seen. She seems to reproach you for being happy in her presence. Hundreds of women are worse off than she is. Her husband left her enough insurance to last the rest of her life. She has married children to give her a home, but I've rarely seen her smile. She complains that all three of her sons-in-law are stingy and selfish, although she's a guest in their homes for months at a time. And she complains that her daughters never give her presents, although she hoards her own money carefully for my old age. She's a blight on herself and her unfortunate family. But does it have to be so? That's the pity of it. She could change herself from a miserable, bitter, and unhappy old woman into an honored and beloved member of the family, if she wanted to change. All she would have to do to work this transformation would be to start acting cheerful, start acting as though she had a little love to give away, instead of squandering it all on her own unhappy and embittered self. H.J. Englert of Tell City, Indiana, is still alive today because he discovered this secret. Ten years ago, Mr. Englert had a case of scarlet fever, and when he recovered, he found that he had developed nephritis, a kidney disease. He tried all kinds of doctors, even quacks, he informed me, and nothing could cure him. Then, a short time ago, he got other complications. His blood pressure soared. He went to a doctor and was told that his blood pressure was hitting the top at 214. He was told that it was fatal that the condition was progressive, and he had better put his affairs in order at once. I went home, he says, and made sure that my insurance was all paid up. Then I apologized to my maker for all my mistakes and settled down to gloomy meditations. I made everyone unhappy. My wife and family were miserable, and I was buried deep in depression myself. However, after a week of wallowing in self-pity, I said to myself, "'You're acting like a fool.' You may not die for a year yet, so why not try to be happy while you're here? I threw back my shoulders, put a smile on my face, and attempted to act as though everything were normal. I admit it was an effort at first, but I forced myself to be pleasant and cheerful, and this not only helped my family, but it also helped me. The first thing I knew, I began to feel better, almost as well as I pretended to feel. The improvement went on, and today, months after I was supposed to be in my grave, I am not only happy, well, and alive, but my blood pressure is down. I know one thing for certain. The doctor's prediction would certainly have come true if I had gone on thinking dying thoughts of defeat, but I gave my body a chance to heal itself by nothing in the world but a change of mental attitude. Let me ask you a question. If merely acting cheerful and thinking positive thoughts of health and courage could save this man's life, why should you and I tolerate for one minute more our minor glooms and depressions? 
Why make ourselves and everyone around us unhappy and blue when it's possible for us to start creating happiness by merely acting cheerful? Years ago, I read a little book that had a lasting and profound effect on my life. It was called As a Man Thinketh by James Allen, and here's what it said. A man will find that as he alters his thoughts toward things and other people, things and other people will alter towards him. Let a man radically alter his thoughts, and he will be astonished at the rapid transformation it will effect in the material conditions of his life. Men do not attract that which they want, but that which they are. The divinity that shapes our ends is in ourselves. It is our very self. All that a man achieves is the direct result of his own thoughts. A man can only rise, conquer, and achieve by lifting up his thoughts. He can only remain weak and abject and miserable by refusing to lift up his thoughts. According to the book of Genesis, the Creator gave man dominion over the whole wide earth, a mighty big present. But I'm not interested in any such super-royal prerogatives. All I desire is dominion over myself, dominion over my thoughts, dominion over my fears, dominion over my mind and over my spirit. And the wonderful thing is that I know I can attain this dominion to an astonishing degree any time I want to, by merely controlling my actions, which in turn control my reactions. So let us remember these words of William James. Much of what we call evil can often be converted into a bracing and tonic good by a simple change of the sufferer's inner attitude, from one of fear to one of fight. Let's fight for our happiness. Let's fight for our happiness by following a daily program of cheerful and constructive thinking. Here is such a program. It is entitled, Just for Today. I found this program so inspiring that I gave away hundreds of copies. It was written by the late Sybil F. Partridge. If you and I follow it, we will eliminate most of our worries and increase immeasurably our portion of what the French call la joie de vivre. Just for today. 1. Just for today, I will be happy. This assumes that what Abraham Lincoln said is true, that most folks are about as happy as they make up their minds to be. Happiness is from within. It is not a matter of externals. 2. Just for today, I will try to adjust myself to what is, and not try to adjust everything to my own desires. I will take my family, my business, and my luck as they come, and fit myself to them. 3. Just for today, I will take care of my body. I will exercise it, care for it, nourish it, not abuse it nor neglect it, so that it will be a perfect machine for my bidding. 4. Just for today, I will try to strengthen my mind. I will learn something useful. I will not be a mental loafer. I will read something that requires effort, thought, and concentration. 5. Just for today, I will exercise my soul in three ways. I will do somebody a good turn and not get found out. I will do at least two things I don't want to do, as William James suggests, just for exercise. 6. Just for today, I will be agreeable. I will look as well as I can, dress as becomingly as possible, talk low, act courteously, be liberal with praise, criticize not at all, nor find fault with anything, and not try to regulate nor improve anyone. 7. Just for today, I will try to live through this day only, not to tackle my whole life problem at once. I can do things for twelve hours that would appall me if I had to keep them up for a lifetime. 8. Just for today, I will have a program. I will write down what I expect to do every hour. I may not follow it exactly, but I will have it. It will eliminate two pests, hurrying and indecision. 9. Just for today, I will have a quiet half hour all by myself and relax. In this half hour, sometimes I will think of God, so as to get a little more perspective into my life. 10. Just for today, I will be unafraid. 
Especially, I will not be afraid to be happy, to enjoy what is beautiful, to love, and to believe that those I love, love me. If we want to develop a mental attitude that will bring us peace and happiness, here is rule one. Think and act cheerfully, and you will feel cheerful. Chapter 13 The High Cost of Getting Even One night years ago, as I was traveling through Yellowstone Park, I sat with other tourists on bleachers facing a dense growth of pine and spruce. Presently, the animal which we had been waiting to see, the terror of the forest, the grizzly bear, strode out into the glare of the lights and began devouring the garbage that had been dumped there from the kitchen of one of the park hotels. A forest ranger, Major Martindale, sat on a horse and talked to the excited tourists about bears. He told us that the grizzly bear can whip any other animal in the western world, with the possible exception of the buffalo and the Kodiak bear. Yet I noticed that night that there was one animal, and only one, that the grizzly permitted to come out of the forest and eat with him under the glare of the lights, a skunk. The grizzly knew that he could liquidate a skunk with one swipe of his mighty paw. Why didn't he do it? Because he had found out from experience that it didn't pay. I found that out, too. As a farm boy, I trapped four-legged skunks along the hedgerows in Missouri, and as a man, I encountered a few two-legged skunks on the sidewalks of New York. I have found out from sad experience that it doesn't pay to stir up either variety. When we hate our enemies, we're giving them power over us, power over our sleep, our appetites, our blood pressure, our health, and our happiness. Our enemies would dance with joy if only they knew how they were worrying us, lacerating us, and getting even with us. Our hate is not hurting them at all, but our hate is turning our own days and nights into a hellish turmoil. Who do you suppose said this? If selfish people try to take advantage of you, cross them off your list, but don't try to get even. When you try to get even, you hurt yourself more than you hurt the other fellow. Now, those words sound as if they might have been uttered by some starry-eyed idealist, but they weren't. Those words appeared in the bulletin issued by the police department of Milwaukee. How will trying to get even hurt you? In many ways. According to Life magazine, it may even wreck your health. The chief personality characteristic of persons with hypertension, high blood pressure, is resentment, said Life. When resentment is chronic, chronic hypertension and heart trouble follow. So you see that when Jesus said, Love your enemies, he was not only preaching sound ethics, he was also preaching 20th century medicine. When he said, Forgive seventy times seven, Jesus was telling you and me how to keep from having high blood pressure, heart trouble, stomach ulcers, and many other ailments. A friend of mine recently had a serious heart attack. Her physician put her to bed and ordered her to refuse to get angry about anything no matter what happened. Physicians know that if you have a weak heart, a fit of anger can kill you. Did I say can kill you? A fit of anger did kill a restaurant owner in Spokane, Washington a few years ago. I have in front of me now a letter from Jerry Sporthout, then chief of the police department, Spokane, Washington, saying... A few years ago, William Falkaber, a man of 68 who owned a café in Spokane, killed himself by flying into a rage because his cook insisted on drinking coffee out of his saucer. The café owner was so indignant that he grabbed a revolver and started to chase the cook and fell dead from heart failure, with his hand still gripping the gun. The coroner's report declared that anger had caused the heart failure. When Jesus said, love your enemies, he was also telling us how to improve our looks. I know people, and so do you, whose faces have been wrinkled and hardened by hate and disfigured by resentment. All the cosmetic surgery in Christendom won't improve their looks half so much as would a heart full of forgiveness, tenderness, and love. Hatred destroys our ability to enjoy even our food. The Bible puts it this way. Better is a dinner of herbs where love is than a stalled ox and hatred therewith. 
wouldn't our enemies rub their hands with glee if they knew that our hate for them was exhausting us, making us tired and nervous, ruining our looks, giving us heart trouble, and probably shortening our lives? Even if we can't love our enemies, let's at least love ourselves. Let's love ourselves so much that we won't permit our enemies to control our happiness, our health, and our looks. As Shakespeare put it, Heat not a furnace for your foe so hot that it do singe yourself. When Jesus said that we should forgive our enemies seventy times seven, he was also preaching sound business. For example, I have before me as I write a letter I received from George Rona of Uppsala, Sweden. For years, George Rona was an attorney in Vienna, but during the Second World War he fled to Sweden. He had no money, needed work badly. Since he could speak and write several languages, he hoped to get a position as correspondent for some firm engaged in importing or exporting. Most of the firms replied that they had no need of such services because of the war, but they would keep his name on file, and so on. One man, however, wrote George Rona a letter saying, What you imagine about my business is not true. You are both wrong and foolish. I do not need any correspondent. Even if I did need one, I wouldn't hire you, because you can't even write good Swedish. Your letter is full of mistakes. When George Rona read that letter, he was as mad as Donald Duck. What did this Swede mean by telling him he couldn't write the language? Why, the letter that this Swede himself had written was full of mistakes. So George Rona wrote a letter that was calculated to burn this man up. And then he paused. He said to himself, wait a minute now. How do I know this man isn't right? I have studied Swedish, but it's not my native language, so maybe I do make mistakes I don't know anything about. If I do, then I certainly have to study harder if I ever hope to get a job. This man has possibly done me a favor, even though he didn't mean to. The mere fact that he expressed himself in disagreeable terms doesn't alter my debt to him. Therefore, I am going to write him and thank him for what he has done. So George Rona tore up the scorching letter he had already written and wrote another that said, It was kind of you to go to the trouble of writing to me, especially when you do not need a correspondent. I am sorry I was mistaken about your firm. The reason that I wrote to you was that I made inquiry, and your name was given to me as a leader in your field. I did not know I had made grammatical errors in my letter. I am sorry and ashamed of myself. I will now apply myself more diligently to the study of the Swedish language and try to correct my mistakes. I want to thank you for helping me get started on the road to self-improvement. Within a few days, George Rona got a letter from this man asking Rona to come to see him. Rona went and got a job. George Rona discovered for himself that a soft answer turneth away wrath. We may not be saintly enough to love our enemies, but for the sake of our own health and happiness, let's at least forgive them and forget them. That is the smart thing to do. To be wronged or robbed, said Confucius, is nothing unless you continue to remember it. I once asked General Eisenhower's son John if his father ever nourished resentments. No, he replied, Dad never wastes a minute thinking about people he doesn't like. There's an old saying that a man is a fool who can't be angry, but a man is wise who won't be angry. That was the policy of William J. Gaynor, a former mayor of New York. Bitterly denounced by the press, he was shot by a maniac and almost killed. As he lay in the hospital fighting for his life, he said, Every night I forgive everything and everybody. Is that too idealistic? Too much sweetness and light? If so, let's turn for counsel to the great German philosopher Schopenhauer, author of Studies in Pessimism. He regarded life as a futile and painful adventure. Gloom dripped from him as he walked, yet out of the depths of his despair Schopenhauer cried, If possible, no animosity should be felt for anyone. I once asked Bernard Baruch, the man who was the trusted advisor to six presidents, Wilson, Harding, Coolidge, Hoover, Roosevelt, and Truman, whether he was ever disturbed by the attacks of his enemies. No man can humiliate me or disturb me, he replied. I won't let him. 
No one can humiliate or disturb you and me, either, unless we let him. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words can never hurt me. Throughout the ages, mankind has burned its candles before those Christ-like individuals who bore no malice against their enemies. I have often stood in the Jasper National Park in Canada and gazed upon one of the most beautiful mountains in the Western world, a mountain named in honor of Edith Cavill, the British nurse who went to her death like a saint before a German firing squad on October 12, 1915. Her crime? She had hidden and fed and nursed wounded French and English soldiers in her Belgian home and had helped them escape into Holland. As the English chaplain entered her cell in the military prison in Brussels that October morning to prepare her for death, Edith Cavill uttered two sentences that have been preserved in bronze and granite. I realize that patriotism is not enough. I must have no hatred or bitterness toward anyone. Four years later, her body was removed to England, and memorial services were held in Westminster Abbey. I once spent a year in London. I have often stood before the statue of Edith Cavill opposite the National Portrait Gallery and read her immortal words carved in granite. I realize that patriotism is not enough. I must have no hatred or bitterness toward anyone. One sure way to forgive and forget our enemies is to become absorbed in some cause infinitely bigger than ourselves. Then the insults and the enmities we encounter won't matter, because we will be oblivious of everything but our cause. As an example, let's take an intensely dramatic event that was about to take place in the pine woods of Mississippi back in 1918, a lynching. Lawrence Jones, a black teacher and preacher, was about to be lynched. Some years ago, I visited the school that Lawrence Jones founded, the Piney Woods Country School, and I spoke before the student body. That school is nationally known today, but the incident I'm going to relate occurred long before that. It occurred back in the highly emotional days of the First World War. A rumor had spread through central Mississippi that the Germans were arousing the blacks and inciting them to rebellion. Lawrence Jones, the man who was about to be lynched, was, as I have already said, a black himself and was accused of helping to arouse his race to insurrection. A group of white men, pausing outside the church, had heard Lawrence Jones shouting to his congregation, Life is a battle in which every black must gird on his armor and fight to survive and succeed. Fight! Armor! Enough! Galloping off into the night, these excited young men recruited a mob, returned to the church, put a rope around the preacher, dragged him for a mile up the road, stood him on a heap of kindling, lighted matches, and were about to hang him and burn him at the same time when someone shouted, Let's make the blankety-blank-blank -blank talk before he burns. Speech! Speech! Lawrence Jones, standing on the kindling, spoke with a rope around his neck, spoke for his life and his cause. He had been graduated from the University of Iowa in 1907. His sterling character, his scholarship, and his musical ability had made him popular with both the students and the faculty. Upon graduation, he had turned down the offer of a hotel man to set him up in business, and had turned down the offer of a wealthy man to finance his musical education. Why? Because he was on fire with a vision. Reading the story of Booker T. Washington's life, he'd been inspired to devote his own life to educating the poverty-stricken, illiterate members of his race. So he went to the most backward belt he could find in the South, a spot twenty-five miles south of Jackson, Mississippi. Pawning his watch for a dollar sixty-five, he started his school in the open woods with a stump for a desk. Lawrence Jones told these angry men who were waiting to lynch him of the struggle he had had to educate these unschooled boys and girls and to train them to be good farmers, mechanics, cooks, housekeepers. He told of the white men who had helped him in his struggle to establish Piney Woods Country School, white men who had given him land, lumber, and pigs, cows, and money to help him carry on his educational work. When Lawrence Jones talked with sincere and moving eloquence, as he pleaded not for himself but his cause, the mob began to soften. 
Finally, an old Confederate veteran in the crowd said, I believe this boy is telling the truth. I know the white men whose names he has mentioned. He's doing fine work. We have made a mistake. We ought to help him instead of hang him. The Confederate veteran passed his hat through the crowd and raised a gift of $52.40 from the very men who had gathered there to hang the founder of the Piney Woods Country School, the man who said, I have no time to quarrel, no time for regrets, and no man can force me to stoop low enough to hate him. Epictetus pointed out nineteen centuries ago that we reap what we sow, and that somehow fate almost always makes us pay for our malefactions. In the long run, said Epictetus, every man will pay the penalty for his own misdeeds. The man who remembers this will be angry with no one, indignant with no one, revile no one, blame no one, offend no one, hate no one. Probably no other man in American history was ever more denounced and hated and double-crossed than Lincoln. Yet Lincoln, according to Herndon's classic biography, never judged men by his like or dislike for them. If any given act was to be performed, he could understand that his enemy could do it just as well as anyone. If a man had maligned him or had been guilty of personal ill-treatment and was the fittest man for the place, Lincoln would give him that place just as soon as he would give it to a friend. I do not think he ever removed a man because he was his enemy or because he disliked him. Lincoln was denounced and insulted by some of the very men he had appointed to positions of high power, men like McClellan, Seward, Stanton, and Chase. Yet Lincoln believed, according to Herndon, his law partner, that no man was to be eulogized for what he did or censured for what he did or did not do because all of us are the children of conditions of circumstances, of environment, of education, of acquired habits, and of heredity, molding men as they are and will forever be. Perhaps Lincoln was right. If you and I had inherited the same physical, mental, and emotional characteristics that our enemies have inherited, and if life had done to us what it has done to them, we would act exactly as they do. We couldn't possibly do anything else. Let's be charitable enough to repeat the prayer of the Sioux Indians. O oh, great spirit, keep me from ever judging and criticizing a man until I have walked in his moccasins for two weeks. So, instead of hating our enemies, let's pity them and thank God that life has not made us what they are. Instead of heaping condemnation and revenge upon our enemies, let us give them our understanding, our sympathy, our help, our forgiveness, and our prayers. I was brought up in a family which read the scriptures or repeated a verse from the Bible each night, and then knelt down and said family prayers. I can still hear my father in a lonely Missouri farmhouse repeating these words of Jesus, words that will continue to be repeated as long as man cherishes his ideals. Love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. And pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. My father tried to live those words of Jesus, and they gave him an inner peace that the captains and the kings of earth have often sought for in vain. To cultivate a mental attitude that will bring you peace and happiness, remember that rule two is, let's never try to get even with our enemies, because if we do, we will hurt ourselves far more than we hurt them. Let's do as General Eisenhower does. Let's never waste a minute thinking about people we don't like. Chapter 14 If you do this, you will never worry about ingratitude. I recently met a businessman in Texas who was burned up with indignation. I was warned that he would tell me about it within 15 minutes after I met him. He did. The incident he was angry about had occurred eleven months previously, but he was still burned up about it. He couldn't talk of anything else. He had given his thirty-four employees ten thousand dollars in Christmas bonuses, approximately three hundred dollars each, and no one had thanked him. I am sorry, he complained bitterly, that I ever gave them a penny. An angry man, said Confucius, is always full of poison. This man was so full of poison that I honestly pitied him. 
He was about 60 years old. Now, life insurance companies figure that on the average, we will live slightly more than two-thirds of the difference between our present age and 80. So this man, if he was lucky, probably had about 14 or 15 years to live. Yet he had already wasted almost one of his few remaining years by his bitterness and resentment over an event that was past and gone. I pitied him. Instead of wallowing in resentment and self-pity, he might have asked himself why he didn't get any appreciation. Maybe he'd underpaid and overworked his employees. Maybe they considered a Christmas bonus not a gift, but something they had earned. Maybe he was so critical and unapproachable that no one dared or cared to thank him. Maybe they felt he gave the bonus because most of the profits were going for taxes anyway. On the other hand, maybe the employees were selfish, mean, and ill-mannered. Maybe this, maybe that. I don't know any more about it than you do. But I do know that Dr. Samuel Johnson said, Gratitude is a fruit of great cultivation. You do not find it among gross people. Now here's the point I'm trying to make. This man made the human and distressing mistake of expecting gratitude. He just didn't know human nature. If you saved a man's life, would you expect him to be grateful? You might, but Samuel Leibowitz, who was a famous criminal lawyer before he became a judge, saved 78 men from going to the electric chair. How many of these men, do you suppose, stopped to thank Samuel Leibowitz or ever took the trouble to send him a Christmas card? How many? Guess. That's right. None. Christ helped ten lepers in one afternoon, but how many of these lepers ever stopped to thank him? Only one. Look it up in St. Luke. When Christ turned around to his disciples and asked, Where are the other nine? They had all run away, disappeared without thanks. Let me ask you a question. Why should you and I, or this businessman in Texas, expect more thanks for our small favors than was given Jesus Christ? And when it comes to money matters, well, that's even more hopeless. Charles Schwab told me that he once saved a bank cashier who had speculated in the stock market with funds belonging to the bank. Schwab put up the money to save this man from going to the penitentiary. Was the cashier grateful? Oh, yes, for a little while. Then he turned against Schwab and reviled him and denounced him, the very man who kept him out of jail. If you gave one of your relatives a million dollars, would you expect him to be grateful? Andrew Carnegie did just that. But if Andrew Carnegie had come back from the grave a little while later, he would have been shocked to find this relative cursing him. Why? Because old Andy had left $365 million to public charities and had cut him off with one measly million, as he put it. That's how it goes. Human nature has always been human nature, and it probably won't change in your lifetime. So why not accept it? Why not be as realistic about it as was old Marcus Aurelius, one of the wisest men who ever ruled the Roman Empire? He wrote in his diary one day, I am going to meet people today who talk too much, people who are selfish, egotistical, ungrateful. But I won't be surprised or disturbed, for I couldn't imagine a world without such people. That makes sense, doesn't it? If you and I go around grumbling about ingratitude, who is to blame? Is it human nature, or is it our ignorance of human nature? Let's not expect gratitude. Then, if we get some occasionally, it will come as a delightful surprise. If we don't get it, we won't be disturbed. Now, here's the first point I'm trying to make in this chapter. It is natural for people to forget to be grateful. So if we go around expecting gratitude, we're heading straight for a lot of headaches. I know a woman in New York who's always complaining because she's lonely. Not one of her relatives wants to go near her, and no wonder. If you visit her, she'll tell you for hours what she did for her nieces when they were children. She nursed them through the measles and the mumps and the whooping cough. She boarded them for years. She helped to send one of them through business school, and she made a home for the other until she got married. Do the nieces come to see her? Oh, yes, now and then, out of a spirit of duty. But they dread these visits. They know they will have to sit and listen for hours to half-veiled reproaches. They will be treated to an endless litany of bitter complaints and self-pitying sighs. 
And when this woman can no longer bludgeon, browbeat, or bully her nieces into coming to see her, she has one of her spells. She develops a heart attack. Is the heart attack real? Yes. The doctors say she has a nervous heart, suffers from palpitations. But the doctors also say they can do nothing for her. Her trouble is emotional. What this woman really wants is love and attention, but she calls it gratitude. And she will never get gratitude or love because she demands it. She thinks it's her due. And there are thousands of people like her, people who are ill from ingratitude, loneliness, and neglect. They long to be loved, but the only way in this world that they can ever hope to be loved is to stop asking for it and to start pouring out love without hope of return. Does that sound like sheer, impractical, visionary idealism? It isn't. It's just horse sense. It's a good way for you and me to find the happiness we long for. I know. I have seen it happen right in my own family. My own mother and father gave for the joy of helping others. We were poor, always overwhelmed with debts, yet poor as we were, my father and mother always managed to send money every year to an orphan's home, the Christian home in Council Bluffs, Iowa. Mother and father never visited that home. Probably no one thanked them for their gifts except by letter, but they were richly repaid, for they had the joy of helping little children, without wishing for or expecting any gratitude in return. After I left home, I would always send father and mother a check at Christmas and urge them to indulge in a few luxuries for themselves, but they rarely did. When I came home a few days before Christmas, Father would tell me of the coal and groceries they'd bought for some widow woman in town who had a lot of children and no money to buy food and fuel. What joy they got out of giving these gifts, the joy of giving without expecting anything whatever in return. I believe my father would almost have qualified for Aristotle's description of the ideal man, the man most worthy of being happy. The ideal man, said Aristotle, takes joy in doing favors for others. Now, here's the second point I'm trying to make in this chapter. If we want to find happiness, let's stop thinking about gratitude or ingratitude and give for the inner joy of giving. Parents have been tearing their hair about the ingratitude of children for 10,000 years. Even Shakespeare's King Lear cried out, How sharper than a serpent's tooth it is to have a thankless child. But why should children be thankful, unless we train them to be? Ingratitude is natural, like weeds. Gratitude is like a rose. It has to be fed and watered and cultivated and loved and protected. If our children are ungrateful, who's to blame? Maybe we are. If we have never taught them to express gratitude to others, how can we expect them to be grateful to us? I knew a man in Chicago who had cause to complain of the ingratitude of his stepsons. He slaved in a box factory, seldom earning more than $40 a week. He married a widow, and she persuaded him to borrow money and send her two grown sons to college. Out of his salary of $40 a week, he had to pay for food, rent, fuel, clothes, and also for the payments on his note. He did this for four years, working like a coolie and never complaining. Did he get any thanks? No. His wife took it all for granted, and so did her sons. They never imagined that they owed their stepfather anything, not even thanks. Who was to blame? The boys? Yes, but the mother was even more to blame. She thought it was a shame to burden their young lives with a sense of obligation. She didn't want her sons to start out under debt, so she never dreamed of saying, What a prince your stepfather is to help you through college. Instead, she took the attitude, Oh, that's the least he can do. She thought she was sparing her sons, but in reality she was sending them out into life with the dangerous idea that the world owed them a living. And it was a dangerous idea, for one of those sons tried to borrow from an employer and ended up in jail. We must remember that our children are very much what we make them. For example, my mother's sister, Viola Alexander of Minneapolis, is a shining example of a woman who never had cause to complain about the ingratitude of children. 
When I was a boy, Aunt Viola took her own mother into her home to love and take care of, and she did the same thing for her husband's mother. I can still close my eyes and see those two old ladies sitting before the fire in Aunt Viola's farmhouse. Were they any trouble to Aunt Viola? <laughs> Often, I suppose. But you never would have guessed it from her attitude. She loved those old ladies. She pampered them and spoiled them and made them feel at home. In addition, Aunt Viola had six children of her own, but it never occurred to her that she was doing anything especially noble or deserved any halos for taking those old ladies into her home. To her, it was the natural thing, the right thing, the thing she wanted to do. Now, where is Aunt Viola today? Well, she's now been a widow for twenty-odd years, and she has five grown-up children, five separate households, all clamoring to share her and to have her come and live in their homes. Her children adore her. They never get enough of her. Out of gratitude? Nonsense. It is love, sheer love. Those children breathed in warmth and radiant human kindness all during their childhoods. Is it any wonder that now that the situation is reversed, they give back love? So let us remember that to raise grateful children, we have to be grateful. Let us remember little pitchers have big ears and watch what we say. To illustrate, the next time we're tempted to belittle someone's kindness in the presence of our children, let's stop. Let's never say, Look at these dishcloths Cousin Sue sent for Christmas. She knit them herself. They didn't cost her a cent. The remark may seem trivial to us, but the children are listening. So instead we'd better say, Look at the hours Cousin Sue spent making these for Christmas. Isn't she nice? Let's write her a thank you note right now. And our children may unconsciously absorb the habit of praise and appreciation. To avoid resentment and worry over ingratitude, here is rule three. A. Instead of worrying about ingratitude, let's expect it. Let's remember that Jesus healed ten lepers in one day, and only one thanked him. Why should we expect more gratitude than Jesus got? B. Let's remember that the only way to find happiness is not to expect gratitude, but to give for the joy of giving. C. Let's remember that gratitude is a cultivated trait. So if we want our children to be grateful, we must train them to be grateful. Chapter 15 Would You Take a Million Dollars for What You Have? I have known Harold Abbott for years. He lived in Webb City, Missouri. He used to be my lecture manager. One day he and I met in Kansas City, and he drove me down to my farm in Belton, Missouri. During that drive, I asked him how he kept from worrying, and he told me an inspiring story I shall never forget. I used to worry a lot, he said. But one spring day in 1934, I was walking down West Doherty Street in Webb City. I saw a sight that banished all my worries. It happened in ten seconds. But during those ten seconds, I learned more about how to live than I had learned in the previous ten years. For two years, I'd been running a grocery store in Webb City, Harold Abbott said, as he told me the story. I had not only lost all my savings, but I had incurred debts that took me seven years to pay back. My grocery store had been closed the previous Saturday, and now I was going to the Merchants and Miners Bank to borrow money so I could go to Kansas City to look for a job. I walked like a beaten man. I'd lost all my fight and faith. Then suddenly, coming down the street, I saw a man who had no legs. He was sitting on a little wooden platform equipped with wheels from roller skates. He propelled himself along the street with a block of wood in each hand. I met him just after he crossed the street and was starting to lift himself up a few inches over the curb to the sidewalk. As he tilted his little wooden platform to an angle, his eyes met mine. He greeted me with a grand smile. "'Morning, sir. It's a fine morning, isn't it?' he said with spirit. As I stood looking at him, I realized how rich I was. 
I had two legs, I could walk. I felt ashamed of my self-pity. I said to myself, if he can be happy, cheerful, and confident without legs, I certainly can with legs. I could already feel my chest lifting. I had intended to ask the Merchants and Miners Bank for only a hundred dollars, but now I had courage to ask for two hundred. I had intended to say that I wanted to go to Kansas City to try to get a job, but now I announced confidently that I wanted to go to Kansas City to get a job. I got the loan, and I got the job. I now have the following words pasted on my bathroom mirror, and I read them every morning as I shave. I had the blues because I had no shoes, until upon the street I met a man who had no feet. I once asked Eddie Rickenbacker what was the biggest lesson he had learned from drifting about with his companions in life rafts for twenty-one days, hopelessly lost in the Pacific. The biggest lesson I learned from that experience, he said, was that if you have all the fresh water you want to drink and all the food you want to eat, you ought never to complain about anything. Time ran an article about a sergeant who had been wounded on Guadalcanal. Hit in the throat by a shell fragment, this sergeant had seven blood transfusions. Writing a note to his doctor, he asked, Will I live? The doctor replied, Yes. He wrote another note asking, Will I be able to talk? Again, the answer was yes. Then he wrote another note saying, Then what in the hell am I worrying about? Why don't you stop right now and ask yourself, What in the hell am I worrying about? You will probably find that it is comparatively unimportant and insignificant. About 90% of the things in our lives are right and about 10% are wrong. If we want to be happy, all we have to do is concentrate on the 90% that are right and ignore the 10% that are wrong. If we want to be worried and bitter and have stomach ulcers, all we have to do is concentrate on the 10% that are wrong and ignore the 90% that are glorious. The words think and thank are inscribed in many of the Cromwellian churches of England. These words ought to be inscribed in our hearts, too. Think and thank. Think of all we have to be grateful for, and thank God for all our boons and bounties. Jonathan Swift, author of Gulliver's Travels, was the most devastating pessimist in English literature. He was so sorry that he had been born that he wore black and fasted on his birthdays. Yet in his despair, this supreme pessimist of English literature praised the great health-giving powers of cheerfulness and happiness. The best doctors in the world, he declared, are Dr. Diet, Dr. Quiet, and Dr. Merryman. Now, you and I may have the services of Dr. Merryman free every hour of the day by keeping our attention fixed on all the incredible riches we possess, riches exceeding by far the fabled treasures of Alibaba. Would you sell both your eyes for a billion dollars? What would you take for your two legs? your hands, your hearing, your children, your family. Add up your assets, and you will find that you won't sell what you have for all the gold ever amassed by the Rockefellers, the Fords, and the Morgans combined. But do we appreciate all this? Ah, oh, no. As Schopenhauer said, we seldom think of what we have, but always of what we lack. Yes, the tendency to seldom think of what we have, but always of what we lack, is the greatest tragedy on earth. It has probably caused more misery than all the wars and diseases in history. It caused John Palmer to turn from a regular guy into an old grouch and almost wreck his home. I know, because he told me so. Mr. Palmer lives in Patterson, New Jersey. Shortly after I returned from the Army, he said, I started in business for myself. I worked hard day and night. Things were going nicely, then trouble started. I couldn't get parts and materials. I was afraid I would have to give up my business. I worried so much that I changed from a regular guy into an old grouch. I became so sour and cross that, well, I didn't know it then, but I now realize that I came very near to losing my happy home. Then one day a young disabled veteran who works for me said, Johnny, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. You take on as if you were the only person in the world with troubles. 
Suppose you do have to shut up shop for a while. So what? You can start up again when things get normal. You've got a lot to be thankful for. Yet you're always growling. Boy, how I wish I were in your shoes. Now look at me. I've only got one arm and half of my face is shot away, and yet I'm not complaining. If you don't stop your growling and grumbling, you'll lose not only your business, but also your health, your home, and your friends. Those remarks stopped me dead in my tracks. They made me realize how well off I was. I resolved then and there that I would change and be my old self again. And I did. A friend of mine, Lucille Blake, had to tremble on the edge of tragedy before she learned to be happy about what she had instead of worrying over what she lacked. I met Lucille years ago when we were both studying short story writing in the Columbia University School of Journalism. Some years ago, she got the shock of her life. She was living then in Tucson, Arizona. She had, well, and here's the story as she told it to me. I had been living in a whirl, studying the organ at the University of Arizona, conducting a speech clinic in town, and teaching a class in musical appreciation at the Desert Willow Ranch where I was staying. I was going in for parties, dances, horseback rides under the stars. One morning I collapsed, my heart. You will have to lie in bed for a year of complete rest, the doctor said. He didn't encourage me to believe I would ever be strong again. In bed for a year, to be an invalid, perhaps to die, I was terror-stricken. Why did all this have to happen to me? What had I done to deserve it? I wept and wailed. I was bitter and rebellious. But I did go to bed as the doctor advised. A neighbor of mine, Mr. Rudolph, an artist, said to me, you think now that spending a year in bed will be a tragedy, but it won't be. You'll have the time to think and get acquainted with yourself. You'll make more spiritual growth in these next few months than you've made during all your previous life. I became calmer and tried to develop a new sense of values. I read books of inspiration. One day I heard a radio commentator say, You can express only what is in your own consciousness. I had heard words like these many times before, but now they reached down inside me and took root. I resolved to think only the thoughts I wanted to live by, thoughts of joy, happiness, health. I forced myself each morning as soon as I awoke to go over all the things I had to be grateful for. No pain, a lovely young daughter, my eyesight, my hearing, lovely music on the radio, time to read, good food, good friends. I was so cheerful and had so many visitors that the doctor put up a sign saying that only one visitor at a time would be allowed in my cabin, and only at certain hours. Many years have passed since then, and I now lead a full, active life. I'm deeply grateful now for that year I spent in bed. It was the most valuable and the happiest year I spent in Arizona. The habit I formed then of counting my blessings each morning still remains with me. It is one of my most precious possessions. I'm ashamed to realize that I never really learned to live until I feared I was going to die. My dear Lucille Blake, you may not realize it, but you learned the same lesson that Dr. Samuel Johnson learned 200 years ago. The habit of looking on the best side of every event, said Dr. Johnson, is worth more than a thousand pounds a year. Those words were uttered, mind you, not by a professional optimist, but by a man who had known anxiety, rags, and hunger for twenty years, and finally became one of the most eminent writers of his generation, and the most celebrated conversationalist of all time. Logan Persall Smith packed a lot of wisdom into a few words when he said, There are two things to aim at in life. First, to get what you want, and after that, to enjoy it. Only the wisest of mankind achieve the second. Would you like to know how to make even dishwashing at the kitchen sink a thrilling experience? If so, read an inspiring book of incredible courage by Borghild Dahl. It is called I Wanted to See. This book was written by a woman who was practically blind for half a century. I had only one eye, she writes, and it was so covered with dense scars that I had to do all my seeing through one small opening in the left of the eye. I could see a book only by holding it up close to my face and by straining my one eye as hard as I could to the left. But she refused to be pitied, refused to be considered different. 
As a child, she wanted to play hopscotch with other children, but she couldn't see the markings. So after the other children had gone home, she got down on the ground and crawled along with her eyes near to the marks. She memorized every bit of the ground where she and her friends played, and soon became an expert at running games. She did her reading at home, holding a book of large print so close to her eyes that her eyelashes brushed the pages. She earned two college degrees, an A.B. from the University of Minnesota and a Master of Arts from Columbia University. She started teaching in the tiny village of Twin Valley, Minnesota, and rose until she became professor of journalism and literature at Augustana College in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. She taught there for 13 years, lecturing before women's clubs and giving radio talks about books and authors. In the back of my mind, she writes, there had always lurked a fear of total blindness. In order to overcome this, I had adopted a cheerful, almost hilarious attitude toward life. Then in 1943, when she was 52 years old, a miracle happened, an operation at the famous Mayo Clinic. She could now see 40 times as well as she had ever been able to see before. A new and exciting world of loveliness opened before her. She now found it thrilling even to wash dishes in the kitchen sink. I began to play with the white fluffy suds in the dishpan, she writes. I dip my hands into them, and I pick up a ball of tiny soap bubbles. I hold them up against the light, and in each of them I can see brilliant colors of a miniature rainbow. As she looked through the windows above the kitchen sink, she saw the flapping gray-black wings of the sparrows flying through the thick, falling snow. She found such ecstasy looking at the soap bubbles and sparrows that she closed her book with these words. Dear Lord, I whisper, our Father in heaven, I thank Thee. I thank Thee. Imagine thanking God because you can wash dishes and see rainbows and bubbles and sparrows flying through the snow. You and I ought to be ashamed of ourselves. All the days of our years we have been living in a fairy land of beauty, but we have been too blind to see, too satiated to enjoy. If we want to stop worrying and start living, rule four is count your blessings, not your troubles. Chapter 16. Find yourself and be yourself. Remember, there is no one else on earth like you. I have a letter from Mrs. Edith Allred of Mount Airy, North Carolina. As a child, I was extremely sensitive and shy, she says in her letter. I was always overweight, and my cheeks made me look even fatter than I was. I had an old-fashioned mother who thought it was foolish to make clothes look pretty. She always said, wide will wear while narrow will tear, and she dressed me accordingly. I never went to parties, never had any fun, and when I went to school, I never joined the other children in outside activities, not even athletics. I was morbidly shy. I felt I was different from everybody else, and entirely undesirable. When I grew up, I married a man who was several years my senior, but I didn't change. My in-laws were a poised and self-confident family. They were everything I should have been, but simply was not. I tried my best to be like them, but I couldn't. Every attempt they made to draw me out of myself only drove me further into my shell. I became nervous and irritable. I avoided all friends. I got so bad, I even dreaded the sound of the doorbell ringing. I was a failure, I knew it, and I was afraid my husband would find out. So whenever we were in public, I tried to be gay and overacted my part. I knew I overacted, and I would be miserable for days afterward. At last I became so unhappy that I could see no point in prolonging my existence. I began to think of suicide. What happened to change this unhappy woman's life? Just a chance remark. A chance remark, Mrs. Allred continued, transformed my whole life. My mother-in-law was talking one day of how she brought her children up, and she said, no matter what happened, I always insisted on their being themselves. On being themselves. That remark is what did it. In a flash, I realized I had brought all this misery on myself by trying to fit myself into a pattern to which I did not conform. I changed overnight. I started being myself. 
I tried to make a study of my own personality, tried to find out what I was. I studied my strong points. I learned all I could about colors and styles and dressed in a way that I felt was becoming to me. I reached out to make friends. I joined an organization, a small one at first, and was petrified with fright when they put me on a program. But each time I spoke, I gained a little courage. It took a long while. But today I have more happiness than I ever dreamed possible. In rearing my own children, I have always taught them the lesson I had to learn from such bitter experience. No matter what happens, always be yourself. This problem of being willing to be yourself is as old as history, says Dr. James Gordon Gilkey, and as universal as human life. This problem of being unwilling to be yourself is the hidden spring behind many neuroses and psychoses and complexes. Angelo Patry has written 13 books and thousands of syndicated newspaper articles on the subject of child training. And he says, Nobody is so miserable as he who longs to be somebody and something other than the person he is in body and mind. This craving to be something you are not is especially rampant in Hollywood. Sam Wood, one of Hollywood's best-known directors, said the greatest headache he has with aspiring young actors is exactly this problem, to make them be themselves. They all want to be second-rate Lana Turners or third-rate Clark Gables. The public has already had that flavor, Sam Wood keeps telling them. Now it wants something else. Before he started directing such pictures as Goodbye, Mr. Chips, and For Whom the Bell Tolls, Sam Wood spent years in the real estate business, developing sales personalities. He declares that the same principles apply in the business world as in the world of moving pictures. You won't get anywhere playing the ape. You can't be a parrot. Experience has taught me, says Sam Wood, that it's the safest to drop as quickly as possible people who pretend to be what they aren't. I asked Paul Boynton, then employment director for a major oil company, what's the biggest mistake people make in applying for jobs. Uh, he ought to know. He has interviewed more than 60,000 job seekers, and he's written a book entitled Six Ways to Get a Job. He replied, the biggest mistake people make in applying for jobs is in not being themselves. Instead of taking their hair down and being completely frank, they often try to give you the answer they think you want. But it doesn't work, because nobody wants a phony. Nobody ever wants a counterfeit coin. A certain daughter of a streetcar conductor had to learn that lesson the hard way. She longed to be a singer, but her face was her misfortune. She had a large mouth and protruding buck teeth. When she first sang in public in a New Jersey nightclub, she tried to pull down her upper lip to cover her teeth. She tried to act glamorous. The results? She made herself ridiculous. She was headed for failure. However, there was a man in this nightclub who heard the girl sing and thought she had talent. See here, he said bluntly, I've been watching your performance and I know what it is you're trying to hide. You're ashamed of your teeth. The girl was embarrassed, but the man continued, What of it? Is there any particular crime in having buck teeth? Don't try to hide them. Open your mouth, and the audience will love you when they see you're not ashamed. Besides, he said shrewdly, those teeth you're trying to hide may make your fortune. Cass Daly took his advice and forgot about her teeth. From that time on, she thought only about her audience. She opened her mouth wide and sang with such gusto and enjoyment that she became a top star in movies and radio. Other comedians tried to copy her. The renowned William James was speaking of people who had never found themselves when he declared that the average person develops only 10% of his or her latent mental abilities. Compared to what we ought to be, he wrote, we are only half awake. We are making use of only a small part of our physical and mental resources. Stating the thing broadly, human individuals thus live far within their limits. They possess powers of various sorts which they habitually fail to use. You and I have such abilities, so let's not waste a second worrying because we're not like other people. You are something new in this world. Never before since the beginning of time has there ever been anybody exactly like you. And never again throughout all the ages to come will there ever be anybody exactly like you again. The science of genetics informs us 
that you are what you are largely as a result of 23 chromosomes contributed by your father and 23 chromosomes contributed by your mother. These 46 chromosomes comprise everything that determines what you inherit. In each chromosome there may be, says Amram Scheinfeld, anywhere from scores to hundreds of genes, with a single gene, in some cases, able to change the whole life of an individual. Truly, we are fearfully and wonderfully made. Even after your mother and father met and mated, there was only one chance in 300,000 billion that the person who is specifically you would be born. In other words, if you had 300,000 billion brothers and sisters, they might all have been different from you. Is this all guesswork? No, it's a scientific fact. If you'd like to read more about it, consult You and Heredity by Amram Scheinfeld. I can talk with conviction about this subject of being yourself because I feel deeply about it. I know what I'm talking about. I know from bitter and costly experience. To illustrate, when I first came to New York from the cornfields of Missouri, I enrolled in the American Academy of Dramatic Arts. I aspired to be an actor. I had what I thought was a brilliant idea, a shortcut to success, an idea so simple, so foolproof that I couldn't understand why thousands of ambitious people hadn't already discovered it. It was this. I would study how the famous actors of that day, John Drew, Walter Hamden, and Otis Skinner, got their effects. Then I would imitate the best points of each one of them and make myself into a shining, triumphant combination of all of them. How silly! How absurd! I had to waste years of my life imitating other people before it penetrated through my thick Missouri skull that I had to be myself, that I couldn't possibly be anyone else. That distressing experience ought to have taught me a lasting lesson, but it didn't, not me. I was too dumb. I had to learn it all over again. Several years later, I set out to write what I hoped would be the best book on public speaking for businessmen that had ever been written. I had the same foolish idea about writing this book that I had formerly had about acting. I was going to borrow the ideas of a lot of other writers and put them all in one book, a book that would have everything. So I got scores of books on public speaking and spent a year incorporating their ideas into my manuscript. But it finally dawned on me once again that I was playing the fool. This hodgepodge of other men's ideas that I had written was so synthetic, so dull, that no businessman would ever plod through it. So I tossed a year's work into the wastebasket and started all over again. This time I said to myself, You've got to be Dale Carnegie, with all his faults and limitations. You can't possibly be anybody else. So I quit trying to be a combination of other men, and rolled up my sleeves and did what I should have done in the first place. I wrote a textbook on public speaking out of my own experiences, observations, and convictions as a speaker and a teacher of speaking. I learned, for all time, I hope, the lesson that Sir Walter Raleigh learned. Now, I'm not talking about the Sir Walter who threw his coat in the mud for the Queen to step on. I'm talking about the Sir Walter Raleigh who was professor of English literature at Oxford back in 1904. I can't write a book commensurate with Shakespeare, he said, but I can write a book by me. Be yourself. Act on the sage advice that Irving Berlin gave the late George Gershwin. When Berlin and Gershwin first met, Berlin was famous, but Gershwin was a struggling young composer working for $35 a week in Tin Pan Alley. Berlin, impressed by Gershwin's ability, offered Gershwin a job as his musical secretary, at almost three times the salary he was then getting. But don't take the job, Berlin advised. If you do, you may develop into a second-rate Berlin. But if you insist on being yourself, someday you'll be a first-rate Gershwin. Gershwin heeded that warning and slowly transformed himself into one of the significant American composers of his generation. Charlie Chaplin, Will Rogers, Mary Margaret McBride, Gene Autry, millions of others had to learn the lesson I'm trying to hammer home in this chapter. They had to learn the hard way, just as I did. When Charlie Chaplin first started making films, the director of the picture insisted on Chaplin's imitating a popular German comedian of that day. 
Charlie Chaplin got nowhere until he acted himself. Bob Hope had a similar experience. He spent years in the singing and dancing act and got nowhere until he began to wisecrack and be himself. Will Rogers twirled a rope in vaudeville for years without saying a word. He got nowhere until he discovered his unique gift for humor and began to talk as he twirled his rope. When Mary Margaret McBride first went on the air, she tried to be an Irish comedian and failed. When she tried to be just what she was, a plain country girl from Missouri, she became one of the most popular radio stars in New York. When Gene Autry tried to get rid of his Texas accent and dressed like city boys and claimed he was from New York, people merely laughed behind his back. But when he started twanging his banjo and singing cowboy ballads, Gene Autry started out on a career that made him the world's most popular cowboy, both in pictures and on the radio. You are something new in this world. Be glad of it. Make the most of what nature gave you. In the last analysis, all art is autobiographical. You can sing only what you are. You can paint only what you are. You must be what your experiences, your environment, and your heredity have made you. For better or for worse, you must cultivate your own little garden. For better or for worse, you must play your own little instrument in the orchestra of life. As Emerson said in his essay on self-reliance, there is a time in every man's education when he arrives at the conviction that envy is ignorance, that imitation is suicide, that he must take himself, for better, for worse, as his portion, that though the wide universe is full of good, no kernel of nourishing corn can come to him but which his toil bestowed on that plot of ground which is given him to till. The power which resides in him is new in nature, and none but he knows what that is which he can do, nor does he know until he has tried. And that's the way Emerson said it. But here's the way a poet, the late Douglas Malick, said it. If you can't be a pine on the top of the hill, be a scrub in the valley, but be the best little scrub by the side of the hill, be a bush if you can't be a tree. If you can't be a bush, be a bit of the grass, and some highway happier make. If you can't be a musky, then just be a bass, but the liveliest bass in the lake. We can't all be captains, we've got to be crew. There's something for all of us here. There's big work to do, and there's lesser to do, and the task we must do is the near. If you can't be a highway, then just be a trail. If you can't be the sun, be a star. It isn't by size that you win or you fail. Be the best of whatever you are. To cultivate a mental attitude that will bring us peace and freedom from worry, here's Rule 5. Let's not imitate others. Let's find ourselves and be ourselves. Chapter 17. If you have a lemon, make a lemonade. While writing this book, I dropped in one day at the University of Chicago and asked the Chancellor, Robert Maynard Hutchins, how he kept from worrying. He replied, I've always tried to follow a bit of advice given to me by the late Julius Rosenwald, president of Sears Roebuck and Company. When you have a lemon, make a lemonade. That is what a great educator does. But the fool does the exact opposite. If he finds that life has handed him a lemon, he gives up and says, I'm beaten. It is fate. I haven't got a chance. Then he proceeds to rail against the world and indulge in an orgy of self-pity. But when the wise man is handed a lemon, he says, What lesson can I learn from this misfortune? How can I improve my situation? How can I turn this lemon into a lemonade? After spending a lifetime studying people and their hidden reserves of power, the great psychologist Alfred Adler declared that one of the wonder-filled characteristics of human beings is their power to turn a minus into a plus. Here's an interesting and stimulating story of a woman I know who did just that. Her name is Thelma Thompson. During the war, she said, as she told me of her experience, during the war, my husband was stationed at an army training camp near the Mojave Desert in California. I went to live there in order to be near him. 
I hated the place. I loathed it. I had never before been so miserable. My husband was ordered out on maneuvers in the Mojave Desert, and I was left in a tiny shack alone. The heat was unbearable, 125 degrees in the shade of a cactus. Not a soul to talk to. The wind blew incessantly, and all the food I ate and the very air I breathed were filled with sand, sand, sand. I was so utterly wretched, so sorry for myself, that I wrote to my parents. I told them I was giving up and coming back home. I said I couldn't stand it one minute longer. I would rather be in jail. My father answered my letter with just two lines, two lines that will always sing in my memory, two lines that completely altered my life. Two men looked out from prison bars. One saw the mud, the other saw the stars. I read those two lines over and over. I was ashamed of myself. I made up my mind I would find out what was good in my present situation. I would look for the stars. I made friends with the natives, and their reaction amazed me. When I showed interest in their weaving and pottery, they gave me presents of their favorite pieces, which they'd refused to sell to tourists. I studied the fascinating forms of the cactus and the yuccas and the Joshua trees. I learned about prairie dogs, watched for the desert sunsets, and hunted for seashells that had been left there millions of years ago when the sands of the desert had been an ocean floor. What brought about this astonishing change in me? The Mojave Desert hadn't changed, but I had. I had changed my attitude of mind, and by doing so, I transformed a wretched experience into the most exciting adventure of my life. I was stimulated and excited by this new world that I'd discovered. I was so excited, I wrote a book about it, a novel that was published under the title Bright Ramparts. I had looked out of my self-created prison and found the stars. Thelma Thompson, you discovered an old truth that the Greeks taught 500 years before Christ was born. The best things are the most difficult. Harry Emerson Fosdick repeated it again in the 20th century. Happiness is not mostly pleasure, it is mostly victory. Yes, the victory that comes from a sense of achievement, of triumph, of turning our lemons into lemonades. I once visited a happy farmer down in Florida who turned even a poison lemon into lemonade. When he first got his farm, he was discouraged. The land was so wretched he could neither grow fruit nor raise pigs. Nothing thrived there but scrub oaks and rattlesnakes. Then he got his idea. He would turn his liability into an asset. He would make the most of these rattlesnakes. To everyone's amazement, he started canning rattlesnake meat. When I stopped to visit him a few years ago, I found that tourists were pouring in to see his rattlesnake farm at the rate of 20,000 a year. His business was thriving. I saw poison from the fangs of his rattlers being shipped to laboratories to make anti-venom toxin. I saw rattlesnake skins being sold at fancy prices to make women's shoes and handbags. I saw canned rattlesnake meat being shipped to customers all over the world. I bought a picture postcard of the place and mailed it at the local post office of the village, which had been rechristened Rattlesnake, Florida, in honor of a man who had turned a poison lemon into a sweet lemonade. As I've traveled up and down and back and forth across this nation time after time, it has been my privilege to meet dozens of men and women who have demonstrated their power to turn a minus into a plus. The late William Bolitho, author of Twelve Against the Gods, put it like this. The most important thing in life is not to capitalize on your gains. Any fool can do that. The really important thing is to profit from your losses. That requires intelligence, and it makes the difference between a man of sense and a fool. Bolitho uttered those words after he had lost a leg in a railway accident. But I know a man who lost both legs and turned his minus into a plus. His name is Ben Fortson. I met him in a hotel elevator in Atlanta, Georgia. As I stepped into the elevator, I noticed this cheerful-looking man who had both legs missing sitting in a wheelchair in a corner of the elevator. When the elevator stopped at his floor, he asked me pleasantly if I would step to one corner so he could manage his chair better. 
So sorry, he said, to inconvenience you, and a deep, heartwarming smile lighted his face as he said it. When I left the elevator and went to my room, I could think of nothing but this cheerful cripple, so I hunted him up and asked him to tell me his story. It happened in 1929, he told me with a smile. I'd gone out to cut a load of hickory poles to stake the beans in my garden. I had loaded the poles onto my Ford and started back home. Suddenly, one pole slipped under the car and jammed the steering apparatus at the very moment I was making a sharp turn. The car shot over an embankment and hurled me against a tree. My spine was hurt. My legs were paralyzed. I was twenty-four when that happened, and I've never taken a step since. Twenty-four years old and sentenced to a wheelchair for the rest of his life. I asked him how he managed to take it so courageously, and he said, I didn't. He said he raged and rebelled, he fumed about his fate, but as the years dragged on, he found that his rebellion wasn't getting him anything except bitterness. I finally realized, he said, that other people were kind and courteous to me, so the least I could do was be kind and courteous to them. I asked if he still felt, after all these years, that his accident had been a terrible misfortune, and he promptly said no. He said, I am almost glad now that it happened. He told me that after he got over the shock and resentment, he began to live in a different world. He began to read and developed a love for good literature. In fourteen years, he said, he had read at least fourteen hundred books, and those books had opened up new horizons for him and made his life richer than he had ever thought possible. He began to listen to good music, and he's now thrilled by great symphonies that would have bored him before. But the biggest change was that he had time to think. For the first time in my life, he said, I was able to look at the world and get a real sense of values. I began to realize that most of the things I'd been striving for before weren't worthwhile at all. As a result of his reading, he became interested in politics, studied public questions, made speeches from his wheelchair. He got to know people, and people got to know him, and still in his wheelchair, he got to be Secretary of State for the state of Georgia. While conducting adult education classes in New York City, I've discovered that one of the major regrets of many adults is that they never went to college. They seem to think that not having a college education is a great handicap. I know that this isn't necessarily true, because I've known thousands of successful men who never went beyond high school. So I often tell these students the story of a man I knew who had never finished even grade school. He was brought up in blighting poverty. When his father died, his father's friends had to chip in to pay for the coffin in which he was buried. After his father's death, his mother worked in an umbrella factory ten hours a day and then brought piecework home and worked until eleven o'clock at night. The boy, brought up in these circumstances, went in for amateur dramatics, put on by a club in his church. He got such a thrill out of acting that he decided to take up public speaking, and this led him into politics. By the time he reached thirty, he was elected to the New York State Legislature. But he was woefully unprepared for such a responsibility. In fact, he told me that, frankly, he didn't know what it was all about. He studied the long, complicated bills that he was supposed to vote on, but as far as he was concerned, those bills might as well have been written in the language of the Choctaw Indians. He was worried and bewildered when he was made a member of the Committee on Forests before he'd ever set foot in a forest. He was worried and bewildered when he was made a member of the State Banking Commission before he had ever had a bank account. He himself told me that he was so discouraged that he would have resigned from the legislature if he hadn't been ashamed to admit defeat to his mother. In despair, he decided to study sixteen hours a day and turn his lemon of ignorance into a lemonade of knowledge. By doing that, he transformed himself from a local politician into a national figure and made himself so outstanding that the New York Times called him the best-loved citizen of New York. I'm talking about Al Smith. Ten years after Al Smith set out on his program of political self-education, he was the greatest living authority on the government of New York State. He was elected governor of New York for four terms, at that time a record never attained by any other man. In 1928, he was the Democratic candidate for president. 
six great universities, including Columbia and Harvard, conferred honorary degrees upon this man who had never gone beyond grade school. Al Smith himself told me that none of these things would ever have come to pass if he hadn't worked hard sixteen hours a day to turn his minus into a plus. Nietzsche's formula for the superior man was not only to bear up under necessity, but to live it. The more I've studied the careers of men of achievement, the more deeply I've been convinced that surprisingly large numbers of them succeeded because they started out with handicaps that spurred them on to greater endeavor and greater rewards. As William James said, our very infirmities help us unexpectedly. Yes, it's highly probable that Milton wrote better poetry because he was blind, and that Beethoven composed better music because he was deaf. Helen Keller's brilliant career was inspired and made possible because of her blindness and deafness. If Tchaikovsky had not been frustrated and driven almost to suicide by his tragic marriage, if his own life had not been pathetic, he probably would never have been able to compose his immortal symphony pathétique. If Dostoevsky and Tolstoy had not led tortured lives, they would probably never have been able to write their immortal novels. If I had not been so great an invalid, wrote the man who changed the scientific concept of life on earth, if I had not been so great an invalid, I should not have done so much work as I have accomplished. And that was Charles Darwin's confession that his infirmities had helped him unexpectedly. The same day that Darwin was born in England, another baby was born in a log cabin in the forests of Kentucky, and he too was helped by his infirmities. His name was Lincoln, Abraham Lincoln. If he had been reared in an aristocratic family and had had a law degree from Harvard and a happy married life, he would probably never have found in the depths of his heart the haunting words that he immortalized at Gettysburg, nor the sacred poem that he spoke at his second inauguration, the most beautiful and noble phrases ever uttered by a ruler of men, with malice toward none, with charity for all. Harry Emerson Fosdick says in his book, The Power to See It Through, There is a Scandinavian saying which some of us might well take as a rallying cry for our lives. The North Wind Made the Vikings. Wherever did we get the idea that secure and pleasant living, the absence of difficulty and the comfort of ease, ever of themselves made people either good or happy? Upon the contrary, People who pity themselves go on pitying themselves, even when they are laid softly on a cushion. But always in history, character and happiness have come to people in all sorts of circumstances, good, bad, and indifferent, when they shouldered their personal responsibility. So repeatedly, the north wind has made the Vikings. Suppose we're so discouraged that we feel there is no hope of our ever being able to turn our lemons into lemonade. Then here are two reasons why we ought to try, anyway. Two reasons why we have everything to gain and nothing to lose. Reason one, we may succeed. Reason two, even if we don't succeed, the mere attempt to turn our minus into a plus will cause us to look forward instead of backward. It will replace negative thoughts with positive thoughts. It will release creative energy and spur us to get so busy that we won't have either the time or the inclination to mourn over what is past and forever gone. Once when Ole Bull, the world-famous violinist, was giving a concert in Paris, the A-string on his violin suddenly snapped. But Ole Bull simply finished the melody on three strings. That is life, says Harry Emerson Fosdick, to have your A-string snap and finish on three strings. That is not only life, it is more than life, it is life triumphant. If I had the power to do so, I would have these words of William Bolitho carved in eternal bronze and hung in every schoolhouse in the land. The most important thing in life is not to capitalize on your gains. Any fool can do that. The really important thing is to profit from your losses. That requires intelligence, and it makes the difference between a man of sense and a fool.
So to cultivate a mental attitude that will bring us peace and happiness, let's do something about Rule 6. When fate hands us a lemon, let's try to make a lemonade. Chapter 18. How to Cure Depression in 14 Days When I started writing this book, I offered a $200 prize for the most helpful and inspiring true story on how I conquered worry. The three judges for this contest were Eddie Rickenbacker, President, Eastern Airlines, Dr. Stuart W. McClelland, President, Lincoln Memorial University, H.B. Kaltenborn, Radio News Analyst. However, we received two stories so superb that the judges found it impossible to choose between them. So we divided the prize. Here's one of the stories that tied for first prize. The story of C.R. Burton, who worked for Whizzer Motor Sales of Springfield, Missouri. I lost my mother when I was nine years old and my father when I was twelve, Mr. Burton wrote me. My father was killed, but my mother simply walked out of the house one day, nineteen years ago, and I've never seen her since. Neither have I ever seen my two little sisters that she took with her. She never even wrote me a letter until after she'd been gone seven years. My father was killed in an accident three years after mother left. He and a partner had bought a cafe in a small Missouri town, and while father was away on a business trip, his partner sold the cafe for cash and skipped out. A friend wired father to hurry back home, and in his hurry, father was killed in a car accident at Salinas, Kansas. Two of my father's sisters, who were poor and old and sick, took three of the children into their homes, and nobody wanted me and my little brother. We were left at the mercy of the town. We were haunted by the fear of being called orphans and treated as orphans. Our fears soon materialized, too. I lived for a little while with a poor family in town, but times were hard, and the head of the family lost his job, so they couldn't afford to feed me any longer. Then Mr. and Mrs. Lofton took me to live with them on their farm eleven miles from town. Mr. Lofton was seventy years old and sick in bed with shingles. He told me I could stay there as long as I didn't lie, didn't steal, and did as I was told. Those three orders became my Bible. I lived by them strictly. I started to school, but the first week found me at home bawling like a baby. The other children picked on me and poked fun at my big nose and said I was dumb and called me an orphan brat. I was hurt so badly that I wanted to fight them, but Mr. Lofton, the farmer who'd taken me in, said to me, Always remember that it takes a bigger man to walk away from a fight than it does to stay and fight. I didn't fight until one day a kid picked up some chicken manure from the schoolhouse yard and threw it in my face. I beat the hell out of him and made a couple of friends. They said he had it coming to him. I was proud of a new cap that Mrs. Lofton had bought me. One day one of the big girls jerked it off my head and filled it with water and ruined it. She said she filled it with water so the water would wet my thick skull and keep my popcorn brains from popping. I never cried at school, but I used to bawl it out at home. Then one day Mrs. Lofton gave me some advice that did away with all troubles and worries and turned my enemies into friends. She said, Ralph, they won't tease you and call you an orphan brat any more if you'll get interested in them and see how much you can do for them. I took her advice. I studied hard, and though I soon headed the class, I was never envied because I went out of my way to help them. I helped several of the boys write their themes and essays. I wrote complete debates for some of the boys. One lad was ashamed to let his folks know that I was helping him, so he used to tell his mother he was going possum hunting. And he'd come up to Mr. Lofton's and tie his dogs up in the barn while I helped him with his lessons. I wrote book reviews for one lad, and I spent several evenings helping one of the girls on her math. Death struck our neighborhood. Two elderly farmers died, and one woman was deserted by her husband. I was the only male in four families. I helped these widows for two years. On my way to and from school, I stopped at their farms, cut wood for them, milked their cows, and fed and watered their stock. I was now blessed instead of cursed. I was accepted as a friend by everyone. They showed me their real feelings when I returned home from the Navy. More than 200 farmers came to see me the first day I was home. Some of them drove as far as 80 miles, and their concern for me was really sincere. 
Because I've been busy and happy trying to help other people, I have few worries, and I haven't been called an orphan brat now for thirteen years. Hooray for C.R. Burton. He knows how to win friends, and he also knows how to conquer worry and enjoy life. So did the late Dr. Frank Loop of Seattle, Washington. He was an invalid for twenty-three years, arthritis. Yet Stuart Whithouse of the Seattle Star wrote me, saying, I interviewed Dr. Loop many times, and I have never known a man more unselfish or a man who got more out of life. How did this bedridden invalid get so much out of life? I'll give you two guesses. Did he do it by complaining and criticizing? No. Uh, by wallowing in self-pity and demanding that he be the center of attention and everyone cater to him? No. Still wrong. He did it by adopting as his slogan the motto of the Prince of Wales, Eek Dien, I Serve. He accumulated the names and addresses of other invalids and cheered both them and himself by writing happy, encouraging letters. In fact, he organized a letter-writing club for invalids and got them writing letters to one another. Finally, he formed a national organization called the Shut-In Society. As he lay in bed, he wrote an average of 1,400 letters a year and brought joy to thousands of invalids by getting radios and books for shut-ins. What was the chief difference between Dr. Loop and a lot of other people? Just this. Dr. Loop had the inner glow of a man with a purpose, a mission. He had the joy of knowing that he was being used by an idea far nobler and more significant than himself, instead of being, as Shaw put it, a self-centered little clod of ailments and grievances, complaining that the world would not devote itself to making him happy. Here's the most astonishing statement that I ever read from the pen of a great psychiatrist. This statement was made by Alfred Adler. He used to say to his melancholia patients, You can be cured in fourteen days if you follow this prescription. Try to think every day how you can please someone. That statement sounds so incredible that I feel I ought to try to explain it by quoting a couple of pages from Dr. Adler's splendid book, What Life Should Mean to You. Melancholia is like a long-continued rage and reproach against others, though for the purpose of gaining care, sympathy, and support, the patient seems only to be dejected about his own guilt. A melancholiac's first memory is generally something like this. I can remember I wanted to lie on the couch, but my brother was lying there. I cried so much that he had to leave. Melancholiacs are often inclined to revenge themselves by committing suicide, and the doctor's first care is to avoid giving them an excuse for suicide. I myself try to relieve the whole tension by proposing to them as the first rule of treatment, never do anything you don't like. This seems to be very modest, but I believe that it goes right to the root of the whole trouble. If a melancholiac is able to do anything he wants, whom can he accuse? What has he got to revenge himself for? If you want to go to the theater, I tell him, or go on a holiday, do it. If you find on the way that you don't want to, stop it. It's the best situation anyone could be in. It gives a satisfaction to his striving for superiority. He is like God and can do what he pleases. On the other hand, it does not fit very easily into his style of life. He wants to dominate and accuse others, and if they agree with him, there is no way of dominating them. This rule is a great relief, and I have never had a suicide among my patients. Generally, the patient replies, But there is nothing I like doing. I have prepared for this answer because I have heard it so often. Then refrain from doing anything you dislike, I say. Sometimes, however, he will reply, I should like to stay in bed all day. I know that if I allow it, he will no longer want to do it. I know that if I hinder him, he will start a war. I always agree. This is one rule. Another attacks their style of life still more directly. I tell them, you can be cured in fourteen days if you follow this prescription. Try to think every day how you can please someone. See what this means to them. They are occupied with the thought, how can I worry someone? Their answers are very interesting. Some say, oh, this will be very easy for me. I have done it all my life. They have never done it. I ask them to think it over. They do not think it over. 
I tell them you can make use of all the time you spend when you're unable to go to sleep by thinking how you can please someone, and it will be a big step forward in your health. When I see them the next day, I ask them, Did you think over what I suggested? They answer, Last night I went to sleep as soon as I got into bed. All this must be done, of course, in a modest, friendly manner, without a hint of superiority. Others will answer, I could never do it. I was so worried. I tell them, don't stop worrying, but at the same time you can think now and then of others. I want to direct their interest always toward their fellows. Many say, why should I please others? Others do not try to please me. You must think of your health, I answer. The others will suffer later on. It's extremely rare that I have found a patient who said, I have thought over what you suggested. All my efforts are devoted toward increasing the social interest of the patient. I know that the real reason for his malady is his lack of cooperation, and I want him to see it too. As soon as he can connect himself with his fellow men on an equal and cooperative footing, he is cured. The most important task imposed by religion has always been love thy neighbor. It is the individual who is not interested in his fellow man who has the greatest difficulties in life and provides the greatest injury to others. It is from among such individuals that all human failures spring. All that we demand of a human being, and the highest praise we can give him, is that he should be a good fellow worker, a friend to all other men, and a true partner in love and marriage. Dr. Adler urges us to do a good deed every day. And what is a good deed? A good deed, said the prophet Muhammad, is one that brings a smile of joy to the face of another. Why will doing a good deed every day produce such astounding effects on the doer? Because trying to please others will cause us to stop thinking of ourselves, the very thing that produces worry and fear and melancholia. Mrs. William T. Moon, who operated the Moon Secretarial School in New York, didn't have to spend two weeks thinking how she could please someone in order to banish her melancholy. She went Alfred Adler one better. Oh, no, she did Adler thirteen better. She banished her melancholy, not in fourteen days, but in one day, by thinking how she could please a couple of orphans. It happened like this. In December, five years ago, said Mrs. Moon, I was engulfed in a feeling of sorrow and self-pity. After several years of happy married life, I had lost my husband. As the Christmas holidays approached, my sadness deepened. I'd never spent a Christmas alone in all my life, and I dreaded to see this Christmas come. Friends had invited me to spend Christmas with them, but I did not feel up to any gaiety. I knew I would be a wet blanket at any party, so I refused their kind invitations. As Christmas Eve approached, I was more and more overwhelmed with self-pity. True, I should have been thankful for many things, as all of us have many things for which to be thankful. The day before Christmas, I left my office at three o'clock in the afternoon and started walking aimlessly up Fifth Avenue, hoping that I might banish my self-pity and melancholy. The avenue was jammed with gay and happy crowds, scenes that brought back memories of happy years that were gone. I just couldn't bear the thought of going home to a lonely, empty apartment. I was bewildered. I didn't know what to do. I couldn't keep the tears back. After walking aimlessly for an hour or so, I found myself in front of a bus terminal. I remembered that my husband and I had often boarded an unknown bus for adventure, so I boarded the first bus I found at the station. After crossing the Hudson River and riding for some time, I heard the bus conductor say, Last stop, lady. I got off. I didn't even know the name of the town. It was a quiet, peaceful little place. While waiting for the next bus home, I started walking up a residential street. As I passed a church, I heard the beautiful strains of Silent Night. I went in. The church was empty, except for the organist. I sat down, unnoticed, in one of the pews. The lights from the gaily decorated Christmas tree made the decoration seem like myriads of stars dancing in the moonbeams. The long-drawn cadences of the music and the fact that I had forgotten to eat since morning made me drowsy. I was weary and heavy laden, so I drifted off to sleep. When I awoke, I didn't know where I was. I was terrified. I saw in front of me two small children who had apparently come in to see the Christmas tree. One, a little girl, was pointing at me, saying, 
I wonder if Santa Claus brought her. These children were also frightened when I awoke. I told them that I wouldn't hurt them. They were poorly dressed. I asked them where their mother and daddy were. Oh, we ain't got no mother and daddy, they said. Here were two little orphans, much worse off than I had ever been. They made me feel ashamed of my sorrow and self-pity. I showed them the Christmas tree, and then took them to a drugstore, and we had some refreshments, and I bought them some candy and a few presents. My loneliness vanished as if by magic. These two orphans gave me the only real happiness and self-forgetfulness that I had had in months. As I chatted with them, I realized how lucky I had been. I thanked God that all my Christmases as a child had been bright with parental love and tenderness. Those two little orphans did far more for me than I did for them. That experience showed me again the necessity of making other people happy in order to be happy ourselves. I found that happiness is contagious. By giving, we receive. By helping someone and giving out love, I had conquered worry and sorrow and self-pity and felt like a new person. And I was a new person, not only then, but in the years that followed. I could fill a book with stories of people who forgot themselves into health and happiness. For example, let's take the case of Margaret Taylor Yates, one of the most popular women in the United States Navy. Now, Mrs. Yates is a writer of novels, but none of her mystery stories is half so interesting as the true story of what happened to her that fateful morning when the Japanese struck our fleet at Pearl Harbor. Mrs. Yates had been an invalid for more than a year, a bad heart. She spent 22 out of every 24 hours in bed. The longest journey that she undertook was a walk into the garden to take a sunbath. Even then, she had to lean on the maid's arm as she walked. She herself told me that in those days she expected to be an invalid for the rest of her life. I would never have really lived again, she told me, if the Japanese had not struck Pearl Harbor and jarred me out of my complacency. When this happened, Mrs. Yates said, as she told her story, everything was chaos and confusion. One bomb struck so near my home the concussion threw me out of bed. Army trucks rushed out to Hickam Field, Schofield Barracks, and Kaneohe Bay Air Station to bring Army and Navy wives and children to the public schools. There the Red Cross telephoned those who had extra rooms to take them in. The Red Cross workers knew that I had a telephone beside my bed, so they asked me to be a clearinghouse of information. So I kept track of where Army and Navy wives and children were being housed, and all Navy and Army men were instructed by the Red Cross to telephone me to find out where their families were. I soon discovered that my husband, Commander Robert Rolla Yates, was safe. I tried to cheer up the wives who did not know whether their husbands had been killed, I tried to give consolation to the widows whose husbands had been killed, and there were many. 2,117 officers and enlisted men in the Navy and Marine Corps were killed, and 960 were reported missing. At first, I answered these phone calls while lying in bed. Then I answered them sitting up in bed. Finally, I got so busy, so excited, that I forgot all about my weakness and got out of bed and sat by a table. By helping others who were much worse off than I was, I forgot all about myself, and I have never gone back to bed again except for my regular eight hours of sleep each night. I realize now that if the Japanese had not struck at Pearl Harbor, I would probably have remained a semi-invalid all my life. I was comfortable in bed, I was constantly waited on, and I now realize that I was unconsciously losing my will to rehabilitate myself. The attack on Pearl Harbor was one of the greatest tragedies in American history. But as far as I was concerned, it was one of the best things that ever happened to me. That terrible crisis gave me strength that I never dreamed I possessed. It took my attention off myself and focused it on others. It gave me something big and vital and important to live for. I no longer had time to think about myself or care about myself. A third of the people who rushed to psychiatrists for help could probably cure themselves if they could only do as Margaret Yates did, get interested in helping others. My idea? No, that's approximately what Carl Jung said, and he ought to know if anybody does. He said, about one-third of my patients are suffering from no clinically definable neurosis, but from the senselessness and emptiness of their lives.
And to put it another way, they're trying to thumb a ride through life, and the parade passes them by. So they rush to a psychiatrist with their petty, senseless, useless lives. Having missed the boat, they stand on the wharf, blaming everyone except themselves, and demanding that the world cater to their self-centered desires. Well, you may be saying to yourself now, well, I'm not impressed by these stories. I myself could get interested in a couple of orphans I met on Christmas Eve, and if I'd been at Pearl Harbor, I would gladly have done what Margaret Taylor Yates did. But with me, things are different. I live an ordinary, humdrum life. I work at a dull job eight hours a day. Nothing dramatic ever happens to me. How can I get interested in helping others? And why should I? What is there in it for me? A fair question. I'll try to answer it. However humdrum your existence may be, you surely meet some people every day of your life. And what do you do about them? Do you merely stare through them, or do you try to find out what it is that makes them tick? How about the postman, for example? He travels hundreds of miles every year delivering your mail, but have you ever taken the trouble to find out where he lives, or ask to see a snapshot of his wife and his kids? Did you ever ask him if he gets tired, or if he ever gets bored? What about the grocery boy, the newspaper vendor, the chap at the corner who polishes your shoes? These people are human, bursting with troubles and dreams and private ambitions. They're also bursting for the chance to share them with someone. But do you ever let them? Do you ever show an eager, honest interest in them or their lives? That's the sort of thing I mean. You don't have to become a Florence Nightingale or a social reformer to help improve the world, your own private world. You can start tomorrow morning with the people you meet. What's in it for you? Much greater happiness, greater satisfaction and pride in yourself. Aristotle called this kind of attitude enlightened selfishness. Zoroaster said, Doing good for others is not a duty, it is a joy, for it increases your own health and happiness. And Benjamin Franklin summed it up very simply. When you are good to others, said Franklin, you are best to yourself. No discovery of modern psychology, wrote Henry C. Link, director of the Psychological Service Center in New York, is in my opinion so important as its scientific proof of the necessity of self-sacrifice or discipline to self-realization and happiness. Thinking of others will not only keep you from worrying about yourself, it will also help you make a lot of friends and have a lot of fun. How? Well, I once asked Professor William Lyon Phelps of Yale how he did it, and here's what he said. I never go into a hotel or a barber shop or a store without saying something agreeable to everyone I meet. I try to say something that treats them as an individual, not merely a cog in a machine. I sometimes compliment the girl who waits on me in the store by telling her how beautiful her eyes are or her hair. I'll ask a barber if he doesn't get tired standing on his feet all day. I'll ask him how he came to take up barbering, how long he's been at it, how many heads of hair he's cut. I'll help him figure it out. I find that taking an interest in people makes them beam with pleasure. I frequently shake hands with a red cap who's carried my grip. It gives him a new lift and freshens him up for the whole day. One extremely hot summer day, I went to a dining car of the New Haven Railway to have lunch. The crowded car was almost like a furnace, and the service was slow. When the steward finally got around to handing me the menu, I said, The boys back there cooking in that hot kitchen certainly must be suffering today. The steward began to curse. His tones were bitter. 
At first I thought he was angry. Good God Almighty, he exclaimed. People come in here and complain about the food. They kick about the slow service and growl about the heat and the prices. I've listened to their criticism for 19 years, and you're the first person, the only person who's ever expressed any sympathy for the cooks back there in that boiling kitchen. I wish to God we had more passengers like you. The steward was astounded because I had thought of the cooks as human beings, and not merely as a cog in the organization of a great railway. What people want, continued Professor Phelps, is a little attention as human beings. When I meet a man on the street with a beautiful dog, I always comment on the dog's beauty. As I walk on and glance back over my shoulder, I frequently see the man petting and admiring the dog. My appreciation has renewed his appreciation. One time in England, I met a shepherd and expressed my sincere admiration for his big, intelligent sheepdog. I asked him to tell me how he trained the dog. As I walked away, I glanced back over my shoulder and saw the dog standing with his paws on the shepherd's shoulders, and the shepherd was petting him. By taking a little interest in the shepherd and his dog, I made the shepherd happy. I made the dog happy, and I made myself happy. Can you imagine a man who goes around shaking hands with porters and expressing sympathy for the cooks in the hot kitchen and telling people how much he admires their dogs? Can you imagine a man like that being sour and worried and needing the services of a psychiatrist? You can't, can you? No, of course not. A Chinese proverb puts it this way. A bit of fragrance always clings to the hand that gives you roses. You didn't have to tell that to Billy Phelps of Yale. He knew it. He lived it. If you're a man, skip this paragraph. It won't interest you. It tells how a worried, unhappy girl got several men to propose to her. The girl who did that is a grandmother now. A few years ago, I spent the night in her and her husband's home. I'd been giving a lecture in her town, and the next morning she drove me about 50 miles to catch a train on the main line of the New York Central. We got to talking about winning friends, and she said, Mr. Carnegie, I'm going to tell you something that I've never confessed to anyone before, not even to my husband. She told me that she'd been reared in a social register family in Philadelphia. The tragedy of my girlhood and young womanhood, she said, was our poverty. We could never entertain in the way the other girls in my social set entertained. My clothes were never of the best quality. I outgrew them, and they didn't fit, and they were often out of style. I was so humiliated, so ashamed, that I often cried myself to sleep. Finally, in sheer desperation, I hit upon the idea of always asking my partner at dinner parties to tell me about his experiences, his ideas, his plans for the future. I didn't ask these questions because I was especially interested in the answers. I did it solely to keep my partner from looking at my poor clothes. But a strange thing happened. As I listened to these young men talk and learned more about them, I really became interested in listening to what they had to say. I became so interested that I myself sometimes forgot about my clothes. But the astounding thing to me was this. Since I was a good listener and encouraged those boys to talk about themselves, I gave them happiness, and I gradually became the most popular girl in our social group, and three of these men proposed marriage to me. Now, some people who read this chapter are going to say, all this talk about getting interested in others is a lot of damn nonsense, sheer religious pap, none of that stuff for me. I'm going to put money in my purse. I'm going to grab all I can get and grab it now, and to hell with the other dumb clucks. Well, if that's your opinion, you're entitled to it. But if you're right, then all the great philosophers and teachers since the beginning of recorded history, Jesus, Confucius, Buddha, Plato, Aristotle, Socrates, St. Francis, were all wrong. But since you may sneer at the teachings of religious leaders, let's turn for advice to a couple of atheists. First, let's take the late A. E. Hausman, professor at Cambridge University and one of the most distinguished scholars of his generation. In 1936, he gave an address at Cambridge University on the name and nature of poetry. In that address, he declared that the greatest truth ever uttered and the most profound moral discovery of all times were these words of Jesus. He that findeth his life shall lose it, and he that loseth his life for my sake shall find it. We have heard preachers say that all our lives, but Hausman was an atheist, a pessimist, a man who contemplated suicide, and yet he felt 
that the man who thought only of himself wouldn't get much out of life. He would be miserable. But the man who forgot himself in service to others would find the joy of living. If you're not impressed by what A. E. Hosman said, let's turn for advice to the most distinguished American atheist of the 20th century, Theodore Dreiser. Dreiser ridiculed all religions as fairy tales and regarded life as a tale told by an idiot full of sound and fury signifying nothing. Yet Dreiser advocated the one great principle that Jesus taught, service to others. If he, man, is expected to extract any joy out of his span, Dreiser said, he must think and plan to make things better not only for himself but for others, since joy for himself depends upon his joy in others and theirs in him. If we're going to make things better for others, as Dreiser advocated, let's be quick about it, time's a-wasting. I shall pass this way but once. Therefore, any good that I can do, or any kindness that I can show, let me do it now. Let me not defer nor neglect it, for I shall not pass this way again. So, if you want to banish worry and cultivate peace and happiness, here's Rule 7. Forget yourself by becoming interested in others. Every day, do a good deed that will put a smile of joy on someone's face. Part 4 in a Nutshell Seven Ways to Cultivate a Mental Attitude That Will Bring You Peace and Happiness Rule 1 Let's fill our minds with thoughts of peace, courage, health, and hope, for our life is what our thoughts make it. Rule 2 Let's never try to get even with our enemies. Because if we do, we will hurt ourselves far more than we hurt them. Let's do as General Eisenhower does. Let's never waste a minute thinking about people we don't like. Rule 3. A. Instead of worrying about ingratitude, let's expect it. Let's remember that Jesus healed ten lepers in one day, and only one thanked him. Why should we expect more gratitude than Jesus got? B. Let's remember that the only way to find happiness is not to expect gratitude, but to give for the joy of giving. C. Let's remember that gratitude is a cultivated trait, so that if we want our children to be grateful, we must train them to be grateful. Rule 4. Count your blessings, not your troubles. Rule 5. Let's not imitate others. Let's find ourselves and be ourselves. For envy is ignorance, and imitation is suicide. Rule 6. When fate hands us a lemon, let's try to make a lemonade. Rule 7. Let's forget our own unhappiness by trying to create a little happiness for others. When you are good to others, you are best to yourself. Part 5. The Perfect Way to Conquer Worry Chapter 19. How My Mother and Father Conquered Worry As I have said, I was born and brought up on a Missouri farm. Like most farmers of that day, my parents had pretty hard scratching. My mother had been a country school teacher. My father had been a farmhand working for $12 a month. Mother made not only my clothes, but also the soap with which we washed our clothes. We rarely had any cash, except once a year when we sold our hogs. We traded our butter and eggs at the grocery store for flour, sugar, coffee. When I was twelve years old, I didn't have as much as fifty cents a year to spend on myself. I can still remember the day we went to a Fourth of July celebration, and Father gave me ten cents to spend as I wished. I felt the wealth of the Indies was mine. I walked a mile to attend a one-room country school. I walked when the snow was deep and the thermometer shivered around 28 degrees below zero. Until I was 14, I never had any rubbers or overshoes. During the long, cold winters, my feet were always wet and cold. As a child, I never dreamed that anyone had dry, warm feet during the winter. My parents slaved 16 hours a day. Yet we constantly were oppressed by debts and harassed by hard luck. 
One of my earliest memories is watching the floodwaters of the One O True River rolling over our corn and hayfields, destroying everything. The floods destroyed our crops six years out of seven, year after year. Our hogs died of cholera, and we burned them. I can close my eyes now and recall the pungent odor of burning hog flesh. One year the floods didn't come. We raised a bumper corn crop, bought feed cattle, fattened them with our own corn. But the floods might just as well have drowned our corn that year, for the price of fat cattle fell on the Chicago market. And after feeding and fattening the cattle, we got only thirty dollars more for them than we'd paid for them. Thirty dollars for a whole year's work. No matter what we did, we lost money. I can still remember the mule colts that my father bought. We fed them for three years, hired men to break them, then shipped them to Memphis, Tennessee, and sold them for less than what we'd paid for them three years previously. After ten years of hard, grueling work, we were not only penniless; we were heavily in debt. Our farm was mortgaged. Try as hard as we might, we couldn't even pay the interest on the mortgage. The bank that held the mortgage abused and insulted my father and threatened to take his farm away from him. Father was forty-seven years old. After more than thirty years of hard work, he had nothing but debts and humiliation. It was more than he could take. He worried. His health broke. He had no desire for food. In spite of the hard physical work he was doing in the field all day, he had to take medicine to give him an appetite. He lost flesh. The doctor told my mother that he'd be dead within six months. Father was so worried that he no longer wanted to live. I've often heard my mother say that when father went to the barn to feed the horses and milk the cows and didn't come back as soon as she expected, she'd go out to the barn, fearing that she would find his body dangling from the end of a rope. One day, as he returned home from Maryville, where the banker had threatened to foreclose the mortgage, he stopped his horses on a bridge crossing the One O Two River, got off the wagon, and stood there for a long time, looking down at the water. Debating with himself whether he should jump in and end it all. Years later, father told me that the only reason he didn't jump was because of my mother's deep, abiding, and joyous belief that if we loved God and kept His commandments, everything would come out all right. My mother was right. Everything did come out all right in the end. Father lived forty-two happy years longer and died in 1941 at the age of eighty-nine. During all those years of struggle and heartache, my mother never worried. She took all her troubles to God in prayer. Every night before we went to bed, mother would read a chapter from the Bible. Frequently, mother or father would read these comforting words of Jesus: "In my Father's house are many mansions. I go to prepare a place for you, that where I am, there ye may be also." Then we all knelt down before our chairs in that lonely Missouri farmhouse and prayed for God's love and protection. When William James was professor of philosophy at Harvard, he said, "Of course, the sovereign cure for worry is religious faith." You don't have to go to Harvard to discover that. My mother found that out on a Missouri farm. Neither floods nor debts nor disaster could suppress her happy, radiant, and victorious spirit. I can still hear her singing as she worked, "Peace, peace, wonderful peace, flowing down from the Father above, sweep over my spirit forever." I pray in fathomless billows of love. My mother wanted me to devote my life to religious work. I thought seriously of becoming a foreign missionary. Then I went away to college, and gradually, as the years passed, a change came over me. I studied biology. Science, philosophy, and comparative religions. I read books on how the Bible was written. I began to question many of its assertions. I began to doubt many of the narrow doctrines taught by the country preachers of that day. I was bewildered. Like Walt Whitman, I felt the curious, abrupt questioning stir within me. I didn't know what to believe. I saw no purpose in life. I stopped praying. I became an agnostic. I believed that all life was planless and aimless. I believed that human beings had no more divine purpose than had the dinosaurs that roamed the earth two hundred million years ago. I felt that some day the human race would perish, just as the dinosaurs had. 
I knew that science taught that the sun was slowly cooling and that when its temperature fell even ten percent, no form of life could exist on earth. I sneered at the idea of a beneficent God who had created man in his own likeness. I believed that the billions upon billions of suns whirling through black, cold, lifeless space had been created by blind force. Maybe they'd never been created at all. Maybe they had existed forever, just as time and space have always existed. Do I profess to know the answers to all those questions now? No. No man has ever been able to explain the mystery of the universe, the mystery of life. We're surrounded by mysteries. The operation of your body is a profound mystery. So is the electricity in your home. So is the flower in the crannied wall. So is the green grass outside your window. Charles F. Kettering, the guiding genius of General Motors Research Laboratories, gave Antioch College $30,000 a year out of his own pocket to try to discover why grass is green. He declared that if we knew how grass is able to transfer sunlight, water, and carbon dioxide into food sugar, we could transform civilization. Even the operation of the engine in your car is a profound mystery. General Motors Research Laboratories have spent years of time and millions of dollars trying to find out how and why a spark in the cylinder sets off an explosion that makes your car run. The fact that we don't understand totally the mysteries of our bodies or, or electricity or a gas engine doesn't keep us from using and enjoying them. The fact that I don't understand the mysteries of prayer and religion no longer keeps me from enjoying the richer, happier life that religion brings. At long last I realize the wisdom of Santayana's words, Man is not made to understand life, but to live it. I have gone back, well, I was about to say I have gone back to religion, but that would not be accurate. I have gone forward to a new concept of religion, I no longer have the faintest interest in the differences in creeds that divide the churches, but I'm tremendously interested in what religion does for me, just as I'm interested in what electricity and good food and water do for me. They help me to lead a richer, fuller, happier life. But religion does far more than that. It brings me spiritual values. It gives me, as William James put it, a new zest for life, more life, a larger, richer, more satisfying life. It gives me faith, hope, and courage. It banishes tensions, anxieties, fears, and worries. It gives purpose to my life and direction. It vastly improves my happiness. It gives me abounding health. It helps me to create for myself an oasis of peace amidst the whirling sands of life. Francis Bacon was right when he said over three hundred years ago, a little philosophy inclineth man's mind to atheism, but depth in philosophy bringeth men's minds about to religion. I can remember the days when people talked about the conflict between science and religion, but no more. The newest of all sciences, psychiatry, is teaching what Jesus taught. Why? Because psychiatrists realize that prayer and a strong religious faith will banish the worries, the anxieties, the strains and fears that cause more than half of all our ills. They know, as one of their leaders, Dr. A. A. Brill, said, anyone who is truly religious does not develop a neurosis. If religion isn't true, then life is meaningless. It is a tragic farce. I interviewed Henry Ford, a few years prior to his death. Before I met him, I had expected him to show the strains of the long years he'd spent in building up and managing one of the world's greatest businesses. So I was surprised to see how calm and well and peaceful he looked at seventy-eight. When I asked him if he ever worried, he replied, No, I believe God is managing affairs and that he doesn't need any advice from me. With God in charge, I believe that everything will work out for the best in the end. So what is there to worry about? Today, even many psychiatrists are becoming modern evangelists. They're not urging us to lead religious lives to avoid hellfires in the next world, but they are urging us to lead religious lives to avoid the hellfires of stomach ulcer, angina pectoris, nervous breakdowns, and insanity. 
As an example of what our psychologists and psychiatrists are teaching, read The Return to Religion by Dr. Henry C. Link. Yes, the Christian religion is an inspiring, health-giving activity. Jesus said, I came that ye might have life and have it more abundantly. Jesus denounced and attacked the dry forms and dead rituals that passed for religion in his day. He was a rebel. He preached a new kind of religion, a religion that threatened to upset the world. This is why he was crucified. He preached that religion should exist for man, not man for religion, that the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. He talked more about fear than he did about sin. The wrong kind of fear is a sin, a sin against your health, a sin against the richer, fuller, happier, courageous life that Jesus advocated. Emerson spoke of himself as a professor of the science of joy. Jesus, too, was a teacher of the science of joy. He commanded his disciples to rejoice and leap for joy. Jesus declared that there were only two important things about religion, loving God with all our heart and our neighbor as ourselves. Any man who does that is religious regardless of whether he knows it. My father-in-law, Henry Price of Tulsa, Oklahoma, is a good example. He tries to live by the golden rule, and he is incapable of doing anything mean, selfish, or dishonest. However, he doesn't attend church and regards himself as an agnostic. Nonsense. What makes a man a Christian? I'll let John Bailey answer that. He was a distinguished professor who taught theology at the University of Edinburgh. He said, What makes a man a Christian is neither his intellectual acceptance of certain ideas, nor his conformity to a certain rule, but his possession of a certain spirit, and his participation in a certain life. If that makes a man a Christian, then Henry Price is a noble one. William James, the father of modern psychology, wrote to his friend Professor Thomas Davidson, saying that as the years went by, he found himself less and less able to get along without God. Earlier in this book, I mentioned that when the judges tried to pick the best story on worry sent in by my students, they had so much difficulty in choosing between two outstanding stories that the prize money was split. Now here's the second story, the tied for first prize, the unforgettable experience of a woman who had to find out the hard way that she couldn't get along without God. I'm calling this woman Mary Cushman, although that's not her actual name. She has children and grandchildren who might be embarrassed to see her story in print, so I agreed to disguise her identity. However, the woman herself is real, very real. Here's how her story goes. During the Depression, she said, my husband's average salary was $18 a week. Many times we didn't even have that because he didn't get paid when he was ill, and that was often. He had a series of minor accidents. He also had mumps, scarlet fever, and repeated attacks of flu. We lost the little house that we'd built with our own hands. We owed $50 at the grocery store and had five children to feed. I took in washing and ironing from the neighbors and bought second-hand clothes from the Salvation Army store and made them over for my children to wear. I made myself ill with worry. One day... The grocer, to whom we owed fifty dollars, accused my eleven-year-old boy of stealing a couple of pencils. My son wept as he told me about it. I knew he was honest and sensitive, and I knew that he'd been disgraced and humiliated in front of other people. That was the straw that broke my back. I thought of all the misery we had endured, and I couldn't see any hope for the future. I must have become temporarily insane with worry. For I shut off my washing machine, took my little five-year-old daughter up to the bedroom, and plugged up the windows and cracks with paper and rags. My little girl said to me, Mommy, what are you doing? And I answered, There's a little draft in here. Then I turned on the gas heater we had in the bedroom and didn't light it. As I lay down on the bed with my daughter beside me, she said, Mommy, this is funny. We just got up a little while ago. But I said, Never mind. We'll take a little nap. And I closed my eyes, listening to the gas escape from the heater. I shall never forget the smell of that gas. And suddenly, I thought I heard music. I listened. I'd forgotten to turn the radio off in the kitchen. 
It didn't matter now, but the music kept on, and presently I heard someone singing an old hymn. What a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pains we bear. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. As I listened to that hymn, I realized I'd made a tragic mistake. I'd tried to fight all my terrible battles alone. I'd not taken everything to God in prayer. I jumped up, turned off the gas, opened the door, and raised the windows. I wept and prayed all the rest of that day. Only I didn't pray for help. Instead, I poured out my soul in thanksgiving to God for all the blessings He had given me. Five splendid children, all of them healthy and fine, strong in body and mind. I promised God that never again would I prove so ungrateful, and I have kept that promise. Even after we lost our home and had to move into a little country schoolhouse that we rented for five dollars a month, I thanked God for that schoolhouse. I thanked Him for the fact that at least I had a roof to keep us warm and dry. I thanked God honestly that things were not worse, and I believe that He heard me. For in time things improved, no, not overnight, but as the depression lightened, we made a little more money. I got a job as a hat check girl in a large country club and sold stockings as a sideline. To help put himself through college, one of my sons got a job in a farm, milked thirteen cows morning and night. Today, my children have grown up and married. I have three fine grandchildren. And as I look back on that terrible day when I turned on the gas, I thank God over and over that I woke up in time. What joys I would have missed if I'd carried out that act. How many wonderful years I would have forfeited forever. Whenever I hear now of someone who wants to end his life, I feel like crying out, Don't do it! Don't! The blackest moments we live through can only last a little time, and then comes the future. On the average, someone commits suicide in these United States every 35 minutes. On the average, someone goes insane every 120 seconds. Most of these suicides, and probably many of the tragedies of insanity, could have been prevented if these people had only had the solace and peace that are found in religion and prayer. One of the most distinguished of psychiatrists, Dr. Carl Jung, says on page 264 of his book, Modern Man in Search of a Soul, During the past thirty years, people from all the civilized countries of the earth have consulted me. I have treated many hundreds of patients. Among all my patients in the second half of life, that is to say over thirty-five, there has not been one whose problem in the last resort was not that of finding a religious outlook on life. It is safe to say that every one of them fell ill because he had lost that which the living religions of every age have given to their followers, and none of them has been really healed who did not regain his religious outlook. That statement is so significant I want to repeat it. Dr. Carl Jung said, During the past thirty years, people from all the civilized countries of the earth have consulted me. I have treated many hundreds of patients. Among all my patients in the second half of life, that is to say over thirty-five, there has not been one whose problem in the last resort was not that of finding a religious outlook on life. It is safe to say that every one of them fell ill because he had lost that which the living religions of every age have given to their followers, and none of them has been really healed who did not regain his religious outlook. William James said approximately the same thing. Faith is one of the forces by which men live, he declared, and the total absence of it means collapse. The late Mahatma Gandhi, the greatest Indian leader since Buddha, would have collapsed if he had not been inspired by the sustaining power of prayer. How do I know? Because Gandhi himself said so. Without prayer, he wrote, I should have been a lunatic long ago. Thousands of people could give similar testimony. My own father, well, as I've already said, my own father would have drowned himself if it had not been for my mother's prayers and faith. 
probably thousands of the tortured souls who are now screaming in our insane asylums could have been saved if they had only turned to a higher power for help, instead of trying to fight life's battles alone. When we are harassed and reach the limit of our strength, many of us then turn in desperation to God. There are no atheists in foxholes. But why wait until we're desperate? Why not renew our strength every day? Why wait even till Sunday? For years, I've had the habit of dropping into empty churches on weekday afternoons. When I feel that I'm too rushed and hurried to spare a few minutes to think about spiritual things, I say to myself, Wait a minute, Dale Carnegie, wait a minute. Why all the feverish hurry and rush, little man? You need to pause and acquire a little perspective. At such times, I frequently drop into the first church that I find open. Although I'm a Protestant, I frequently on weekday afternoons drop into St. Patrick's Cathedral on Fifth Avenue and remind myself that I'll be dead in another thirty years, but that the great spiritual truths that all churches teach are eternal. I close my eyes and pray. I find that doing this calms my nerves, rests my body, clarifies my perspective, and helps me revalue my values. May I recommend this practice to you? During the past six years that I've been writing this book, I've collected hundreds of examples and concrete cases of how men and women conquered fear and worry by prayer. I have in my filing cabinet folders bulging with case histories. Let's take as a typical example the story of a discouraged and disheartened book salesman, John R. Anthony of Houston, Texas. Here's his story as he told it to me. Twenty-two years ago, I closed my private law office to become state representative of an American law book company. My specialty was selling a set of law books to lawyers, a set of books that were almost indispensable. I was ably and thoroughly trained for the job. I knew all the direct sales talks and the convincing answers to all possible objections. Before calling on a prospect, I familiarized myself with his rating as an attorney, the nature of his practice, his politics and hobbies. During my interview, I used that information with ample skill, yet something was wrong. I just couldn't get orders. I grew discouraged. As the days and weeks passed, I doubled and redoubled my efforts, but was still unable to close enough sales to pay my expenses. A sense of fear and dread grew within me. I became afraid to call on people. Before I could enter a prospect's office, that feeling of dread flared up so strong I'd pace up and down the hallway outside the door, or go out of the building and circle the block. Then, after losing much valuable time and feigning enough courage by sheer willpower to crash the office door, I feebly turned the doorknob with trembling hand, half hoping my prospect would not be in. My sales manager threatened to stop my advances if I didn't send in more orders. My wife at home pleaded with me for money to pay the grocery bill for herself and our three children. Worry seized me. Day by day I grew more desperate. I didn't know what to do. As I've already said, I'd closed my private law office at home and had given up my clients. Now I was broke. I didn't have the money to pay even my hotel bill. Neither did I have the money to buy a ticket back home, nor did I have the courage to return home a beaten man, even if I had the ticket. Finally, at the miserable end of another bad day, I trudged back to my hotel room for the last time, I thought. So far as I was concerned, I was thoroughly beaten. Heartbroken, depressed, I didn't know which way to turn. I hardly cared whether I lived or died. I was sorry I had ever been born. I had nothing but a glass of hot milk that night for dinner. Even that was more than I could afford. I understood that night why desperate men raise a hotel window and jump. I might have done it myself if I'd had the courage. I began wondering what was the purpose of life. I didn't know. I couldn't figure it out. Since there was no one else to turn to, I turned to God. I began to pray. I implored the Almighty to give me light and understanding and guidance through the dark, dense wilderness of despair that had closed in about me. I asked God to help me get orders for my books and to give me money to feed my wife and children. After that prayer, I opened my eyes 
and saw a Gideon Bible that lay on the dresser in that lonely hotel room. I opened it and read those beautiful, immortal promises of Jesus that must have inspired countless generations of lonely, worried, and beaten men throughout the ages, a talk that Jesus gave to his disciples about how to keep from worrying. Take no thought for your life what ye shall eat, or what ye shall drink, nor yet for your body, what ye shall put on. Is not the life more than meat, and the body more than raiment? Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. As I prayed, and as I read those words, a miracle happened. My nervous tension fell away. My anxieties, fears, and worries were transformed into heartwarming courage and hope and triumphant faith. I was happy, even though I didn't have enough money to pay my hotel bill. I went to bed and slept soundly, free from care, as I had not done for many years. Next morning, I could hardly hold myself back until the offices of my prospects were open. I approached the office door of my first prospect that beautiful, cold, rainy day with a bold and positive stride. I turned the doorknob with a firm and steady grip. As I entered, I made a beeline for my man energetically, chin up, with appropriate dignity and all smiles, saying, Good morning, Mr. Smith. I'm John R. Anthony of the All-American Law Book Company. Oh, yes, yes, he replied, smiling, too, as he rose from his chair with outstretched hand. I'm glad to see you. Have a seat. I made more sales that day than I had made in weeks. That evening I proudly returned to my hotel like a conquering hero. I felt like a new man, and I was a new man, because I had a new and victorious mental attitude. No dinner of hot milk that night, no, sir. I had a steak with all the fixings. From that day on, my sales zoomed. I was born anew that desperate night twenty-two years ago in a little hotel in Amarillo, Texas. My outward situation the next day was the same as it had been through my weeks of failure, but a tremendous thing had happened inside me. I had suddenly become aware of my relationship with God. A mere man alone can easily be defeated, but a man alive with the power of God within him is invincible. I know. I saw it work in my own life. Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. When Mrs. L. G. Baird of Highland, Illinois, was faced with stark tragedy, she discovered that she could find peace and tranquility by kneeling down and saying, O Lord, thy will, not mine, be done. One evening our telephone rang, she writes in a letter that I have before me now. It rang fourteen times before I had the courage to pick up the receiver. I knew it must be the hospital, and I was terrified. I feared that our little boy was dying. He had meningitis. He had already been given penicillin, but it made his temperature fluctuate, and the doctors feared that the disease had traveled to his brain and might cause the development of a brain tumor and death. The phone call was just what I feared. The hospital was calling. The doctor wanted us to come immediately. Maybe you can picture the anguish my husband and I went through sitting in the waiting room. Everyone else had his baby, but we sat there with empty arms, wondering if we would ever hold our little fellow again. When we were finally called into the doctor's private office, the expression on his face filled our hearts with terror. His words brought even more terror. He told us that there was only one chance in four that our baby would live. He said that if we knew another doctor, to please call him in on the case. On the way home, my husband broke down and, doubling up his fist, hit the steering wheel, saying, Bets I can't give that little guy up. Have you ever seen a man cry? It, it isn't a pleasant experience. We stopped the car, and after talking things over, decided to stop in church and pray that if it was God's will to take our baby, we would resign our will to his. I sank in the pew and said with tears rolling down my cheeks, not my will, but thine be done. The moment I uttered those words, I felt better. A sense of peace that I hadn't felt for a long time came over me. All the way home, I kept repeating, 
O God, thy will, not mine, be done. I slept soundly that night for the first time in a week. The doctor called a few days later and said that Bobby had passed the crisis. I thank God for the strong and healthy four-year-old boy we have today. I know men who regard religion as something for women and children and preachers. They pride themselves on being he-men who can fight their battles alone. How surprised they might be to learn that some of the most famous he-men in the world pray every day. For example, he-man Jack Dempsey told me that he never went to bed without saying his prayers. He told me that he never ate a meal without first thanking God for it. He told me that he prayed every day when he was training for a bout, and that when he was fighting he always prayed just before the bell sounded for each round. Praying, he said, helped me fight with courage and confidence. He-man Connie Mack told me he couldn't go to sleep without saying his prayers. He-man Eddie Rickenbacker told me that he believed his life had been saved by prayer. He prayed every day. He-man Edward R. Stettinius, former high official of General Motors and United States Steel and former Secretary of State, told me that he prayed for wisdom and guidance every morning and night. He-man J. Pierpont Morgan, the greatest financier of his age, often went alone to Trinity Church at the head of Wall Street on Saturday afternoons and knelt in prayer. When He-man Eisenhower flew to England to take supreme command of the British and American forces, he took only one book on the plane with him, the Bible. He-man General Mark Clark told me that he read his Bible every day during the war and knelt down in prayer. So did Chiang Kai-shek and General Montgomery, Monty of El Alamein. So did Lord Nelson at Trafalgar. So did General Washington, Robert E. Lee, Stonewall Jackson, and scores of other great military leaders. These he-men discovered the truth of William James's statement, We and God have business with each other, and in opening ourselves to his influence, our deepest destiny is fulfilled. A lot of he-men are discovering that. Seventy-two million Americans are church members now, an all-time record. As I said before, even the scientists are turning to religion. Take, for example, Dr. Alexis Carroll, who wrote Man the Unknown, and won the greatest honor that can be bestowed upon any scientist, the Nobel Prize. Dr. Carroll said in a Reader's Digest article, Prayer is the most powerful form of energy one can generate. It is a force as real as gravity. As a physician, I have seen men, after all other therapy had failed, lifted out of disease and melancholy by the serene effort of prayer. Prayer, like radium, is a source of luminous, self-generating energy. In prayer, human beings seek to augment their finite energy by addressing themselves to the infinite source of all energy. When we pray, we link ourselves with the inexhaustible motive power that spins the universe. We pray that a part of this power be apportioned to our needs. Even in asking, our human deficiencies are filled, and we arise strengthened and repaired. Whenever we address God in fervent prayer, we change both soul and body for the better. It could not happen that any man or woman could pray for a single moment without some good result. Admiral Byrd knew what it meant to link ourselves with the inexhaustible motive power that spins the universe. His ability to do that pulled him through the most trying ordeal of his life. He tells the story in his book, Alone. In 1934, he spent five months in a hut buried beneath the ice cap of the Ross Barrier, deep in the Antarctic. He was the only living creature south of latitude 78. Blizzards roared above his shack. The cold plunged down to 82 degrees below zero. He was completely surrounded by unending night. And then he found, to his horror, he was being slowly poisoned by carbon monoxide that escaped from his stove. What could he do? The nearest help was 123 miles away and could not possibly reach him for several months. He tried to fix his stove and ventilating system, but the fumes still escaped. They often knocked him out cold. He lay on the floor completely unconscious. He couldn't eat. He couldn't sleep. He became so feeble that he could hardly leave his bunk. He frequently feared he wouldn't live until morning. He was convinced he would die in that cabin, 
and his body would be hidden by perpetual snows. What saved his life? One day, in the depths of his despair, he reached for his diary and tried to set down his philosophy of life. The human race, he wrote, is not alone in the universe. He thought of the stars overhead, of the orderly swing of the constellations and planets, of how the everlasting sun would in its time return to lighten even the wastes of the south polar regions. And then he wrote in his diary, I am not alone. This realization that he was not alone, not even in a hole in the ice at the end of the earth, was what saved Richard Byrd. I know it pulled me through, he says, and he goes on to add, few men in their lifetime come anywhere near exhausting the resources dwelling within them. There are deep wells of strength that are never used. Richard Byrd learned to tap those wells of strength and use those resources by turning to God. Glenn A. Arnold learned amidst the cornfields of Illinois the same lesson that Admiral Byrd learned in the polar ice cap. Mr. Arnold, an insurance broker in Chillicothe, Illinois, opened his speech on conquering worry like this. Eight years ago, I turned the key in the lock of my front door for what I believed was the last time in my life. Then I climbed in my car and started down for the river. I was a failure, he said. One month before, my entire little world had come crashing down on my head. My electrical appliance business had gone on the rocks. In my home, my mother lay at the point of death. My wife was carrying our second child. Doctor's bills were mounting. We'd mortgaged everything we had to start the business, our car and our furniture. I'd even taken out a loan on my insurance policies. Now everything was gone. I couldn't take it any longer, so I climbed into my car and started for the river, determined to end the sorry mess. I drove a few miles out in the country, pulled off the road, and got out and sat on the ground and wept like a child. Then I really started to think, instead of going around in frightening circles of worry, I tried to think constructively. How bad was my situation? Couldn't it be worse? Was it really hopeless? What could I do to make it better? I decided then and there to take the whole problem to the Lord and ask Him to handle it. I prayed. I prayed hard. I prayed as though my very life depended on it, which, in fact, it did. Then a strange thing happened. As soon as I turned all my problems over to a power greater than myself, I immediately felt a peace of mind that I hadn't known in months. I must have sat there for half an hour, weeping and praying. Then I went home and slept like a child. The next morning I arose with confidence. I no longer had anything to fear, for I was depending on God for guidance. That morning I walked into a local department store with my head high, and I spoke with confidence as I applied for a job as salesman in the electrical appliance department. I knew I would get the job, and I did. I made good at it until the whole appliance business collapsed due to the war. Then I began selling life insurance, still under the management of my great guide. That was only five years ago. Now all of my bills are paid. I have a fine family of three bright children, own my own home, have a new car, and own $25,000 in life insurance. As I look back, I'm glad now that I lost everything and became so depressed that I started for the river because that tragedy taught me to rely on God, and I now have a peace and confidence that I never dreamed were possible. Why does religious faith bring us such peace and calm and fortitude? I'll let William James answer that. He says, The turbulent billows of the fretful surface leave the deep parts of the ocean undisturbed. And to him who has a hold on vaster and more permanent realities, the hourly vicissitudes of his personal destiny seem relatively insignificant things. The really religious person is accordingly unshakable and full of equanimity, and calmly ready for any duty that the day may bring forth. If we're worried and anxious, why not try God? Why not, as Immanuel Kant said, accept a belief in God because we need such a belief. Why not link ourselves now with the inexhaustible motive power that spins the universe? 
Even if you're not a religious person by nature or training, even if you're an out-and-out skeptic, prayer can help you much more than you believe, for it is a practical thing. What do I mean, practical? I mean that prayer fulfills these three very basic psychological needs which all people share, whether they believe in God or not. One, prayer helps us put into words exactly what is troubling us. We saw in chapter 4 that it's almost impossible to deal with a problem while it remains vague and nebulous. Praying, in a way, is very much like writing our problems down on paper. If we ask help for a problem, even from God, we must put it into words. Two, prayer gives us a sense of sharing our burdens, of not being alone. Few of us are so strong that we can bear our heaviest burdens, our most agonizing troubles, all by ourselves. Sometimes our worries are of so intimate a nature that we cannot discuss them, even with our closest relatives or friends. Then prayer is the answer. Any psychiatrist will tell us that when we're pent up and tense and in agony of spirit, it is therapeutically good to tell someone our troubles. When we can't tell anyone else, we can always tell God. Three, prayer puts into force an active principle of doing. It's a first step toward action. I doubt if anyone can pray for some fulfillment day after day without benefiting from it. In other words, without taking some steps to bring it to pass. And the world-famous scientist, Dr. Alexis Carroll, said, Prayer is the most powerful form of energy one can generate. So why not make use of it? Call it God or Allah or Spirit. Why quarrel with the definitions as long as the mysterious powers of nature take us in hand? Why not close this book right now? Shut the door, kneel down, and unburden your heart. If you've lost your faith, beseech Almighty God to renew it. And repeat this beautiful prayer written by St. Francis of Assisi 700 years ago. Lord, make me an instrument of thy peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. O Divine Master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Part 6. How to Keep from Worrying About Criticism Chapter 20 Remember that no one ever kicks a dead dog. An event occurred in 1929 that created a national sensation in educational circles. Learned men from all over America rushed to Chicago to witness the affair. A few years earlier, a young man by the name of Robert Hutchins had worked his way through Yale acting as a waiter, a lumberjack, a tutor, and a clothesline salesman. Now, only eight years later, he was being inaugurated as president of the fourth richest university in America, the University of Chicago. His age? Thirty. Incredible. The older educators shook their heads. Criticism came roaring down upon this boy wonder like a rock slide. He was this and he was that, too young, inexperienced. His educational ideas were cockeyed. Even the newspapers joined in the attack. The day he was inaugurated... A friend said to the father of Robert Maynard Hutchins, I was shocked this morning to read that newspaper editorial denouncing your son. Yes, the elder Hutchins replied, it was severe, but remember that no one ever kicks a dead dog. Yes, and the more important a dog is, the more satisfaction people get in kicking him. The Prince of Wales, who later became Edward VIII, had that brought home to him in the seat of his pants. He was attending Dartmouth College in Devonshire at the time, a college that corresponds to our Naval Academy at Annapolis. The prince was about fourteen. One day, one of the naval officers found him crying and asked him what was wrong. He refused to tell at first, but finally admitted the truth. He was being kicked by the naval cadets. 
The commodore of the college summoned the boys and explained to them that the prince had not complained, but he wanted to find out why the prince had been singled out for this rough treatment. After much hemming and hawing and toe-scraping, the cadets finally confessed that when they themselves became commanders and captains in the king's navy, they wanted to be able to say that they had kicked the king. So when you're kicked and criticized, remember that it's often done because it gives the kicker a feeling of importance. It often means that you're accomplishing something and are worthy of attention. Many people get a sense of savage satisfaction out of denouncing those who are better educated than they are or more successful. For example, while I was writing this chapter, I received a letter from a woman denouncing General William Booth, founder of the Salvation Army. I'd given a laudatory broadcast about General Booth, so this woman wrote me, saying that General Booth had stolen eight million dollars of the money he had collected to help poor people. The charge, of course, was absurd. But this woman wasn't looking for truth. She was seeking the mean-spirited gratification she got from tearing down someone far above her. I threw her bitter letter into the wastebasket, and thanked God that I wasn't married to her. Her letter didn't tell me anything at all about General Booth, but it did tell me a lot about her. Schopenhauer had said years ago, "'Vulgar people take huge delight in the faults and follies of great men.'" One hardly thinks of the president of Yale as a vulgar man, yet a former president of Yale, Timothy Dwight, apparently took huge delight in denouncing a man who was running for president of the United States. The president of Yale warned that if this man were elected president, we may see our wives and daughters the victims of legal prostitution, soberly dishonored, speciously polluted, the outcasts of delicacy and virtue, the loathing of God and man. Sounds almost like a denunciation of Hitler, doesn't it? But it wasn't. It was a denunciation of Thomas Jefferson. Which Thomas Jefferson? Surely not the immortal Thomas Jefferson, the author of the Declaration of Independence, the patron saint of democracy? Yes, verily, that was the man. What American do you suppose was denounced as a hypocrite, an impostor, and as little better than a murderer? A newspaper cartoon depicted him on a guillotine, the big knife ready to cut off his head. Crowds jeered at him and hissed him as he rode through the streets. Who was he? George Washington. But that occurred a long time ago. Maybe human nature has improved since then. Let's see. Let's take the case of Admiral Perry, the explorer who startled and thrilled the world by reaching the North Pole with dog sleds on April 6, 1909, a goal that brave men for centuries had suffered and starved and died to attain. Perry himself almost died from cold and starvation and eight of his toes were frozen so hard they had to be cut off. He was so overwhelmed with disasters that he feared he would go insane. His superior naval officers in Washington were burned up because Perry was getting so much publicity and acclaim, so they accused him of collecting money for scientific expeditions and then lying around and loafing in the Arctic. They probably believed it, because it's almost impossible not to believe what you want to believe. Their determination to humiliate and block Perry was so violent that only a direct order from President McKinley enabled Perry to continue his career in the Arctic. Would Perry have been denounced if he had a desk job at the Navy Department in Washington? No, he wouldn't have been important enough then to have aroused jealousy. General Grant had an even worse experience than Admiral Perry. In 1862, General Grant won the first great decisive victory that the North had enjoyed, a victory that was achieved in one afternoon, a victory that made Grant a national idol overnight, a victory that had tremendous repercussions even in far-off Europe, a victory that set church bells ringing and bonfires blazing from Maine to the banks of the Mississippi. Yet within six weeks after achieving that great victory, Grant, hero of the North, was arrested, and his army was taken from him. He wept in despair. Why was General U.S. Grant arrested at the flood tide of his victory? Largely because he had aroused the jealousy and envy of his arrogant superiors. If we are tempted to be worried about unjust criticism, here is rule one. Remember that unjust criticism is often a disguised compliment. 
remember that no one ever kicks a dead dog. Chapter 21 Do this, and criticism can't hurt you. I once interviewed Major General Smedley Butler, old Gimlet Eye, old Hell Devil Butler, remember him? One of the most colorful, swashbuckling generals who ever commanded the United States Marines. He told me that when he was young, he was desperately eager to be popular, wanted to make a good impression on everyone. In those days, the slightest criticism smarted and stung, but he confessed that thirty years in the Marines had toughened his hide. I have been berated and insulted, he said, and denounced as a yellow dog, a snake, and a skunk. I have been cursed by the experts. I have been called every possible combination of unprintable cuss words in the English language. Bother me? Ha! Ah, when I hear somebody cussing me now, I never turn my head to see who's talking. Maybe old Gimlet Eye Butler was too indifferent to criticism, but one thing is sure. Most of us take the little jibes and javelins that are hurled at us far too seriously. I remember the time years ago when a reporter from the New York Sun attended a demonstration meeting of my adult education classes and lampooned me and my work. Was I burned up? I took it as a personal insult. I telephoned Gil Hodges, the chairman of the executive committee of the Sun, and practically demanded that he print an article stating the facts instead of ridicule. I was determined to make the punishment fit the crime. I'm ashamed now of the way I acted. I realize now that half the people who bought the paper never saw that article. Half of those who read it regarded it as a source of innocent merriment. Half of those who gloated over it forgot all about it in a few weeks. I realize now that people are not thinking about you and me or caring what is said about us. They're thinking about themselves, before breakfast, after breakfast, and right on until ten minutes past midnight. They would be a thousand times more concerned about a slight headache of their own than they would about the news of your death or mine. Even if you and I are lied about, ridiculed, double-crossed, knifed in the back, and sold down the river by one out of every six of our most intimate friends, let's not indulge in an orgy of self-pity. Instead, let's remind ourselves that that's precisely what happened to Jesus. One of his twelve most intimate friends turned traitor for a bribe that would amount in our modern money to about nineteen dollars. Another of his twelve most intimate friends openly deserted Jesus the moment he got into trouble and declared three times that he didn't even know Jesus, and he swore as he said it, one out of six. That's what happened to Jesus. Uh, why should you and I expect a better score? I discovered years ago that although I couldn't keep people from criticizing me unjustly, I could do something infinitely more important. I could determine whether I would let the unjust condemnation disturb me. Let's be clear about this. I'm not advocating ignoring all criticism. Far from it. I'm talking about ignoring only unjust criticism. I once asked Eleanor Roosevelt how she handled unjust criticism, and Allah knows she had a lot of it. She probably had more ardent friends and more violent enemies than any other woman who ever lived in the White House. She told me that as a young girl she was almost morbidly shy, afraid of what people might say. She was so afraid of criticism that one day she asked her aunt, Theodore Roosevelt's sister, for advice. She said, Auntie Vi, I want to do so-and-so, but I'm afraid of being criticized. Teddy Roosevelt's sister looked her in the eye and said, Never be bothered by what people say, as long as you know in your heart you are right. Eleanor Roosevelt told me that bit of advice proved to be her rock of Gibraltar years later when she was in the White House. She told me that the only way we can avoid all criticism is to be like a Dresden China figure and stay on a shelf. Do what you feel in your heart to be right, for you'll be criticized anyway. You'll be damned if you do and damned if you don't. That is her advice. When the late Matthew C. Brush was president of the American International Corporation, I asked him if he was ever sensitive to criticism, and he replied, Yes, I was very sensitive to it in my early days. I was eager then to have all the employees in the organization think I was perfect. If they didn't, it worried me. I would try to please first one person who had been sounding off against me, but the very thing I did to patch it up with him would make someone else mad. 
Then when I tried to fix it up with this person, I would stir up a couple of other bumblebees. I finally discovered that the more I tried to pacify and to smooth over injured feelings in order to escape personal criticism, the more certain I was to increase my enemies. So finally I said to myself, If you get your head above the crowd, you're going to be criticized, so get used to the idea. That helped me tremendously. From that time on, I made it a rule to do the very best I could, and then put up my old umbrella and let the rain of criticism drain off me instead of run down my neck. Deems Taylor went a bit further. He let the rain of criticism run down his neck and had a good laugh over it in public. He was giving his comments during the intermission of the Sunday afternoon radio concerts of the New York Philharmonic Symphony Orchestra. One woman wrote him a letter calling him a liar, a traitor, a snake, and a moron. Mr. Taylor says in his book, Of Men and Music, I have a suspicion that she didn't care for that talk. On the following week's broadcast, Mr. Taylor read this letter over the radio to millions of listeners and received another letter from the same lady a few days later expressing her unaltered opinion, says Mr. Taylor, that I was still a liar, a traitor, a snake, and a moron. We can't keep from admiring a man who takes criticism like that. We admire his serenity, his unshaken poise, and his sense of humor. When Charles Schwab was addressing the student body at Princeton, he confessed that one of the most important lessons he ever learned was taught to him by an old German who worked in Schwab's steel mill. This old German got involved in a hot wartime argument with the other steel workers, and they tossed him into the river. When he came into my office, Mr. Schwab said, covered with mud and water, I asked him what he had said to the men who had thrown him in the river, and he replied, I just laughed. Mr. Schwab declared that he had adopted that old German's words as his motto, just laugh. That motto is especially good when you're the victim of unjust criticism. You can answer the man who answers you back, but what can you say to the man who just laughs? Lincoln might have broken under the strain of the Civil War if he hadn't learned the folly of trying to answer all the vitriolic condemnation hurled at him. His description of how he handled his critics has become a literary gem, a classic. General MacArthur had a copy of it hanging above his headquarters desk during the war, and Winston Churchill had a framed copy of it on the walls of his study at Chartwell. It goes like this. If I were to try to read, much less to answer all the attacks made on me, this shop might as well be closed for any other business. I do the very best I know how, the very best I can, and I mean to keep on doing so until the end. If the end brings me out all right, then what is said against me won't matter. If the end brings me out wrong, then ten angels swearing I was right would make no difference. When you and I are unjustly criticized, Let's remember rule two. Do the very best you can, and then put up your old umbrella and keep the rain of criticism from running down the back of your neck. Chapter 22. Fool Things I Have Done I have a folder in my private filing cabinet marked FTD, a short for Fool Things I Have Done. I put in that folder written records of the fool things I've been guilty of. I sometimes dictate these memos to my secretary, but sometimes they're so personal, so stupid, that I'm ashamed to dictate them, so I write them out in longhand. I can still recall some of the criticism of Dale Carnegie that I put in my FTD folder 15 years ago. If I'd been utterly honest with myself, I would not have a filing cabinet bursting out at the seams with these FTD memos. I can truthfully repeat what King Saul said 30 centuries ago. I have played the fool and have erred exceedingly. 
When I get out my FTD folders and reread the criticisms I have written of myself, they help me deal with the toughest problem I shall ever face, the management of Dale Carnegie. I used to blame my troubles on other people, but as I've grown older and wiser, I hope, I've realized that I myself, in the last analysis, am to blame for almost all my misfortunes. Lots of people have discovered that as they grow older. No one but myself, said Napoleon at St. Helena, no one but myself can be blamed for my fall. I have been my own greatest enemy, the cause of my own disastrous fate. Let me tell you about a man I knew who was an artist when it came to self-appraisal and self-management. His name was H. P. Howell. When the news of his sudden death in the drugstore of the Hotel Ambassador in New York was flashed across the nation on July 31, 1944, Wall Street was shocked, for he was the leader in American finance, chairman of the board of the Commercial National Bank and Trust Company, and a director of several large corporations. He grew up with little formal education, started out in life clerking in a country store, and later became credit manager for U.S. Steel, and was on his way to position and power. For years I have kept an engagement book showing all the appointments I have during the day, Mr. Howell told me when I asked him to explain the reasons for his success. My family never makes any plans for me on Saturday night, for the family knows that I devote a part of each Saturday evening to self-examination and a review and appraisal of my work during the week. After dinner, I go off by myself, open my engagement book, and think over all the interviews, discussions, and meetings that have taken place since Monday morning. I ask myself, what mistakes did I make that time? What did I do that was right? And in what way could I have improved my performance? What lesson can I learn from that experience? I sometimes find that this weekly review makes me very unhappy. Sometimes I'm astonished by my own blunders. Of course, as the years have gone by, these blunders have become less frequent. This system of self-analysis, continued year after year, has done more for me than any other thing I have ever attempted. Maybe H. P. Howell borrowed his idea from Ben Franklin. Only Franklin didn't wait until Saturday night. He gave himself a severe going over every night. He discovered that he had thirteen serious faults. Now here are three of them. Wasting time, stewing around over trifles, arguing and contradicting people. Wise old Ben Franklin realized that unless he eliminated these handicaps, he wasn't going to get very far. So he battled one of his shortcomings every day for a week and kept a record of who had won each day's slugging match. The next week, he would pick out another bad habit, put on the gloves, and when the bell rang, he would come out of his corner fighting. Franklin kept up this battle with his faults every week for more than two years. No wonder he became one of the best-loved and most influential men this nation ever produced. Albert Hubbard said, Every man is a damn fool for at least five minutes a day. Wisdom consists in not exceeding that limit. The small man flies into a rage over the slightest criticism, but the wise man is eager to learn from those who have censured him and reproved him and disputed the passage with him. Walt Whitman put it this way, Had you learned only of those who admired you and were tender with you and stood aside for you? Have you not learned great lessons from those who rejected you and braced themselves against you or disputed the passage with you? Instead of waiting for our enemies to criticize us or our work, let's beat them to it. Let's be our own most severe critic. Let's find and remedy all our weaknesses before our enemies get a chance to say a word. That is what Charles Darwin did. In fact, he spent 15 years criticizing... Well, the story goes like this. When Darwin completed the manuscript of his immortal book, The Origin of Species he realized that the publication of his revolutionary concept of creation would rock the intellectual and religious worlds. So he became his own critic and spent another 15 years checking his data, challenging his reasoning, criticizing his conclusions. Suppose someone denounced you as a mad fool. What would you do? Get angry? Indignant? Here's what Lincoln did. Edward M. Stanton... Lincoln's Secretary of War once called Lincoln a damned fool. Stanton was indignant because Lincoln had been meddling in Stanton's affairs. 
In order to please a selfish politician, Lincoln had signed an order transferring certain regiments. Stanton not only refused to carry out Lincoln's orders, but swore that Lincoln was a damn fool for ever signing such orders. What happened? When Lincoln was told what Stanton had said, Lincoln calmly replied, If Stanton said I am a damn fool, then I must be, for he is nearly always right. I'll just step over and see for myself. Lincoln did go to see Stanton. Stanton convinced him that the order was wrong, and Lincoln withdrew it. Lincoln welcomed criticism when he knew it was sincere, founded on knowledge, and given in a spirit of helpfulness. You and I ought to welcome that kind of criticism, too, for we can't even hope to be right more than three times out of four. At least, that was all Theodore Roosevelt said he could hope for when he was in the White House. Einstein, the most profound thinker of our day, confessed that his conclusions were wrong 99% of the time. The opinions of our enemies, said La Rochefoucauld, come nearer to the truth about us than do our own opinions. I know that statement may be true many times, yet when anyone starts to criticize me, if I do not watch myself, I instantly and automatically leap to the defensive, even before I have the slightest idea of what my critic is going to say. I'm disgusted with myself every time I do it. We all tend to resent criticism and lap up praise, regardless of whether either the criticisms or the praise is justified. We are not creatures of logic. We're creatures of emotions. Our logic is like a birch bark canoe tossed about on a deep, dark, stormy sea of emotion. If we hear that someone has spoken ill of us, let's not try to defend ourselves. Every fool does that. Let's be original and humble and brilliant. Let's confound our critic and win applause for ourselves by saying, If my critic had known about all my other faults, he would have criticized me much more severely than he did. In previous chapters, I've talked about what to do when you're unjustly criticized. But here's another idea. When your anger is rising because you feel you've been unjustly condemned, why not stop and say, just a minute, I am far from perfect. If Einstein admits he is wrong 99% of the time, maybe I'm wrong at least 80% of the time. Maybe I deserve this criticism. If I do, I ought to be thankful for it and try to profit by it. Charles Luckman, a former president of the Pepsodent Company, spent a million dollars a year putting Bob Hope on the air. He didn't look at the letters praising the program, but he insisted on seeing the critical letters. He knew he might learn something from them. The Ford Company was so eager to find out what was wrong with its management and operations that it polled the employees and invited them to criticize the company. I know a former soap salesman who used to even ask for criticism. When he first started out selling soap for Colgate, orders came slowly. He worried about losing his job. Since he knew there was nothing wrong with the soap or the price, he figured that the trouble must be himself. When he failed to make a sale, he would often walk around the block trying to figure out what was wrong. Had he been too vague? Did he lack enthusiasm? Sometimes he would go back to the merchant and say, I haven't come back here to try to sell you any soap. I've come back to get your advice and your criticism. Won't you please tell me what I did that was wrong when I tried to sell you soap a few minutes ago? You're far more experienced and successful than I am. Please give me your criticism. Be frank. Don't pull your punches. This attitude won him a lot of friends and priceless advice. And what do you suppose ever happened to him? He rose to be president of the Colgate Palmolive Pete Soap Company, one of the world's largest makers of soap. His name is E. H. Little. It takes a big man to do what H. P. Howell, Ben Franklin, and E. H. Little did. And now, while nobody is looking, why not peep into the mirror and ask yourself whether you belong in that kind of company? To keep from worrying about criticism, here is rule three. Let's keep a record of the fool things we've done and criticize ourselves. Since we can't hope to be perfect, let's do what E.H. Little did. Let's ask for unbiased, helpful, constructive criticism. Part 6 in a Nutshell How to Keep from Worrying About Criticism Rule 1 Unjust criticism is often a disguised compliment. 
It often means that you have aroused jealousy and envy. Remember that no one ever kicks a dead dog. Rule 2. Do the very best you can, and then put up your old umbrella and keep the rain of criticism from running down the back of your neck. Rule 3. Let's keep a record of the fool things we've done and criticize ourselves. Since we can't hope to be perfect, let's do what E.H. Little did. Let's ask for unbiased, helpful, constructive criticism. Part 7. Six Ways to Prevent Fatigue and Worry and keep your energy and spirits high. Chapter 23 How to Add One Hour a Day to Your Waking Life Why am I writing a chapter on preventing fatigue in a book on preventing worry? That's simple, because fatigue often produces worry, or at least it makes you susceptible to worry. Any medical student will tell you that fatigue lowers your resistance to the emotions of fear and worry, so preventing fatigue tends to prevent worry. And did I say tends to prevent worry? This is putting it mildly. Dr. Edmund Jacobson goes much further. Dr. Jacobson has written two books on relaxation, Progressive Relaxation and You Must Relax. And as director of the University of Chicago Laboratory for Clinical Physiology, he spent years conducting investigations in using relaxation as a method in medical practice. He declares that any nervous or emotional state fails to exist in the presence of complete relaxation. That's another way of saying you cannot continue to worry if you relax. The first rule is rest often. Rest before you get tired. And why is that so important? Because fatigue accumulates with astonishing rapidity. The United States Army has discovered, by repeated tests, that even young men, men toughened by years of Army training, can march better, can hold up longer, if they throw down their packs and rest ten minutes out of every hour. So the Army forces them to do just that. Your heart is just as smart as the U.S. Army. Your heart pumps enough blood through your body every day to fill a railway tank car. It exerts enough energy every 24 hours to shovel 20 tons of coal onto a platform three feet high. It does this incredible amount of work for 50, 70, maybe 90 years. How can it stand it? Dr. Walter B. Cannon of the Harvard Medical School explained it. He said, most people have the idea that the heart is working all the time. As a matter of fact, there's a definite rest period after each contraction. When beating at a moderate rate of 70 pulses per minute, the heart is actually working only 9 hours out of the 24. In the aggregate, its rest periods total a full 15 hours per day. During World War II, Winston Churchill, in his late 60s and early 70s, was able to work 16 hours a day, year after year, directing the war efforts of the British Empire. A phenomenal record. His secret? He worked in bed each morning until 11 o'clock, reading reports, dictating orders, making telephone calls, and holding important conferences. After lunch, he went to bed again and slept for an hour. In the evening, he went to bed once more and slept for two hours before having dinner at eight. He didn't cure fatigue. He didn't have to cure it. He prevented it. Because he rested frequently, he was able to work on, fresh and fit, until long past midnight. The original John D. Rockefeller made two extraordinary records. He accumulated the greatest fortune the world had ever seen up to that time, and he also lived to be 98. How did he do it? The chief reason, of course, was because he had inherited a tendency to live long. Another reason was his habit of taking a half-hour nap in his office every noon. He would lie down on his office couch, and not even the President of the United States could get John D. on the phone while he was having his snooze. In his excellent book, Why Be Tired?, Daniel W. Jocelyn observed, Rest is not a matter of doing absolutely nothing. Rest is repair. There is so much repair power in a short period of rest that even a five-minute nap will help to forestall fatigue. Connie Mack, the grand old man of baseball, told me that if he didn't take an afternoon nap before a game, he was all tuckered out at around the fifth inning. But if he did go to sleep, 
If for only five minutes, he could last throughout an entire doubleheader without feeling tired. When I asked Eleanor Roosevelt how she was able to carry such an exhausting schedule during the twelve years she was in the White House, she said that before meeting a crowd or making a speech, she would often sit in a chair or Davenport, close her eyes, and relax for twenty minutes. I once interviewed Gene Autry in his dressing room at Madison Square Garden, where he was the star attraction at the World's Championship Rodeo. I noticed an army cot in his dressing room. I lie down there every afternoon, Gene Autry said, and get an hour's nap between performances. When I'm making pictures in Hollywood, he continued, I often relax in a big easy chair and get two or three ten-minute naps a day. They buck me up tremendously. Edison attributed his enormous energy and endurance to his habit of sleeping whenever he wanted to. I interviewed Henry Ford shortly before his 80th birthday. I was surprised to see how fresh and fine he looked. I asked him the secret. He said, I never stand up when I can sit down, and I never sit down when I can lie down. Horace Mann, the father of modern education, did the same thing as he grew older. When he was president of Antioch College, he used to stretch out on a couch while interviewing students. I persuaded a motion picture director in Hollywood to try a similar technique. He confessed that it worked miracles. I refer to Jack Chertok, who was one of Hollywood's top directors. When he came to see me several years ago, he was then head of the short feature department of MGM. Worn out and exhausted, he had tried everything, tonics, vitamins, medicine, nothing helped much. I suggested that he take a vacation a day. How? By stretching out in his office and relaxing while holding conferences with his staff writers. When I saw him again, two years later, he said, A miracle has happened. That's what my own physicians call it. I used to sit up in my chair, tense and taut, while discussing ideas for our short features. Now I stretch out on the office couch during these conferences. I feel better than I have felt in twenty years. Work two hours a day longer, yet I rarely get tired. How does all this apply to you? If you're a stenographer, you can't take naps in the office, as Edison did, and as Sam Goldwyn did. And if you're an accountant, you can't stretch out on the couch while discussing a financial statement with the boss. But if you live in a small city and go home for lunch, you may be able to take a ten-minute nap after lunch. That is what General George C. Marshall used to do. He felt he was so busy directing the U.S. Army in wartime that he had to rest at noon. If you're over 50 and feel you're too rushed to do it, then buy immediately all the life insurance you can get. A funerals come high, and suddenly these days, and your spouse may want to take your insurance money and marry a younger person. If you can't take a nap at noon, you can at least try to lie down for an hour before the evening meal. It is cheaper than a cocktail, and over a long stretch it is 5,467 times more effective. If you can sleep for an hour around five, six, or seven o'clock, you can add one hour a day to your waking life. Why? How? Because an hour's nap before the evening meal, plus six hours sleep at night, a total of seven hours, will do you more good than eight hours of unbroken sleep. A physical worker can do more work if he takes more time out for rest. Frederick Taylor demonstrated that while working as a scientific management engineer with the Bethlehem Steel Company. He observed that laboring men were loading approximately twelve and a half tons of pig iron per man each day on freight cars, and they were exhausted at noon. He made a scientific study of all the fatigue factors involved and declared that these men should be loading not twelve and a half tons of pig iron per day, but forty-seven tons per day. He figured that they ought to do almost four times as much as they were doing and not be exhausted. But prove it. Taylor selected a Mr. Schmidt who was required to work by the stopwatch. Schmidt was told by the man who stood over him with a watch, Now pick up a pig and walk. Now sit down and rest. Now walk. Now rest. And what happened? Schmidt carried forty-seven tons of pig iron each day, while the other men carried only twelve and a half tons per man and he practically never failed to work at this pace during the three years that Frederick Taylor was at Bethlehem. Schmidt was able to do this because he rested before he got tired. 
he worked approximately 26 minutes before he got tired. He worked approximately 26 minutes out of the hour and rested 34 minutes. He rested more than he worked, yet he did almost four times as much work as the others. Is this mere hearsay? No, you can read the record yourself on pages 41 through 62 of Principles of Scientific Management by Frederick Winslow Taylor. And let me repeat. Do what the Army does. Take frequent rests. Do what your heart does. Rest before you get tired, and you will add one hour a day to your waking life. Chapter 24 what makes you tired, and what you can do about it. Here's an astounding and significant fact. Mental work alone can't make you tired. It sounds absurd, but a few years ago, scientists tried to find out how long the human brain could labor without reaching a diminished capacity for work, the scientific definition of fatigue. To the amazement of these scientists, they discovered that blood passing through the brain when it's active shows no fatigue at all. If you took blood from the veins of a day laborer while he was working, you would find it full of fatigue toxins and fatigue products. But if you took a drop of blood from the brain of an Albert Einstein, it would show no fatigue toxins whatever at the end of the day. So far as the brain is concerned, it can work as well and as swiftly at the end of eight or even twelve hours of effort as at the beginning. The brain is utterly tireless. So what makes you tired? Psychiatrists declare that most of our fatigue derives from our mental and emotional attitudes. One of England's most distinguished psychiatrists, A.J. Hadfield, says in his book, The Psychology of Power, the greater part of the fatigue from which we suffer is of mental origin. In fact, exhaustion of purely physical origin is rare. One of America's most distinguished psychiatrists, Dr. A. A. Brill, goes even further. He declares 100% of the fatigue of the sedentary worker in good health is due to psychological factors, by which we mean emotional factors. What kinds of emotional factors tire the sedentary or sitting worker? Joy? Commitment? No, never. Boredom? Resentment? The feeling of not being appreciated? A feeling of futility, hurry, anxiety, worry, those are the emotional factors that exhaust the sitting worker, make him susceptible to colds, reduce his output, and send him home with a nervous headache. Yes, we get tired because our emotions produce nervous tensions in the body. The Metropolitan Life Insurance Company pointed that out in a leaflet on fatigue. Hard work by itself, says this great life insurance company, seldom causes fatigue which cannot be cured by a good sleep or rest. Worry, tenseness, and emotional upsets are three of the biggest causes of fatigue. Often they are to blame when physical or mental work seems to be the cause. Remember that a tense muscle is a working muscle. Ease up. Save energy for important duties. Stop now, right where you are, and give yourself a checkup. As you read these lines, are you scowling at the book? Are you sitting relaxed in your chair? Or are you hunching up your shoulders? Are the muscles of your face tense? Unless your entire body is as limp and relaxed as an old rag doll, you are at this very moment producing nervous tensions and muscular tensions. You are producing nervous tensions and nervous fatigue. Why do we produce these unnecessary tensions in doing mental work? Daniel W. Jocelyn says, I find that the chief obstacle is the almost universal belief that hard work requires a feeling of effort, else it is not well done. So we scowl when we concentrate. We hunch up our shoulders. We call on our muscles to make the motion of effort, which in no way assists our brain in its work. Here's an astonishing and tragic truth. Millions of people who wouldn't dream of wasting dollars go right on wasting and squandering their energy with the recklessness of seven drunken sailors in Singapore. What is the answer to this nervous fatigue? Relax, relax, relax. Learn to relax while you're doing your work. Easy? No, you'll probably have to reverse the habits of a lifetime. But it is worth the effort, for it may revolutionize your life.
William James said in his essay, The Gospel of Relaxation, the American overtension and jerkiness and breathlessness and intensity and agony of expression are bad habits, nothing more or less. Tension is a habit. Relaxing is a habit, and bad habits can be broken, good habits formed. How do you relax? Do you start with your mind or do you start with your nerves? Well, you don't start with either. You always begin to relax with your muscles. Well, let's give it a try. To show how it's done, suppose we start with your eyes. Read this paragraph through, and when you've reached the end, lean back, close your eyes, and say to your eyes silently, Let go, let go. Stop straining, stop frowning. Let go, let go. Repeat this over and over, very slowly, for a minute. Didn't you notice that after a few seconds, the muscles of the eyes began to obey? Didn't you feel as though some hand had wiped away the tension? Well, incredible as it seems, you have sampled in that one minute the whole key and secret to the art of relaxing. You can do the same thing with the jaw, with the muscles of the face, with the neck, with the shoulders, the whole of the body. But the most important organ of all is the eye. Dr. Edmund Jacobson of the University of Chicago has gone so far as to say that if you can completely relax the muscles of your eyes, you can forget all your troubles. The reason the eyes are so important in relieving nervous tension is that they burn up one-fourth of all the nervous energies consumed by the body. That is also why so many people with perfectly sound vision suffer from eye strain. They are tensing the eyes. Vicki Baum, the famous novelist, said that when she was a child, she met an old man who taught her one of the most important lessons she ever learned. She had fallen down and cut her knees and hurt her wrist. The old man picked her up. He had once been a circus clown, and as he brushed her off, he said, The reason you injured yourself was because you don't know how to relax. You have to pretend you are as limp as a sock, an old crumpled sock. Come, I'll show you how to do it. That old man taught Vicky Baum and the other children how to fall, how to do flip-flops, and how to turn somersaults. And he always insisted, think of yourself as an old crumpled sock, then you've got to relax. You can relax in odd moments almost anywhere you are. Only don't make an effort to relax. Relaxation is the absence of all tension and effort. Think ease and relaxation. Begin by thinking relaxation of the muscles of your eyes and your face, saying over and over, let go, let go, let go and relax. Feel the energy flowing out of your facial muscles to the center of your body. Think of yourself as free from tension as a baby. That is what Galakurchi, the great soprano, used to do. Helen Jepson told me that she used to see Galakurchi before a performance, sitting in a chair with all her muscles relaxed and her lower jaw so limp it actually sagged. An excellent practice. It kept her from becoming too nervous before her stage entrance. It prevented fatigue. Here are four suggestions that will help you learn to relax. 1. Relax in odd moments. Let your body go limp like an old sock. I keep an old maroon-colored sock on my desk as I work. Keep it there as a reminder of how limp I ought to be. If you haven't got a sock, a cat will do. Did you ever pick up a kitten sleeping in the sunshine? If so, both ends sagged like a wet newspaper. Even the yogis in India say that if you want to master the art of relaxation, study the cat. I never saw a tired cat, a cat with a nervous breakdown, or a cat suffering from insomnia, worry, or stomach ulcers. You will probably avoid these disasters if you learn to relax as the cat does. 2. Work as much as possible in a comfortable position. Remember that tensions in the body produce aching shoulders and nervous fatigue. 3. Check yourself four or five times a day and say to yourself, Am I making my work harder than it actually is? Am I using muscles that have nothing to do with the work I'm doing? This will help you form the habit of relaxing. And as Dr. David Harold Fink says, among those who know psychology best, it is habits two to one. Four, test yourself again at the end of the day by asking yourself, just how tired am I? 
If I am tired, it's not because of the mental work I have done, but because of the way I have done it. I measure my accomplishments, says Daniel W. Jocelyn, not by how tired I am at the end of the day, but how tired I am not. He says, when I feel particularly tired at the end of the day, or when irritability proves that my nerves are tired, I know beyond question that it has been an inefficient day, both as to quantity and quality. If every businessman in America would learn that same lesson, our death rate from hypertension diseases would drop overnight, and we would stop filling up our sanitariums and asylums with people who have been broken by fatigue and worry. Chapter 25. How to Avoid Fatigue and Keep Looking Young One day last autumn, my associate flew up to Boston to attend a session of one of the most unusual medical classes in the world. Medical? Well, yes. It meets once a week at the Boston Dispensary, and the patients who attend it get regular and thorough medical examinations before they're admitted. But actually, this class is a psychological clinic. Although it's officially called a class in applied psychology, formerly the thought control class, a name suggested by the first member, its real purpose is to deal with people who are ill from worry, and many of these patients are emotionally disturbed housewives. How did such a class for worriers get started? Well, in 1930, Dr. Joseph H. Pratt, who, by the way, had been a pupil of Sir William Osler, observed that many of the outpatients who came to the Boston dispensary apparently had nothing wrong with them physically, yet they had practically all the symptoms that flesh is heir to. One woman's hands were so crippled with arthritis that she'd lost all use of them. Another was in agony with all the excruciating symptoms of cancer of the stomach. Others had backaches, headaches, were chronically tired, or had vague aches and pains. They actually felt these pains. But the most exhaustive medical examination showed that nothing whatever was wrong with these people, in the physical sense. Many old-fashioned doctors would have said it was all imagination, all in the mind. But Dr. Pratt realized that it was no use to tell these patients to go home and forget it. He knew that most of these people didn't want to be sick. If it was so easy to forget their ailments, they would do so themselves. So what could be done? He opened this class to a chorus of doubts from the medical doubters on the sidelines, and the class worked wonders. In the years that have passed since it started, thousands of patients have been cured by attending it. Some of the patients have been coming for years, as religious in their attendance as though going to church. My assistant talked to a woman who has hardly missed a session in more than nine years. She said that when she first went to the clinic, she was thoroughly convinced she had a floating kidney and some kind of heart ailment. She was so worried and tense that she occasionally lost her eyesight and had spells of blindness. Yet today she's confident and cheerful and in excellent health. She looked only about forty, yet she held one of her grandchildren asleep in her lap. I used to worry so much about my family troubles, she said, that I wished I could die. But I learned at this clinic the futility of worrying. I learned to stop it. And I can honestly say now that my life is serene. Dr. Rose Hilferding, the medical advisor of the class, said that she thought one of the best remedies for lightening worry is talking your troubles over with someone you trust. We call it catharsis, she said. When our patients come here, they can talk their troubles over at length until they get them off their minds. Brooding over worries alone and keeping them to oneself causes great nervous tension. We all have to share our troubles. We have to share worry. We have to feel there is someone in the world who is willing to listen and able to understand. My assistant witnessed the great relief that came to one woman from talking out her worries. She had domestic worries, and when she first began to talk, she was like a wound-up spring. Then, gradually, as she kept on talking, she began to calm down. At the end of the interview, she was actually smiling. Had the problem been solved? No, it wasn't that easy. What caused the change was talking to someone, getting a little advice and a little human sympathy. What had really worked the change was the tremendous healing value that lies in words. Psychoanalysis is based, to some extent, on this healing power of words. 
Ever since the days of Freud, analysts have known that a patient could find relief from his inner anxieties if he could talk, just talk. Why is this so? Maybe because by talking, we gain a little better insight into our troubles, get a better perspective. No one knows the whole answer, but all of us know that spitting it out or getting it off our chests brings almost instant relief. So the next time we have an emotional problem, why don't we look around for someone to talk to? I don't mean, of course, to go around making pests of ourselves by whining and complaining to everyone in sight. Let's decide on someone we can trust and make an appointment. Maybe a relative, a doctor, a lawyer, a minister or a priest. Then say to that person, I want your advice. I have a problem and I wish you would listen while I put it in words. You may be able to advise me. You may see angles to this thing that I can't see myself. But even if you can't, You'll help me tremendously if you will just sit and listen while I talk it out. Talking things out, then, is one of the principal therapies used at the Boston Dispensary class. But here are some other ideas we picked up at the class, things you can do in your home. 1. Keep a notebook or scrapbook for inspirational reading. Into this book, you can paste all the poems or short prayers or quotations which appeal to you personally and give you a lift. Then, when a rainy afternoon sends your spirits plunging down, perhaps you can find a recipe in this book for dispelling the gloom. Many patients kept such notebooks for years. They said it was a spiritual shot in the arm. 2. Don't dwell too long on the shortcomings of others. One woman at the class who found herself developing into a scolding, nagging, and haggard-faced wife was brought up short with the question, What would you do if your husband died? She was so shocked by the idea that she immediately sat down and drew up a list of all her husband's good points. She made quite a list. Why don't you try the same thing the next time you feel you married a tyrant? Maybe you will find, after reading your spouse's virtues, that he or she is a person you'd like to meet. 3. Get interested in people. Develop a friendly, healthy interest in the people who share your life. One ailing woman who felt herself so exclusive that she hadn't any friends was told to try to make up a story about the next person she met. She began in the bus to weave backgrounds and settings for the people she saw. She tried to imagine what their lives had been like. First thing you know, she was talking to people everywhere, and today she's happy, alert, and a charming human being, cured of her pains. 4. Make up a schedule for tomorrow's work before you go to bed tonight. The class found out that many people feel driven and harassed by the unending round of work and things they must do. They never got their work finished. They were chased by the clock. To cure this sense of hurry and worry, the suggestion was made that they draw up a schedule each night for the following day. What happened? more work was accomplished, much less fatigue, a feeling of pride and achievement, and time left over for rest and enjoyment. 5. Finally avoid tension and fatigue. Relax, relax. Nothing will make you look old sooner than tension and fatigue. Nothing will work such havoc with your freshness and looks. My assistant sat for an hour in the Boston Thought Control class while Professor Paul E. Johnson, the director, went over many of the principles we've already discussed in the previous chapter, the rules for relaxing. At the end of ten minutes of these relaxing exercises, which my assistant did with the others, she was almost asleep sitting upright in her chair. Why is such stress laid on this physical relaxing? Because the clinic knows, as other doctors know, that if you're going to get the worry kinks out of people, they've got to relax. Yes, you have got to relax. Strangely enough, a good hard floor is better to relax on than an inner spring bed. It gives more resistance. It's good for the spine. All right, then. Here are some exercises you can do. Try them for a week and see what you do for your looks and disposition. A. Lie flat on the floor whenever you feel tired. Stretch as tall as you can. Roll around if you want to. Do it twice a day. B. Close your eyes. You might try saying, as Professor Johnson recommended, something like this. The sun is shining overhead. The sky is blue and sparkling. Nature is calm and in control of the world. And I, as nature's child, am in tune with the universe. 
or better still, pray. C. If you cannot lie down because you can't spare the time, then you can achieve almost the same effect sitting down in a chair. A hard, upright chair is the best for relaxing. Sit upright in the chair like a seated Egyptian statue, and let your hands rest, palms down, on the tops of your thighs. D. Now, slowly tense the toes, then let them relax. Tense the muscles in your legs, and let them relax. Do this slowly upward with all the muscles of your body until you get to the neck. Then let your head roll around heavily as though it were a football. Keep saying to your muscles, as in the previous chapter, let go, let go. E. Quiet your nerves with slow, steady breathing. Breathe from deep down. The yogis of India were right. Rhythmical breathing is one of the best methods ever discovered for soothing the nerves. F. Think of all the wrinkles and frowns in your face, and smooth them all out. Loosen up the worry creases you feel between your brows and at the sides of your mouth. Do this twice a day, and maybe you won't have to go to a health club to get a massage. Maybe the lines will disappear from the inside out. Chapter 26 Four Good Working Habits That Will Help Prevent Fatigue and Worry Good working habit number one. Clear your desk of all papers except those relating to the immediate problem at hand. Roland L. Williams, president of Chicago and Northwestern Railway, once said, A person with his desk piled high with papers on various matters will find his work much easier and more accurate if he clears that desk of all but the immediate problem on hand. I call this good housekeeping, and it's the number one step toward efficiency. If you visit the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C., you will find five words painted on the ceiling, five words written by the poet Pope. Order is heaven's first law. Order ought to be the first law of business, too. But is it? No. The average desk is cluttered up with papers that haven't been looked at for weeks. In fact, the publisher of a New Orleans newspaper once told me that his secretary cleared up one of his desks and found a typewriter that had been missing for two years. The mere sight of a desk littered with unanswered mail and reports and memos is enough to breed confusion, tensions, and worries. It is much worse than that. The constant reminder of a million things to do and no time to do them can worry you not only into tension and fatigue, but it can also worry you into high blood pressure, heart trouble, and stomach ulcers. Dr. John H. Stokes, professor, Graduate School of Medicine, University of Pennsylvania, read a paper before the National Convention of the American Medical Association, a paper entitled, Functional Neuroses as Complications of Organic Disease. In that paper, Dr. Stokes listed 11 conditions under the title, What to Look for in the Patient's State of Mind. Now, here's the first item on that list. The sense of must or obligation, the unending stretch of things ahead that simply have to be done. But how can such an elementary procedure as clearing your desk and making decisions help you avoid this high pressure, this sense of must, this sense of an unending stretch of things ahead that simply have to be done? Dr. William L. Sadler, the famous psychiatrist, told of a patient who, by using this simple device, avoided a nervous breakdown. The man was an executive in a big Chicago firm. When he came to Dr. Sadler's office, he was tense, nervous, worried. He knew he was heading for a tailspin, but he couldn't quit work. He had to have help. While this man was telling me his story, Dr. Sadler says, my telephone rang. It was the hospital calling. And instead of deferring the matter, I took time right then to come to a decision. I always settle questions, if possible, right on the spot. I had no sooner hung up than the phone rang again. Again, an urgent matter, which I took time to discuss. The third interruption came when a colleague of mine came into my office for advice on a patient who was critically ill. When I'd finished with him, I turned to my caller and began to apologize for keeping him waiting. But he'd brightened up. He had a completely different look on his face. Don't apologize, doctor, this man said to Sadler. In the last ten minutes, I think I've got a hunch as to what's wrong with me. I'm going back to my office and revise my working habits. But before I go, do you mind if I take a look in your desk? 
Dr. Sadler opened up the drawers of his desk, all empty except for supplies. Tell me, said the patient, where do you keep your unfinished business? Finished, said Sadler. And where do you keep your unanswered mail? Answered, Sadler told him. My rule is never to lay down a letter until I've answered it. I dictate the reply to my secretary at once. Six weeks later, this same executive invited Dr. Sadler to come to his office. He was changed, and so was his desk. He opened the desk drawers to show that there was no unfinished business inside of the desk. Six weeks ago, this executive said, I had three different desks in two different offices and was snowed under by my work. I was never finished. After talking to you, I came back here and cleared out a wagon load of reports and old papers. Now I work at one desk, settle things as they come up, and don't have a mountain of unfinished business nagging me and making me tense and worried. But the most astonishing thing is I've recovered completely. There's nothing wrong any more with my health. Charles Evans Hughes, former Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court, said, Men do not die from overwork. They die from dissipation and worry. Yes, from dissipation of their energies and worry because they never seem to get their work done. Good working habit number two. Do things in the order of their importance. Henry L. Doherty founder of the nationwide Cities Service Company, said that regardless of how much salary he paid, there were two abilities he found it almost impossible to find. Those two priceless abilities? First, the ability to think. Second, the ability to do things in the order of their importance. Charles Luckman, the land who started from scratch and climbed in 12 years to president of the Pepsodent Company, got a salary of $100,000 a year and made a million dollars besides. That lad declared that he owed much of his success to developing the two abilities that Henry L. Doherty said he found almost impossible to find. Charles Luckman said, As far back as I can remember, I have gotten up at five o'clock in the morning because I can think better then than at any other time. I can think better then and plan my day, plan to do things in the order of their importance. Frank Betker, one of America's most successful insurance salesmen, didn't wait until 5 o'clock in the morning to plan his day. He planned it the night before, set a goal for himself, a goal to sell a certain amount of insurance that day. If he failed, that amount was added to the next day, and so on. I know from long experience that one is not always able to do things in the order of their importance, but I also know that some kind of plan to do first things first is infinitely better than extemporizing as you go along. If George Bernard Shaw had not made it a rigid rule to do first things first, he would probably have failed as a writer and might have remained a bank cashier all his life. His plan called for writing five pages each day. That plan inspired him to go right on writing five pages a day for nine heartbreaking years, even though he made a total of only thirty dollars in those nine years, about a penny a day. Even Robinson Crusoe wrote out a schedule of what he would do each hour of the day. Good working habit number three. When you face a problem, Solve it then and there if you have the facts necessary to make a decision. Don't keep putting off decisions. One of my former students, the late H. P. Howell, told me that when he was a member of the board of directors of U.S. Steel, the meetings of the board were often long, drawn-out affairs. Many problems were discussed. Few decisions were made. The result? Each member of the board had to carry home bundles of reports to study. Finally, Mr. Howell persuaded the board of directors to take up one problem at a time and come to a decision. No procrastination, no putting off. The decision might be to ask for additional facts. It might be to do something or do nothing. But a decision was reached on each problem before passing on to the next. Mr. Howell told me that the results were striking and salutary. The docket was cleared. The calendar was clean. No longer was it necessary for each member to carry home a bundle of reports. No longer was there a worried sense of unresolved problems. A good rule, not only for the board of directors of U.S. Steel, but for you and me. Good working habit number four. Learn to organize, deputize, and supervise. 
Many business persons are driving themselves to premature graves because they've never learned to delegate responsibility to others, insisting on doing everything themselves. Result? Details and confusion overwhelm them. They're driven by a sense of hurry, worry, anxiety, and tension. It is hard to learn to delegate responsibilities. I know. It was hard for me, awfully hard. I also know from experience the disasters that can be caused by delegating authority to the wrong people. But difficult as it is to delegate authority, executives must do it if they are to avoid worry, tension, and fatigue. Executives who build up big businesses and don't learn to organize, deputize, and supervise usually pop off with heart trouble in their 50s or early 60s, heart trouble caused by tension and worries. Want a specific instance? Look at the death notices in your local paper. Chapter 28 How to Keep from Worrying About Insomnia Do you worry when you can't sleep well? Then it may interest you to know that Samuel Untermeyer, the famous international lawyer, never got a decent night's sleep in his life. When Sam Untermeyer went to college, he worried about two afflictions, asthma and insomnia. He couldn't seem to cure either, so he decided to do the next best thing, take advantage of his wakefulness. Instead of tossing and turning and worrying himself into a breakdown, he'd get up and study. The result? He began ticking off honors in all of his classes and became one of the prodigies of the College of the City of New York. Even after he started to practice law, his insomnia continued, but Artemeyer didn't worry. Nature, he said, will take care of me. And nature did. In spite of the small amount of sleep he was getting, his health kept up and he was able to work as hard as any of the young lawyers of the New York bar. He even worked harder, for he worked while they slept. At the age of 21, Sam Untermeyer was earning $75,000 a year, and other young attorneys rushed to courtrooms to study his methods. In 1931, he was paid for handling one case, what was at that time probably the highest lawyer's fee ever paid, a cool million dollars cash on the barrel head. Still, he had insomnia, read half the night, then got up at 5 a.m. and started dictating letters. By the time most people were just starting work, his day's work would be almost half done. He lived to the age of 81, this man who had rarely had a sound night's sleep. But if he fretted and worried about his insomnia, he probably would have wrecked his life. We spend a third of our lives sleeping, yet nobody knows what sleep really is. We know it's a habit and a state of rest in which nature knits up the raveled sleeve of care, but we don't know how many hours of sleep each individual requires. We don't even know if we have to sleep at all. Fantastic. Well, during the First World War, Paul Kern, a Hungarian soldier, was shot through the frontal lobe of his brain. He recovered from the wound, but curiously enough, he couldn't fall asleep. No matter what the doctors did, and they tried all kinds of sedatives and narcotics, even hypnotism, Paul Kern couldn't be put to sleep or even made to feel drowsy. The doctors said he wouldn't live long, but he fooled them. He got a job and went on living in the best of health for years. He would lie down and close his eyes and rest, but he got no sleep whatever. His case was a medical mystery that upset many of our beliefs about sleep. Some people require far more sleep than others. Toscanini needed only five hours a night, but Calvin Coolidge needed more than twice that much. Coolidge slept 11 hours out of every 24. In other words, Toscanini slept away approximately one-fifth of his life, while Coolidge slept away almost half of his life. Worrying about insomnia will hurt you far more than insomnia. For example, one of my students, Ira Sandner of Ridgefield Park, New Jersey, was driven nearly to suicide by chronic insomnia. I actually thought I was going insane, Ira Sandner told me. The trouble was, in the beginning, that I was too sound a sleeper. I wouldn't wake up when the alarm clock went off, and the result was that I was getting to work late in the morning. I worried about it, and in fact my boss warned me that I would have to get to work on time. I knew that if I kept oversleeping, I'd lose my job. I told my friends about it, and one of them suggested I concentrate hard on the alarm clock before I went to sleep. That started the insomnia. 
The tick, tick, tick of that blasted alarm clock became an obsession. It kept me awake, tossing all night long. When morning came, I was almost ill. I was ill from fatigue and worry. This kept on for eight weeks. I can't put into words the tortures I suffered. I was convinced I was going insane. Sometimes I paced the floor for hours at a time, and I honestly considered jumping out of the window and ending the whole thing. At last I went to a doctor I had known all my life. He said, Ira, I can't help you. No one can help you, because you've brought this thing on yourself. Go to bed nights, and if you can't fall asleep, forget all about it. Just say to yourself, I don't care a hang if I don't go to sleep. It's all right with me if I lie awake till morning. Keep your eyes closed and say, As long as I just lie still and don't worry about it, I'll be getting rest anyway. I did that, says Santner, and in two weeks' time I was dropping off to sleep. In less than one month I was sleeping eight hours, and my nerves were back to normal. It wasn't insomnia that was killing Ira Sandner. It was his worry about it. Dr. Nathaniel Kleitman, professor at the University of Chicago, had done more research work on sleep than had any other living man. An expert on sleep, he declared that he had never known anyone to die from insomnia. To be sure, a man might worry about insomnia until he lowered his vitality and was swept away by germs, but it was the worry that did the damage, not the insomnia itself. Dr. Kleitman also said that the people who worry about insomnia usually sleep far more than they realize. The man who swears, I never slept a wink last night, may have slept for hours without knowing it. For example, one of the most profound thinkers of the 19th century, Herbert Spencer, was an old bachelor, lived in a boarding house, and bored everyone with his talk about his insomnia. He even put stoppings in his ears to keep out the noise and quiet his nerves. Sometimes he took opium to induce sleep. Now, one night, he and Professor Sacy of Oxford shared the same room at a hotel, and the next morning Spencer declared he hadn't slept a wink all night. In reality, it was Professor Sacy who hadn't slept a wink. He'd been kept awake all night by Spencer's snoring. The first requisite for a good night's sleep is a feeling of security. We need to feel that some power greater than ourselves will take care of us until morning. Dr. Thomas Hyslop of the Great West Riding Asylum stressed that point in an address before the British Medical Association. He said, One of the best sleep-producing agents which my years of practice have revealed to me is prayer. I say this purely as a medical man. The exercise of prayer in those who habitually exert it must be regarded as the most adequate and normal of all the pacifiers of the mind and calmer of the nerves. Let God and let go. Jeanette MacDonald told me that when she was depressed and worried and had difficulty in going to sleep, she could always get a feeling of security by repeating Psalm 23, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. But if you're not religious and have to do things the hard way, then learn to relax by physical measures. Dr. David Harold Fink, who wrote Release from Nervous Tension, says that the best way to do this is to talk to your body. According to Dr. Fink, words are the key to all kinds of hypnosis, and when you consistently can't sleep, it's because you've talked yourself into a case of insomnia. The way to undo this is to dehypnotize yourself, and you can do it by saying to the muscles of your body, let go, let go, loosen up and relax. We already know that the mind and the nerves can't relax while the muscles are tense, so if we want to go to sleep, we start with the muscles. Dr. Fink recommends, and it works out in practice, that we put a pillow under the knees to ease the tension of the legs, and that we tuck small pillows under arms for the very same reason. Then, by telling the jaw to relax, the eyes, the arms, and the legs, we finally drop off to sleep before we know what's hit us. I've tried it, I know. One of the best cures for insomnia is making yourself physically tired by gardening, swimming, tennis, golf, skiing, or just plain physically exhausting work. That's what Theodore Dreiser did. When he was a struggling young author, he was worried about insomnia, so he got a job working as a section hand on the New York Central Railway. 
and after a day of driving spikes and shoveling gravel, he was so exhausted that he could hardly stay awake long enough to eat. If we get tired enough, nature will force us to sleep, even while we're walking. To illustrate, when I was thirteen years old, my father shipped a carload of fat hogs to St. Joe, Missouri. Since he got two free railroad passes, he took me along with him. Up until that time, I had never seen a town of more than four thousand. When I landed in St. Joe, a city of sixty thousand, I was so agog with excitement. I saw a skyscraper six stories high, and wonder of wonders, I saw a streetcar. I can close my eyes now and still see and hear that streetcar. After the most thrilling and exciting day of my life, Father and I took a train back to Ravenwood, Missouri. Arriving there at two o'clock in the morning, we had to walk four miles home to the farm. And here's the point of the story. I was so exhausted that I slept and dreamed as I walked. I've often slept while riding horseback, and I'm alive to tell it. When men are completely exhausted, they sleep right through the thunder and horror and danger of war. Dr. Foster Kennedy, the famous neurologist, tells me that during the retreat of the 5th British Army in 1918, he saw soldiers so exhausted that they fell on the ground where they were and fell into a sleep as sound as a coma, and they didn't even wake up when he raised their eyelids with his fingers. And he says he noticed that invariably the pupils of the eyes were rolled upward in the sockets. After that, says Dr. Kennedy, when I had trouble sleeping, I would practice rolling up my eyeballs into this position, and I found that in a few seconds I would begin to yawn and feel sleepy. It was an automatic reflex over which I had no control. No man ever committed suicide by refusing to sleep, and no one ever will. Nature would force a man to sleep in spite of all his willpower. Nature will let us go without food or water far longer than she will let us go without sleep. And speaking of suicide reminds me of a case that Dr. Henry C. Link describes in his book, The Rediscovery of Man. Dr. Link was vice president of the Psychological Corporation, and he interviewed many people who were worried and depressed. In his chapter on overcoming fears and worries, he tells about a patient who wanted to commit suicide. Dr. Link knew arguing would only make the matter worse, so he said to this man, If you're going to commit suicide anyway, you might at least do it in a heroic fashion. Run around the block until you drop dead. He tried it, not once, but several times, and each time felt better in his mind, if not in his muscles. By the third night, he had achieved what Dr. Link intended in the first place. He was so physically tired and physically relaxed that he slept like a log. Later he joined an athletic club and began to compete in competitive sport. Soon he was feeling so good he wanted to live forever. So, to keep from worrying about insomnia, here are five rules. 1. If you can't sleep, do what Samuel Untermeyer did. Get up and work or read until you do feel sleepy. 2. Remember that no one was ever killed by lack of sleep. Worrying about insomnia usually causes far more damage than sleeplessness. 3. Try prayer, or repeat Psalm 23, as Jeanette MacDonald did. 4. Relax your body. 5. Exercise. Get yourself so physically tired you can't stay awake. Part 7 in a Nutshell Six Ways to Prevent Fatigue and Worry and keep your energy and spirits high. Rule 1. Rest before you get tired. Rule 2. Learn to relax at your work. Rule 3. Learn to relax at home. Rule 4. Apply these four good working habits. A. Clear your desk of all papers except those relating to the immediate problem at hand. B. Do things in the order of their importance. C. When you face a problem, solve it, then and there, if you have the facts necessary to make a decision. D. Learn to organize, deputize, and supervise. Rule 5. To prevent worry and fatigue, put enthusiasm into your work. Rule 6. Remember, no one was ever killed by lack of sleep. It is worrying about insomnia that does the damage, not the insomnia.
Part 8, How I Conquered Worry, 31 True Stories. Six Major Troubles Hit Me All at Once, by C.I. Blackwood. In the summer of 1943, it seemed to me that half the worries of the world had come to rest on my shoulders. For more than 40 years, I had lived a normal, carefree life with only the usual troubles which come to a husband, father, and businessman. I could usually meet these troubles easily, but suddenly, wham, 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 six major troubles hit me all at once. I pitched and tossed and turned in bed all night long, half dreading to see the day come, because I faced these six major worries. One, my business college was trembling on the verge of financial disaster because all the boys were going to war and most of the girls were making more money working in war plants without training than my graduates could make in business offices with training. Two, my older son was in service and I had the heart-numbing worry common to all parents whose sons were away at war. Three, Oklahoma City had already started proceedings to condemn a large tract of land for an airport, and my home, formerly my father's home, was located in the center of this tract. I knew that I would be paid only one-tenth of its value, and what was even worse, I would lose my home, and because of the housing shortage, I worried about whether I could possibly find another home to shelter my family of six. I feared we might have to live in a tent. I even worried about whether we would be able to buy a tent. Four, the water well on my property went dry because a drainage canal had been dug near my home. To dig a new well would be throwing $500 away because the land was already being condemned. I had to carry water to my livestock in buckets every morning for two months, and I feared I would have to continue it during the rest of the war. Five, I lived 10 miles away from my business school, and I had a Class B gasoline card. That meant I couldn't buy any new tires, so I worried about how I could ever get to work when the superannuated tires on my old Ford gave up the ghost. Six, my eldest daughter had graduated from high school a year ahead of schedule. She had her heart set on going to college, and I just didn't have the money to send her. I knew her heart would be broken. And one afternoon, Sitting in my office, worrying about my worries, I decided to write them all down, for it seemed no one ever had more worries than I had. I didn't mind wrestling with worries that gave me a fighting chance to solve them, but these worries all seemed to be utterly beyond my control. I could do nothing to solve them. So I filed away this typewritten list of my troubles, and as the months passed, I forgot that I'd ever written it. Eighteen months later, while transferring my files, I happened to come across this list of my six major problems that had once threatened to wreck my health. I read them with a great deal of interest and profit. I now saw that not one of them had come to pass. Now here's what happened to them. One, I saw that all my worries about having to close my business college had been useless because the government had started paying business schools for training veterans, and my school was soon filled to capacity. Two, I saw that all my worries about my son in service had been useless. He was coming through the war without a scratch. Three, I saw that all my worries about my land being condemned had been useless, because as soon as I knew my land would not be condemned, I spent the money necessary to dig a new well to a deeper level and found an unfailing supply of water. Five, I saw that all my worries about my tires giving out had been useless, because by recapping and careful driving, the tires had managed somehow to survive. Six, I saw that all my worries about my daughter's education had been useless, because just 60 days before the opening of college, I was offered, almost like a miracle, an auditing job which I could do outside of school hours, and this job made it possible for me to send her to college on schedule. I'd often heard people say that 90% of the things we worry and stew and fret about never happen, but this old saying didn't mean much to me until I ran across that list of worries I'd typed out that dreary afternoon 18 months previously. I'm thankful now that I had to wrestle in vain with those six terrible worries. That experience has taught me a lesson I'll never forget. It's shown me the folly and tragedy of stewing about events that haven't happened, events that are beyond our control and may never happen. 
Remember, today is the tomorrow you worried about yesterday. Ask yourself, how do I know this thing I'm worrying about will really come to pass? I can turn myself into a shouting optimist within an hour by Roger W. Babson, famous economist. When I find myself depressed over present conditions, I can, within one hour, banish worry and turn myself into a shouting optimist. Here is how I do it. I enter my library, close my eyes, and walk to certain shelves containing only books on history. With my eyes still shut, I reach for a book, not knowing whether I am picking up Prescott's Conquest of Mexico or Suetonius' Lives of the Twelve Caesars. With my eyes still closed, I open the book at random. I then open my eyes and read for an hour, and the more I read, the more sharply I realize that the world has always been in the throes of agony, that civilization has always been tottering on the brink. The pages of history fairly shriek with tragic tales of war, famine, poverty, pestilence, and man's inhumanity to man. After reading history for an hour, I realize that bad as conditions are now, they are infinitely better than they used to be. This enables me to see and face my present troubles in their proper perspective, as well as to realize that the world as a whole is constantly growing better. Here is a method that deserves a whole chapter. Read history. Try to get the viewpoint of 10,000 years and see how trivial your troubles are in terms of eternity. How I Got Rid of an Inferiority Complex by Elmer Thomas, former United States Senator from Oklahoma. When I was 15, I was constantly tormented by worries and fears and self-consciousness. I was extremely tall for my age and thin as a fence rail. I stood 6 feet 2 inches and weighed only 118 pounds. In spite of my height, I was weak and could never compete with the other boys in baseball or running games. They poked fun at me and called me hatchet face. I was so worried and self-conscious that I dreaded to meet anyone and I seldom did, for our farmhouse was off the public road and surrounded by thick virgin timber that had never been cut since the beginning of time. We lived half a mile from the highway, and a week would often go by without my seeing anyone except my mother, father, brothers, and sisters. I would have been a failure in life if I'd let those worries and fears whip me. Every day and every hour of the day, I brooded over my tall, gaunt, weak body, I could hardly think of anything else. My embarrassment, my fear was so intense that it's almost impossible to describe it. My mother knew how I felt. She'd been a school teacher, so she said to me, Son, you ought to get an education. You ought to make your living with your mind because your body will always be a handicap. Since my parents were unable to send me to college, I knew I'd have to make my own way. So I hunted and trapped a possum, skunk, mink, and raccoon one winter, sold my hides for four dollars in the spring, then bought two little pigs with my four dollars. I fed the pigs slop and later corn and sold them for forty dollars the next fall. With the proceeds from the sale of the two hogs, I went away to the Central Normal College, located in Danville, Indiana. I paid a dollar and forty cents a week for my board, fifty cents a week for my room. I wore a brown shirt my mother had made me. Obviously, she used brown cloth because it wouldn't show dirt. I wore a suit of clothes that had once belonged to my father. The dad's clothes didn't fit me, and neither did his old Congress gaiter shoes that I wore, shoes that had elastic bands in the sides that stretched when you put them on. The stretch had long since gone out of the bands, and the tops were so loose the shoes almost dropped off my feet as I walked. I was so embarrassed to associate with the other students, so I sat in my room alone and studied. The deepest desire of my life was to be able to buy some store clothes that fit me, clothes that I was not ashamed of. Now, shortly after that, four events happened that helped me to overcome my worries and my feeling of inferiority. One of these events gave me courage and hope and confidence and completely changed all the rest of my life. Now, I'll describe these events briefly. 
First, after attending this normal school for only eight weeks, I took an examination and was given a third grade certificate to teach in the country public schools. To be sure, this certificate was good for only six months, but it was fleeting evidence that somebody had faith in me. The first evidence of faith that I had ever had from anyone except my mother. The second, a country school board at a place called Happy Hollow hired me to teach at a salary of $2 a day or $40 a month. And here was even more evidence of somebody's faith in me. Third, as soon as I got my first check, I bought some store clothes, clothes that I wasn't ashamed to wear. If someone gave me a million dollars now, it wouldn't thrill me half as much as that first suit of clothes for which I paid only a few dollars. The fourth, the real turning point in my life, the first great victory in my struggle against embarrassment and inferiority, occurred at the Putnam County Fair, held annually in Bainbridge, Indiana. My mother had urged me to enter a public speaking contest that was to be held at the fair. To me, the very idea seemed fantastic. I didn't have the courage to talk to even one person, let alone a crowd. But my mother's faith in me was almost pathetic. She dreamed great dreams for my future. She was living her own life over in her son. Her faith inspired me to enter the contest. I chose for my subject about the last thing in the world that I was qualified to talk on, the fine and liberal arts of America. Frankly, when I began to prepare the speech, I didn't know what the liberal arts were, but it didn't matter much because my audience didn't know either. I memorized my flowery talk and rehearsed it to the trees and cows a hundred times. I was so eager to make a good showing for my mother's sake that I must have spoken with emotion. At any rate, I was awarded first prize. I was astounded at what happened. A cheer went up from the crowd. The very boys who'd once ridiculed me and poked fun at me and called me hatchet face now slapped me on the back and said, I knew you could do it, Elmer. My mother put her arms around me and sobbed. As I look back in retrospect, I can see that winning that speaking contest was the turning point of my life. The local newspapers ran an article about me on the front page and prophesied great things for my future. Winning that contest put me on the map locally and gave me prestige, and what's far more important, it multiplied my confidence a hundredfold. I now realize that if I'd not won that contest, I probably would never have become a member of the United States Senate, for it lifted my sights, widened my horizons, and made me realize that I had latent abilities that I never dreamed I possessed. Most important, however, was the fact that the first prize in the oratorical contest was a year's scholarship in the Central Normal College. I hungered now for more education, so during the next few years, from 1896 to 1900, I divided my time between teaching and studying. In order to pay my expenses at DePaul University, I waited on tables, looked after furnaces, mowed lawns, kept books, worked in the wheat and cornfields during the summer, and hauled gravel on a public road construction job. In 1896, when I was only 19, I made 28 speeches urging people to vote for William Jennings Bryan for president. The excitement of speaking for Bryan aroused a desire in me to enter politics myself. So when I entered DePaul University, I studied law and public speaking. In 1899, I represented the university in a debate with Butler College held in Indianapolis on the subject, resolved that United States senators should be elected by popular vote. Well, I won other speaking contests and became editor-in-chief of the class of 1900 college annual, The Mirage, and the university paper, The Palladium. After receiving my A.B. degree at DePauw, I took Horace Greeley's advice, only I didn't go west, I went southwest. I went down to a new country, Oklahoma, when the Kiowa, Comanche, and Apache Indian Reservation was opened. I homesteaded a claim and opened a law office in Lawton, Oklahoma. I served in the Oklahoma State Senate for 13 years, in the lower house of Congress for four years, and at 50 years of age I achieved my lifelong ambition. I was elected to the United States Senate from Oklahoma. I've served in that capacity since March 4, 1927. 
Since Oklahoma and Indian Territories became the state of Oklahoma on November 16, 1907, I have been continuously honored by the Democrats of my adopted state by nominations, first for State Senate and for Congress, and later for the United States Senate. I've told this story not to brag about my own feeling of accomplishment, which can't possibly interest anyone else. I've told it wholly with the hope that it may give renewed courage and confidence to some poor boy who's now suffering from the worries and shyness and feeling of inferiority that devastated my life when I was wearing my father's cast-off clothes and gaiter shoes that almost dropped off my feet as I walked. It's interesting to know that Elmer Thomas, who was so ashamed of his ill-fitting clothes as a youth, was later voted the best-dressed man in the United States Senate. I Lived in the Garden of Allah by R. V. C. Bodley, descendant of Sir Thomas Bodley, founder of the Bodleian Library, Oxford, author of Wind in the Sahara, The Messenger, and 14 other volumes. In 1918, I turned my back on the world I had known and went to northwest Africa and lived with the Arabs in the Sahara, the Garden of Allah. I lived there seven years. I learned to speak the language of the nomads. I wore their clothes, I ate their food, and adopted their mode of life, which has changed very little during the last twenty centuries. I became an owner of sheep and slept on the ground in the Arabs' tents. I also made a detailed study of their religion. In fact, I later wrote a book about Muhammad entitled The Messenger. Those seven years which I spent with these wandering shepherds were the most peaceful and contented years of my life. I had already had a rich and varied experience. I was born of English parents in Paris and lived in France for nine years. Later I was educated at Eton and at the Royal Military College at Sandhurst. Then I spent six years as a British Army officer in India, where I played polo and hunted and explored in the Himalayas, as well as doing some soldiering. I fought through the First World War, and at its close I was sent to the Paris Peace Conference as an assistant military attaché. I was shocked and disappointed at what I saw there. During the four years of slaughter on the Western Front, I had believed we were fighting to save civilization. But at the Paris Peace Conference, I saw selfish politicians laying the groundwork for the Second World War, each country grabbing all it could for itself, creating national antagonisms, and reviving the intrigues of secret diplomacy. I was sick of war, sick of the army, sick of society. For the first time in my career, I spent sleepless nights worrying about what I should do with my life. Lloyd George urged me to go in for politics. I was considering taking his advice when a strange thing happened, a strange thing that shaped and determined my life for the next seven years. It all came from a conversation with Ted Lawrence, Lawrence of Arabia, the most colorful and romantic figure produced by the First World War. He had lived in the desert with the Arabs, and he advised me to do the same thing. At first it sounded fantastic. However, I was determined to leave the army, and I had to do something. Civilian employers did not want to hire men like me, ex-officers of the regular army, especially when the labor market was jammed with millions of unemployed. So I did as Lawrence suggested. I went to live with the Arabs. I am glad I did so. They taught me how to conquer worry. Like all faithful Muslims, they are fatalists. They believe that every word which Muhammad wrote in the Quran is the divine revelation of Allah. So when the Quran says, God created you and all your actions, they accept it literally. That is why they take life so calmly and never hurry or get into unnecessary tempers when things go wrong. They know that what is ordained is ordained, and no one but God can alter anything. However, that doesn't mean that in the face of disaster they sit down and do nothing. To illustrate, let me tell you of a fierce burning windstorm of the Shiraco which I experienced when I was living in the Sahara. It howled and screamed for three days and nights. It was so strong, so fierce, that it blew sand from the Sahara hundreds of miles across the Mediterranean and sprinkled it over the Rhone Valley in France. The wind was so hot, I felt as if the hair was being scorched off my head. 
My throat was parched, my eyes burned, my teeth were full of grit. I felt as if I were standing in front of a furnace at a glass factory. I was driven as near crazy as a man can be and retain his sanity, but the Arabs didn't complain. They shrugged their shoulders and said, Maktoub, it is written. But immediately after the storm was over, they sprang into action. They slaughtered all the lambs because they knew they would die anyway, and by slaughtering them at once, they hoped to save the mother sheep. After the lambs were slaughtered, the flocks were driven southward to water. This was all done calmly, without worry or complaining, or mourning over their losses. The tribal chief said, It is not too bad. We might have lost everything, but, praise God, we have forty percent of our sheep left to make a new start. I remember another occasion when we were motoring across the desert and a tire blew out. The chauffeur had forgotten to mend the spare tire, so there we were with only three tires. I fussed and fumed and got excited and asked the Arabs what we were going to do. They reminded me that getting excited wouldn't help, that it only made one hotter. The blown-out tire, they said, was the will of Allah, and nothing could be done about it. So we started on, crawling along on the rim of a wheel. Presently the car sputtered and stopped. We were out of gas. The chief merely remarked, Maktoub, and there again, instead of shouting at the driver because he had not taken on enough gas, everyone remained calm, and we walked to our destination, singing as we went. The seven years I spent with the Arabs convinced me that the neurotics, the insane, the drunks of America and Europe, are the product of the hurried and harassed lives we live in our so-called civilization. As long as I lived in the Sahara, I had no worries. I found there, in the Garden of Allah, the serene contentment and physical well-being that so many of us are seeking with tenseness and despair. Many people scoff at fatalism. Maybe they're right, who knows? But all of us must be able to see how our fates are often determined for us. For example, if I had not spoken to Lawrence of Arabia at three minutes past noon on a hot August day in 1919, all the years that have elapsed since then would have been completely different. Looking back over my life, I can see how it has been shaped and molded time and again by events far beyond my control. The Arabs call it Mektub, Kismet, the will of Allah. Call it anything you wish. It does strange things to you. I only know that today, seventeen years after leaving the Sahara, I still maintain that happy resignation to the inevitable which I learned from the Arabs. That philosophy has done more to settle my nerves than a thousand sedatives could have achieved. When the fierce burning winds blow over our lives, and we cannot prevent them, let us too accept the inevitable, and then get busy and pick up the pieces. Five Methods I Have Used to Banish Worry by Professor William Lyon Phelps I had the privilege of spending an afternoon with Billy Phelps of Yale shortly before his death. Now here are the five methods he used to banish worry based on the notes I took during that interview. And number one, when I was 24 years old, my eyes suddenly gave out. After reading three or four minutes, my eyes felt as if they were full of needles. And even when I was not reading, they were so sensitive that I could not face a window. I consulted the best oculist in New Haven and New York. Nothing seemed to help me. After four o'clock in the afternoon, I simply sat in a chair in the darkest corner of the room, waiting for bedtime. I was terrified. I feared that I would have to give up my career as a teacher and go out west and get a job as a lumberjack. Then a strange thing happened, which shows the miraculous effects of the mind over physical ailments. When my eyes were at their worst that unhappy winter, I accepted an invitation to address a group of undergraduates. The hall was illuminated by huge rings of gas jets suspended from the ceiling. The lights pained my eyes so intensely that while sitting on the platform I was compelled to look at the floor. Yet during my thirty-minute speech I felt absolutely no pain, and I could look directly at these lights without any blinking whatever. Then, when the assembly was over, my eyes pained me again. 
I thought then that if I could keep my mind strongly concentrated on something, not for thirty minutes, but for a week, I might be cured. For clearly, it was a case of mental excitement triumphing over a bodily illness. I had a similar experience later, while crossing the ocean. I had an attack of lumbago so severe that I could not walk. I suffered extreme pain when I tried to stand up straight. While in that condition, I was invited to give a lecture on shipboard. As soon as I began to speak, every trace of pain and stiffness left my body. I stood up straight, moved about with perfect flexibility, and spoke for an hour. When the lecture was over, I walked away to my stateroom with ease. For a moment I thought I was cured, but the cure was only temporary. The lumbago resumed its attack. These experiences demonstrated to me the vital importance of one's mental attitude. They taught me the importance of enjoying life while you may. So I live every day now as if it were the first day I had ever seen and the last I were going to see. I am excited about the daily adventure of living, and nobody in a state of excitement will be unduly troubled with worries. I love my daily work as a teacher. I wrote a book entitled The Excitement of Teaching. Teaching has always been more than an art or an occupation to me. It is a passion. I love to teach as a painter loves to paint or a singer loves to sing. Before I get out of bed in the morning, I think with ardent delight of my first group of students. I have always felt that one of the chief reasons for success in life is enthusiasm. Number two, I have found that I can crowd worry out of my mind by reading an absorbing book. When I was fifty-nine, I had a prolonged nervous breakdown. During that period, I began reading David Alec Wilson's monumental Life of Carlyle. It had a good deal to do with my convalescence because I became so absorbed in reading it that I forgot my despondency. Number three. At another time, when I was terribly depressed, I forced myself to become physically active almost every hour of the day. I played five or six sets of violent games of tennis every morning, then took a bath, had lunch, played eighteen holes of golf every afternoon. On Friday nights I danced until one o'clock in the morning. I am a great believer in working up a tremendous sweat. I found that depression and worry oozed out of my system with the sweat. Number four, I learned long ago to avoid the folly of hurry, rush, and working under tension. I have always tried to apply the philosophy of Wilbur Cross. When he was governor of Connecticut, he said to me, Sometimes when I have too many things to do all at once, I sit down and relax and smoke my pipe for an hour and do nothing. Number five, I have also learned that patience and time have a way of resolving our troubles. When I'm worried about something, I try to see my troubles in their proper perspective. I say to myself, two months from now I shall not be worrying about this bad break, so why worry about it now? Why not assume now the same attitude that I will have two months from now? To sum up, here are the five ways in which Professor Phelps banished worry. 1. Live with gusto and enthusiasm. I live every day as if it were the first day I have ever seen and the last I were going to see. 2. Read an interesting book. When I had a prolonged nervous breakdown, I began reading The Life of Carlyle, and became so absorbed in reading that I forgot my despondency. 3. Play games. When I was terribly depressed, I forced myself to become physically active almost every hour of the day. 4. Relax while you work. I long ago learned to avoid the folly of hurry, rush, and working under tension. 5. I try to see my troubles in their proper perspective. I say to myself, two months from now I shall not be worrying about this bad break, so why worry about it now? Why not assume now the same attitude that I will have two months from now? I Stood Yesterday, I Can Stand Today by Dorothy Dix. I've been through the depths of poverty and sickness. When people ask me what's kept me going through all the troubles that come to all of us, I always reply, I stood yesterday, I can stand today, and I will not permit myself to think about what might happen tomorrow. 
I have known want and struggle and anxiety and despair. I've always had to work beyond the limit of my strength. As I look back upon my life, I see it as a battlefield strewn with the wrecks of dead dreams and broken hopes and shattered illusions, a battle in which I always fought with the odds tremendously against me, and which has left me scarred and bruised and maimed and old before my time. Yet I have no pity for myself, no tears to shed over the past and gone sorrows, no envy for the women who have been spared all I've gone through, for I have lived, they only existed. I have drunk the cup of life down to its very dregs. They have only sipped the bubbles on top of it. I know things they will never know. I see things to which they are blind. It is only the women whose eyes have been washed clear with tears who get the broad vision that makes them little sisters to all the world. I have learned in the great university of hard knocks a philosophy that no woman who has had an easy life ever acquires. I have learned to live each day as it comes, not to borrow trouble by dreading the morrow. It is the dark menace of the picture that makes cowards of us. I put that dread from me, because experience has taught me that when the time comes that I so fear, the strength and wisdom to meet it will be given me. Little annoyances no longer have the power to affect me. After you've seen your whole edifice of happiness topple and crash in ruins about you, it never matters to you again that a servant forgets to put the doilers under the finger bowls or the cook spills the soup. I have learned not to expect too much of people, and so I can still get happiness out of the friend who isn't quite true to me or the acquaintance who gossips. Above all, I have acquired a sense of humor, because there were so many things over which I had either to cry or laugh. And when a woman can joke over her troubles instead of having hysterics, nothing can ever hurt her much again. I do not regret the hardships I have known, because through them I have touched life at every point I have lived, and it was worth the price I had to pay. Dorothy Dix conquered worry by living in day-tight compartments. I Did Not Expect to Live to See the Dawn by J. C. Penny on April 14, 1902, a young man with $500 in cash and a million dollars in determination opened a dry goods store in Kemmerer, Wyoming, a little mining town of a thousand people situated on the old covered wagon trail laid out by the Lewis and Clark expedition. Now, that young man and his wife lived in a half-story attic above the store, using a large empty dry goods box for a table and smaller boxes for chairs. The young wife wrapped her baby in a blanket and let it sleep under a counter while she stood beside it, helping her husband wait on customers. Today, the largest chain of dry goods stores in the world bears that man's name, the J.C. Penney stores, over 1,600 of them, covering every state in the Union. I recently had dinner with Mr. Penny, and he told me about the most dramatic moment of his life. Years ago, I passed through a most trying experience. I was worried and desperate. My worries were not connected in any way whatever with the J.C. Penney Company, and that business was solid and thriving. But I personally had made some unwise commitments prior to the crash of 1929. Like many other men, I was blamed for conditions for which I was in no way responsible. I was so harassed with worries that I couldn't sleep and developed an extremely painful ailment known as the shingles, a red rash and skin eruptions. I consulted a physician, a man with whom I'd gone to high school as a boy in Hamilton, Missouri, Dr. Elmer Eggleston, a staff physician at the Kellogg Sanitarium in Battle Creek, Michigan. Dr. Eggleston put me to bed and warned me that I was a very ill man. A rigid treatment was prescribed, but nothing helped. I got weaker day by day. I was broken nervously and physically, filled with despair, unable to see even a ray of hope. I had nothing to live for. I felt I hadn't a friend left in the world, that even my family had turned against me. One night Dr. Eggleston gave me a sedative, but the effect soon wore off, and I awoke with an overwhelming conviction that this was my last night of life. Getting out of bed, I wrote farewell letters to my wife and to my son, saying that I did not expect to live to see the dawn. 
When I awoke the next morning, I was surprised to find that I was still alive. Going downstairs, I heard singing in a little chapel where devotional exercises were held each morning. I can still remember the hymn they were singing, God Will Take Care of You. Going into the chapel, I listened with a weary heart to the singing, the reading of the scripture lesson, and the prayer. Suddenly, something happened. I can't explain it. I can only call it a miracle. I felt as if I had been instantly lifted out of the darkness of a dungeon into warm, brilliant sunlight. I felt as if I had been transported from hell to paradise. I felt the power of God as I had never felt it before. I realized then that I alone was responsible for all my troubles. I knew that God with His love was there to help me. From that day to this, my life has been free from worry. I am seventy-one years old, and the most dramatic and glorious twenty minutes of my life were those I spent in that chapel that morning. God will take care of you. J. C. Penney learned to overcome worry almost instantaneously because he discovered the one perfect cure. I go to the gym to punch the bag or take a hike outdoors by Colonel Eddie Egan, New York attorney, Rhodes Scholar, former chairman, New York State Athletic Commission, former Olympic light heavyweight champion of the world. When I find myself worrying and mentally going around in endless circles, like a camel turning a water wheel in Egypt, a good physical workout helps me to chase those blues away. It may be running or a long hike in the country, or it may be a half hour of bag punching or squash tennis at the gymnasium. Whichever it is, physical exercise clears my mental outlook. On a weekend, I do a lot of physical sport, such as a run around the golf course, a game of paddle tennis, or a ski weekend in the Adirondacks. By my becoming physically tired, my mind gets a rest from legal problems, so that when I return to them, my mind has a new zest and power. Quite often in New York, where I work, there's a chance for me to spend an hour at the Yale Club gym. Now, no man can worry while he's playing squash tennis or skiing. He's too busy to worry. The large mental mountains of trouble become minute molehills that new thoughts and acts quickly smooth down. I find the best antidote for worry is exercise. Use your muscles more and your brain less when you're worried, and you'll be surprised at the result. It works that way with me. Worry goes when exercise begins. I Was the Worrying Wreck from Virginia Tech by Jim Birdsall. Now, Seventeen years ago, when I was in military college at Blacksburg, Virginia, I was known as the Worrying Wreck from Virginia Tech. I worried so violently that I often became ill. In fact, I was ill so often that I had a regular bed reserved for me at the college infirmary at all times. When the nurse saw me coming, she'd run and give me a hypo. I worried about everything. Sometimes I even forgot what I was worrying about. I worried for fear I would be busted out of college because of my low grades. I'd failed to pass my examination in physics and other subjects, too. I knew I had to maintain an average grade of 75 to 84. I worried about my health, about my excruciating attacks of acute indigestion, about my insomnia. I worried about financial matters. I felt bad because I couldn't buy my girl candy or take her to dances as often as I wanted to. I worried for fear she'd marry one of the other cadets. I was in a lather day and night over a dozen intangible problems. In desperation, I poured out my troubles to Professor Duke Baird, Professor of Business Administration at VPI. The fifteen minutes that I spent with Professor Baird did more for my health and happiness than all the rest of the four years I spent in college. Jim, he said, you ought to sit down and face the facts. If you devoted half as much time and energy to solving your problems as you do to worrying about them, you wouldn't have any worries. Worrying is just a vicious habit you've learned. He gave me three rules to break the worry habit. Rule one, find out precisely what is the problem you're worrying about. Rule two, find out the cause of the problem. Rule three, do something constructive at once about solving the problem. After that interview, I did a bit of constructive planning. 
Instead of worrying because I'd failed to pass physics, I now asked myself why I had failed. I knew it wasn't because I was dumb, for I was editor-in-chief of the Virginia Tech engineer. I figured that I'd failed physics because I had no interest in the subject. I'd not applied myself because I couldn't see how it would help me in my work as an industrial engineer. But now I changed my attitude. I said to myself, if the college authorities demand that I pass my physics examination before I obtain a degree, who am I to question their wisdom? So I enrolled for physics again. This time I passed, because instead of wasting my time in resentment and worrying about how hard it was, I studied diligently. I solved my financial worries by taking on some additional jobs, such as selling punch at the college dances, and by borrowing money from my father, which I paid back soon after graduation. I solved my love worries by proposing to the girl that I feared might marry another cadet, and she is now Mrs. Jim Birdsall. As I look back at it now, I can see that my problem was one of confusion, a disinclination to find the causes of my worry and face them realistically. Jim Birdsall learned to stop worrying because he analyzed his troubles. In fact, he used the very principles described in the chapter, How to Analyze and Solve Worry Problems. I have lived by this sentence by Dr. Joseph R. Sisu, President, New Brunswick Theological Seminary, New Brunswick, New Jersey, the oldest theological seminary in the United States, founded in 1784. Years ago, in a day of uncertainty and disillusionment, when my whole life seemed to be overwhelmed by forces beyond my control, one morning, quite casually, I opened up my New Testament, and my eyes fell upon this sentence. He that sent me is with me. The Father hath not left me alone. My life has never been the same since that hour. Everything for me has been forever different after that. I suppose that not a day has passed that I have not repeated it to myself. Many have come to me for counseling during these years, and I have always sent them away with this sustaining sentence. Ever since that hour when my eyes fell upon it, I have lived by this sentence. I have walked with it, and I have found in it my peace and strength. To me it is the very essence of religion. It lies at the rock bottom of everything that makes life worth living. It is the golden text of my life. I Hit Bottom and Survived by Ted Erickson I used to be a terrible worry ward. <laughs> no more. In the summer of 1942, I had an experience that banished worry from my life for all time, I hope. The experience made every other trouble seem small by comparison. For years, I'd wanted to spend a summer on a commercial fishing craft in Alaska, so in 1942, I signed on a 32-foot salmon seining vessel out of Kodiak, Alaska. On a craft of this size, there's a crew of only three, the skipper who does the supervision, a number two man who assists the skipper, and a general workhorse who's usually a Scandinavian. <laughs> I'm a Scandinavian. Since salmon seining has to be done with the tides, I often work 20 hours out of 24. I kept up that schedule for a week at a time. I did everything that nobody else wanted to do. I washed the craft, I put away the gear, I cooked on a little wood-burning stove in a small cabin where the heat and fumes of the motor almost made me ill. I washed the dishes, I repaired the boat, I pitched the salmon from our boat into a tender that took the fish to a cannery. My feet were always wet in my rubber boots. My boots were often filled with water, but I had no time to empty them. But all that was play compared to my main job, which was pulling what's called the cork line. That operation simply means placing your feet on the stern of the craft and pulling in the corks and the webbing of the net. At least that's what you're supposed to do. But in reality, the net was so heavy that when I tried to pull it in, it wouldn't budge. What really happened was that in trying to pull in the cork line, I actually pulled in the boat. I pulled it along on my own power since the net stayed where it was. I did all this for weeks on end. It was almost the end of me, too. I ached horribly. I ached all over. I ached for months. When I finally did have the chance to rest, I slept on a damp, lumpy mattress piled on top of the provisions locker. 
I'd put one of these lumps in the mattress under the part of my back that hurt most and sleep as if I'd been drugged. I was drugged by complete exhaustion. I'm glad now that I had to endure all that aching and exhaustion because it helped me stop worrying. Whenever I'm confronted by a problem now, instead of worrying about it, I say to myself, Erickson, could this possibly be as bad as pulling the cork line? And Erickson invariably answers, no, nothing could be that bad. So I cheer up and tackle it with courage. I believe it's a good thing to have to endure an agonizing experience occasionally. It's good to know that we've hit bottom and survived. That makes all our daily problems seem easy by comparison. I used to be one of the world's biggest jackasses by Percy H. Whiting, author of The Five Great Rules of Selling. I've died more times from more different diseases than any other man, living dead or half dead. I was no ordinary hypochondriac. My father owned a drugstore, and I was practically brought up in it. I talked to doctors and nurses every day, so I knew the names and symptoms of more and worse diseases than the average layman. I was no ordinary hypo. I had symptoms. I could worry for an hour or two over a disease and then have practically all the symptoms of a man who was suffering from it. I recall once that in Great Barrington, Massachusetts, the town in which I lived, we had a rather severe diphtheria epidemic. In my father's drugstore, I'd been selling medicines day after day to people who came from infected homes. Then the evil that I feared came upon me. I had diphtheria myself. I was positive I had it. I went to bed and worried myself into the standard symptoms. I sent for a doctor. He looked me over and said, Yes, Percy, you've got it. And that relieved my mind. I was never afraid of any disease when I had it, so I turned over and went to sleep. The next morning, I was in perfect health. For years, I distinguished myself and got a lot of attention and sympathy by specializing in unusual and fantastic diseases. I died several times of both lockjaw and hydrophobia. Now, later on, I settled down to having the run-of-the-mill ailments, specializing in cancer and tuberculosis. I can laugh about it now, but it was tragic then. I honestly and literally feared for years that I was walking on the edge of the grave. When it came time to buy a suit of clothes in the spring, I would ask myself, should I waste this money now when I know I can't possibly live to wear this suit out? However, I'm happy to report progress. In the past ten years, I haven't died even once. How did I stop dying? By kidding myself out of my ridiculous imaginings. Every time I felt the dreadful symptoms coming on, I laughed at myself and said, See here, Whiting, you've been dying from one fatal disease after another now for 20 years, yet you're in first-class health today. An insurance company recently accepted you for more insurance. Isn't it about time, Whiting, that you stood aside and had a good laugh at the worrying jackass you are? I soon found that I couldn't worry about myself and laugh at myself at one and the same time, so I've been laughing at myself ever since. And the point is this. Don't take yourself too seriously. Just try laughing at some of your sillier worries and see if you can't laugh them out of existence. I've always tried to keep my line of supplies open by Gene Autry, the world's most famous and beloved singing cowboy. I figure that most worries are about family troubles and money. I was fortunate in marrying a small-town Oklahoma girl who had the same background I had and enjoyed the same things. We both try to follow the golden rule, so we've kept our family troubles to a minimum. I kept my financial worries to a minimum also by doing two things. First, I've always followed a rule of absolute 100% integrity in everything. When I borrowed money, I paid back every penny. Few things cause more worry than dishonesty. Second, when I started a new venture, I always kept an ace in the hole. Military experts say that the first principle of fighting a battle is to keep your line of supplies open. I figured that that principle applied to personal battles almost as much as to military battles. For example, as a lad down in Texas and Oklahoma, I saw some real poverty when the country was devastated by droughts. 
We had mighty hard scratching at times to make a living. We were so poor, my father used to drive across the country in a covered wagon with a string of horses and swap horses to make a living. I wanted something more reliable than that, so I got a job working for a railway station agent and learned telegraphy in my spare time. Later, I got a job working as a relief operator for the Frisco Railway. I was sent here, there, and yonder to relieve other station agents who were ill or on vacation or who had more work than they could do. Now, that job paid $150 per month. Later, when I started out to better myself, I always figured that that railroad job meant economic safety, so I always kept the road open back to that job. It was my line of supplies, and I never cut myself off from it until I was firmly established in a new and better position. For example, back in 1928, when I was working as a relief operator for the Frisco Railway in Chelsea, Oklahoma, a stranger drifted in one evening to send a telegram. He heard me playing the guitar and singing cowboy songs, and he told me I was good, told me that I ought to go to New York and get a job on the stage or radio. And naturally, I was flattered, and when I saw the name he signed to his telegram, I was almost breathless, Will Rogers. Instead of rushing off to New York at once, I thought the matter over carefully for nine months. I finally came to the conclusion that I had nothing to lose and everything to gain by going to New York, giving the old town a whirl. I had a railroad pass. I could travel free. I could sleep sitting up in my seat, and I could carry some sandwiches and fruit for my meals. So I went. When I reached New York, I slept in a furnished room for five dollars a week, ate at the automat, and tramped the streets for ten weeks, and got nowhere. I would have been worried sick if I hadn't had a job to go back to. I'd already worked for the railway five years. That meant I had seniority rights. But in order to protect those rights, I couldn't lay off longer than 90 days. By this time, I'd already been in New York 70 days, so I rushed back to Oklahoma on my pass and began working again to protect my line of supply. I worked for a few months, saved money, and returned to New York for another try. This time, I got a break. One day, while waiting for an interview in the recording studio office, I played my guitar and sang a song to the girl receptionist. Janine, I dream of lilac time. While I was singing that song, the man who wrote it, Nat Schildkraut, drifted into the office. Naturally, he was pleased to hear anyone singing his song, so he gave me a note of introduction and sent me down to the Victor Recording Company. I made a record. I was no good, too stiff and self-conscious. So I took the advice of the Victor recording man. I went back to Tulsa, I worked for the railway by day, and at night I sang cowboy songs on a sustaining radio program. I liked that arrangement. It meant that I was keeping my line of supplies open, so I had no worries. I sang for nine months on the radio station KVOO in Tulsa. During that time, Jimmy Long and I wrote a song entitled That Silver-Haired Daddy of Mine. It caught on. Arthur Satterley, head of the American Recording Company, asked me to make a recording. It clicked. I made a number of other recordings for $50 each and finally got a job singing cowboy songs over radio station WLS in Chicago. Salary, $40 a week. After singing there four years, my salary was raised to $90 a week. I picked up another $300 doing personal appearances every night in theaters. Then in 1934, I got a break that opened up enormous possibilities. The League of Decency was formed to clean up the movies, so Hollywood producers decided to put on cowboy pictures. But they wanted a new kind of cowboy, one who could sing. The man who owned the American Recording Company was also part owner of Republic Pictures. If you want a singing cowboy, he said to his associates, I've got one making records for us. And that's how I broke into the movies. I started making singing cowboy pictures for $100 a week. I had serious doubts about whether I would succeed in pictures, but I didn't worry. I knew I could always go back to my old job. My success in pictures exceeded my wildest expectations. I now get a salary of $100,000 a year, plus one half of all the profits of my pictures. However, I realize this arrangement won't go on forever, but I'm not worried. I know that no matter what happens, 
Even if I lose every dollar I have, I can always go back to Oklahoma and get a job working for the Frisco Railway. I have protected my line of supplies. I Heard a Voice in India by E. Stanley Jones, one of America's most dynamic speakers and the most famous missionary of his generation. I have devoted 40 years of my life to missionary work in India. At first I found it difficult to endure the terrible heat plus the nervous strain of the great task that stretched before me. At the end of eight years, I was suffering so severely from brain fatigue and nervous exhaustion that I collapsed, not once but several times. I was ordered to take a year's furlough in America. On the boat returning to America, I collapsed again while speaking at a Sunday morning service on the ship, and the ship's doctor put me to bed for the remainder of the trip. After a year's rest in America, I started back to India, but stopped on the way to hold evangelistic meetings among the university students in Manila. In the midst of the strain of these meetings, I collapsed several times. Physicians warned me that if I returned to India, I would die. In spite of their warnings, I continued on to India, but I went with a deepening cloud upon me. When I arrived in Bombay, I was so broken that I went straight to the hills and rested for several months. Then I returned to the plains to continue my work. It was no use. I collapsed and was forced to return to the hills for another long rest. Again I descended to the plains, and again I was shocked and crushed to discover that I couldn't take it. I was exhausted mentally, nervously, and physically. I was completely at the end of my resources. I feared that I would be a physical wreck for the balance of my life. If I didn't get help from somewhere, I realized that I would have to give up my missionary career, go back to America and work on a farm to try to regain my health. It was one of my darkest hours. At that time, I was holding a series of meetings in Lucknow. While praying one night, an event happened that completely transformed my life. While in prayer, and I was not particularly thinking about myself at the time, a voice seemed to say, Are you yourself ready for this work to which I have called you? I replied, No, Lord, I am done for, for I have reached the end of my resources. The voice replied, If you will turn that over to me and not worry about it, I will take care of it. I quickly answered, Lord, I close the bargain right here. A great peace settled into my heart and pervaded my whole being. I knew it was done. Life, abundant life, had taken possession of me. I was so lifted up that I scarcely touched the road as I quietly walked home that night. Every inch was holy ground. For days after that, I hardly knew I had a body. I went through the days working all day and far into the night, and came down to bedtime wondering why in the world I should ever go to bed at all, for there was not the slightest trace of tiredness of any kind. I seemed possessed by life and peace and rest, by Christ Himself. The question came as to whether I should tell this. I shrank from it, but felt I should, and did. After that, it was sink or swim before everybody. More than a score of the most strenuous years of my life have gone by since then, but the old trouble has never returned. I have never had such health. But it was more than a physical touch. I seem to have tapped new life for body, mind, and spirit. After that experience, life for me functioned on a permanently higher level, and I had done nothing but take it. During the many years that have gone by since then, I have traveled all over the world, frequently lecturing three times a day, and have found time and strength to write The Christ of the Indian Road and eleven other books. Yet in the midst of all this I have never missed or even been late to an appointment. The worries that once beset me have long since vanished, and now in my sixty-third year I am overflowing with abounding vitality and the joy of serving and living for others. I suppose that the physical and mental transformation that I have experienced could be picked to pieces psychologically and explained. It does not matter. Life is bigger than processes and overflows and dwarfs them.
This one thing I know. My life was completely transformed and uplifted that night in Lucknow 31 years ago when at the depth of my weakness and depression a voice said to me, If you will turn that over to me and not worry about it, I will take care of it. And I replied, Lord, I close the bargain right here. When the Sheriff Came in My Front Door by Homer Croy The biggest moment of my life occurred one day in 1933, when the Sheriff came in the front door and I went out the back. I'd lost my home at 10 Standish Road, Forest Hills, Long Island, where my children were born, and where I and my family had lived for 18 years. I'd never dreamed that this could happen to me. Twelve years before, I thought I was sitting on top of the world. I'd sold the motion picture rights to my novel, West of the Water Tower, for a top Hollywood price. I lived abroad with my family for two years. We summered in Switzerland and wintered on the French Riviera, just like the idle rich. I spent six months in Paris and wrote a novel entitled They Had to See Paris. Will Rogers appeared in the screen version. It was his first talking picture. I had tempting offers to remain in Hollywood and write several of Will Rogers' pictures, but I didn't. I returned to New York, and my troubles began. It slowly dawned on me that I had great dormant abilities that I'd never developed. I began to fancy myself a shrewd businessman. Now, somebody told me that John Jacob Astor had made millions investing in vacant land in New York. Who was Astor? Just an immigrant peddler with an accent. If he could do it, why couldn't I? I was going to be rich. I began to read the yachting magazines. I had the courage of ignorance. I didn't know any more about buying and selling real estate than an Eskimo knows about oil furnaces. How was I to get the money to launch myself on my spectacular financial career? Oh, that was simple. I mortgaged my home and bought some of the finest building lots in Forest Hills. I was going to hold on to this land until it reached a fabulous price and then sell it and live in luxury. I, who had never sold a piece of real estate as big as a doll's handkerchief. I pitied the plotters who slaved in offices for a mere salary. I told myself that God had not seen fit to touch every man with the divine fire of financial genius. Suddenly the Great Depression swept down upon me like a Kansas cyclone and shook me as a tornado would shake a hen coop. I had to pour $220 a month into that monster-mouthed piece of good earth. Oh, how fast those months came! In addition, I had to keep up the payments on our now mortgaged house and find enough food. I was worried. I tried to write humor for the magazines. And my attempt at humor sounded like the lamentations of Jeremiah. I was unable to sell anything. The novels I wrote failed. I ran out of money. I had nothing on which I could borrow money except my typewriter and the gold fillings in my teeth. The milk company stopped delivering milk. The gas company turned off the gas. We had to buy one of those little outdoor camp stoves you see advertised. It had a cylinder of gasoline. You pump it up by hand, and it shoots out a flame with a hissing like an angry goose. If we ran out of coal, the company sued us. Our only heat was the fireplace. I'd go out at night and pick up boards and leftovers from the new homes that the rich people were building. I, who had started out to be one of those rich people. I was so worried I couldn't sleep. I often got up in the middle of the night and walked for hours to exhaust myself so I could fall asleep. I lost not only the vacant land I had bought, but all my heart's blood that I had poured into it. The bank closed the mortgage in my home and put me and my family out on the street. In some way we managed to get hold of a few dollars and rent a small apartment. We moved in the last day of 1933. I sat down on a packing case and looked around. An old saying of my mother's came back, Don't cry over spilt milk. 
but this wasn't milk. This was my heart's blood. After I sat there a while, I said to myself, Well, I've hit bottom, and I've stood it. There is no place to go now but up. I began to think of the fine things that the mortgage had not taken from me. I still had my health and my friends. I would start again. I would not grieve about the past. I would repeat to myself every day the words I had often heard my mother say about spilt milk. I put into my work the energy that I'd been putting into worrying. Little by little, my situation began to improve. I am almost thankful now that I had to go through all that misery. It gave me strength, fortitude, and confidence. I know now what it means to hit bottom. I know it doesn't kill you. I know we can stand more than we think we can. When little worries and anxieties and uncertainties try to disturb me now, I banish them by reminding myself of the time I sat down in the packing case and said, I've hit bottom and I've stood it. There is no place to go now but up. And what's the principle here? Now don't try to saw sawdust. Accept the inevitable. If you can't go lower, you can try going up. The toughest opponent I ever fought was Worry, by Jack Dempsey. During my career in the ring, I found that old man Worry was an almost tougher opponent than the heavyweight boxers I fought. I realized that I had to learn to stop worrying, or Worry would sap my vitality and undermine my success. So, little by little, I worked out a system for myself. Now, here are some of the things I did. To keep up my courage in the ring... I'd give myself a pep talk during the fight. For example, while I was fighting Furpo, I kept saying over and over, nothing is going to stop me, he's not going to hurt me, I won't feel his blows, I can't get hurt, I'm going to keep going no matter what happens. Making positive statements like that to myself and thinking positive thoughts helped me a lot. It even kept my mind so occupied that I didn't feel the blows. During my career, I've had my lips smashed, my eyes cut, my ribs cracked. Furpo knocked me clear through the ropes, and I landed on a reporter's typewriter and wrecked it. But I never felt even one of Furpo's blows. There was only one blow that I ever really felt, and that was the night Lester Johnson broke three of my ribs. The punch never hurt me, but it affected my breathing. Now, I can honestly say I never felt any other blow I ever got in the ring. Another thing I did was to keep reminding myself of the futility of worry. Most of my worrying was done before the big bouts while I was going through training. I'd often lie awake at night for hours, tossing and worrying, unable to sleep. I'd worry for fear I might break my hand or sprain my ankle or get my eye cut badly in the first round so I couldn't coordinate my punches. And when I got myself into this state of nerves, I used to get out of bed, look into the mirror, and give myself a good talking to. I'd say to myself, What a fool you are to be worrying about something that hasn't happened and may never happen. Life is short. I have only a few years to live, so I must enjoy life. I kept saying to myself, Nothing is important but my health. Nothing is important but my health. I kept reminding myself that losing sleep and worrying would destroy my health. I found that by saying these things to myself over and over, night after night, year after year, they finally got under my skin, and I could brush off my worries like so much water. Uh, the third and best thing I did was pray. And while I was training for a bout, I always prayed several times a day. When I was in the ring, I always prayed just before the bell sounded for each round. That helped me fight with courage and confidence. I've never gone to bed in my life without saying a prayer. I've never eaten a meal in my life without first thanking God for it. Thousands of times. I prayed to God to keep me out of an orphan's home. By Kathleen Halter As a little child, my life was filled with terror. My mother had heart trouble. Day after day I saw her faint and fall to the floor. We all feared she was going to die, and I believe that all little girls whose mothers died were sent to the Central Wesleyan Orphans Home, located in the little town of Warrenton, Missouri, where we lived. I dreaded the thought of going there, and when I was six years old I prayed constantly. 
Dear God, please let Mummy live until I am old enough not to go to the orphan's home. Twenty years later, my brother, Minor, had a terrible injury and suffered intense pain until he died two years later. He couldn't feed himself or turn over in bed. To deaden his pain, I had to give him morphine hypodermics every three hours, day and night. I did this for two years. I was teaching music at the time at the Central Wesleyan College in Warrington, Missouri. When the neighbors heard my brother screaming with pain, they would telephone me at the college, and I would leave my music class and rush home to give my brother another injection of morphine. Every night when I went to bed, I would set the alarm clock to go off three hours later, so I would be sure to get up to attend to my brother. I remember that on winter nights, I would keep a bottle of milk outside the window, where it would freeze and turn into a kind of ice cream that I loved to eat. When the alarm went off, this ice cream outside the window gave me an additional incentive to get up. In the midst of all these troubles, I did two things that kept me from indulging in self-pity and worrying and embittering my life with resentment. First, I kept myself busy teaching music from 12 to 14 hours a day, so I had little time to think of my troubles. And when I was tempted to feel sorry for myself, I kept saying to myself over and over, now, listen, as long as you can walk and feed yourself and are free from intense pain, you ought to be the happiest person in the world. No matter what happens, never forget that as long as you live. Never, never. I was determined to do everything in my power to cultivate an unconscious and continuous attitude of gratefulness for my many blessings. Every morning when I awoke, I would thank God that I could get out of bed and walk to breakfast and feed myself. I fiercely resolved that in spite of my troubles, I would be the happiest person in Warrenton, Missouri. Now, maybe I didn't succeed in achieving that goal, but I did succeed in making myself the most grateful young woman in my hometown, and probably few of my associates worried less than I did. This Missouri music teacher applied two principles described in this book. She kept too busy to worry, and she counted her blessings. The same techniques may be helpful to you. My Stomach Was Twisting Like a Kansas Whirlwind by Cameron Ship. I had been working very happily in the publicity department of Warner Brothers Studio in California for several years. I was a unit man and feature writer. I wrote stories for newspapers and magazines about Warner Brothers stars. Suddenly I was promoted. I was made the assistant publicity director. As a matter of fact, there was a change of administrative policy, and I was given an impressive title, administrative assistant. This gave me an enormous office with a private refrigerator, two secretaries, and complete charge of a staff of 75 writers, exploiters, and radio men. I was enormously impressed. I went straight out and bought a new suit. I tried to speak with dignity. I set up filing systems, made decisions with authority, and ate quick lunches. I was convinced that the whole public relations policy of Warner Brothers had descended upon my shoulders. I perceived that the lives, both private and public, of such renowned persons as Betty Davis, Olivia de Havilland, James Cagney, Edward G. Robinson, Errol Flynn, Humphrey Bogart, and Sheridan, Alexis Smith, and Alan Hale were entirely in my hands. In less than a month, I became aware that I had stomach ulcers, probably cancer. My chief war activity at the time was as chairman of the War Activities Committee of the Screen Publicist Guild. I liked to do this work, liked to meet my friends at guild meetings, but these gatherings became matters of dread. After every meeting, I was violently ill. Often I had to stop my car on the way home, pulling myself together before I could drive on. There seemed to be so much to do, so little time in which to do it. It was all vital, and I was woefully inadequate. I'm being perfectly truthful. This was the most painful illness of my entire life. There was always a tight fist in my vitals. I lost weight. I could not sleep. The pain was constant. So I went to see a renowned expert in internal medicine. An advertising man recommended him. He said this physician had many clients who were advertising men. This physician spoke only briefly, just enough for me to tell him where I hurt and what I did for a living. He seemed more interested in my job than in my ailments, but I was soon reassured. 
For two weeks daily, he gave me every known test. I was probed, explored, x-rayed, and fluoroscoped. Finally, I was instructed to call on him and hear the verdict. Mr. Ship, he said, leaning back, we've been through these exhaustive tests. They were absolutely necessary, although I knew, of course, after my first examination, that you did not have stomach ulcers. But I knew, because you're the kind of man you are, and because you do the kind of work you do, that you would not believe me unless I showed you. Let me show you. So he showed me the charts and the x-rays and explained them. He showed me I had no ulcers. Now, said the doctor, this cost you a good deal of money, but it is worth it to you. Here is the prescription. Don't worry. Now, he stopped me as I started to expostulate. Now, I realize you can't follow the prescription immediately, so I'll give you a crutch. Here are some pills. They contain belladonna. Take as many as you like. When you use these up, come back and I'll give you more. They won't hurt you, but they will always relax you. But remember, you don't need them. All you have to do is quit worrying. If you do start worrying again, you'll have to come back here and I'll charge you a heavy fee again. Now, how about it? I wish I could report the lesson took effect that day and that I quit worrying immediately. I didn't. I took the pills for several weeks. Whenever I felt a worry coming on, they worked. I felt better at once. But I felt silly taking these pills. I'm a big man physically. I'm almost as tall as Abe Lincoln was and weigh almost 200 pounds. Yet here I was taking little white pills to relax myself. When my friends asked me why I was taking pills, I was ashamed to tell the truth. Gradually, I began to laugh at myself. I said, See here, Cameron Ship, you're acting like a fool. You are taking yourself and your little activities much, much too seriously. Betty Davis and James Cagney and Edward G. Robinson were world famous before you started to handle their publicity, and if you dropped dead tonight, Warner Brothers and their stars would manage to get along without you. Look at Eisenhower, General Marshall, MacArthur, Jimmy Doolittle, Admiral King. They're all running the war without taking pills. And yet you can't serve as chairman of the War Activities Committee of the Screen Publicist Guild without taking little white pills to keep your stomach from twisting and turning like a Kansas whirlwind. I began to take pride in getting along without the pills. A little while later, I threw the pills down the drain and got home each night in time to take a little nap before dinner and gradually began to lead a normal life. I have never been back to see that physician. But I owe him much, much more than what seemed like a stiff fee at the time. He taught me to laugh at myself. But I think the really skillful thing he did was to refrain from laughing at me and to refrain from telling me I had nothing to worry about. He took me seriously. He saved my face. He gave me an out in a small box. But he knew then, as well as I know now, that the cure wasn't in those silly little pills. The cure was in a change in my mental attitude. Now, the moral of this story is that many a man who is now taking pills would do better to read Part 7 and relax. I learned to stop worrying by watching my wife wash dishes by Rev. William Wood. A few years ago, I was suffering intensely from pains in my stomach. I would awaken two or three times each night, unable to sleep because of these terrific pains. I had watched my father die from cancer of the stomach, and I feared that I, too, had a stomach cancer or at least stomach ulcers. So I went to a clinic for an examination. A renowned stomach specialist examined me with a fluoroscope. He gave me medicine to make me sleep and assured me I had no stomach ulcers or cancer. My pains, he said, were caused by emotional strains. Since I'm a minister, one of his first questions was, Do you have an old crank on your church board? He told me what I already knew. I was trying to do too much. In addition to my preaching every Sunday and carrying the burdens of the various activities of the church, I was also chairman of the Red Cross, president of Kiwanis. I also conducted two or three funerals each week and a number of other activities. I was working under constant pressure. I could never relax. I was always tense, hurried, and high-strung. I got to the point where I worried about everything. 
I was living in a constant dither. I was in such pain that I gladly acted on the doctor's advice. I took Monday off each week and began eliminating various responsibilities and activities. One day, while cleaning out my desk, I got an idea that proved to be immensely helpful. I was looking over an accumulation of old notes on sermons and other memos on matters that were now past and gone. I crumpled them up one by one and tossed them into a wastebasket. Suddenly I stopped and I said to myself, Bill, why don't you do the same thing with your worries that you're doing with these notes? Why don't you crumple up your worries about yesterday's problems and toss them into the wastebasket? And that one idea gave me immediate inspiration, gave me the feeling of a weight being lifted from my shoulders. Now, from that day to this, I have made it a rule to throw into the wastebasket all the problems that I can no longer do anything about. Then one day, while wiping the dishes as my wife washed them, I got another idea. My wife was singing as she washed the dishes, and I said to myself, Look, Bill, how happy your wife is. We've been married eighteen years, and she's been washing dishes all that time. Suppose when we got married, she had looked ahead and seen all the dishes she would have to wash during those eighteen years that stretched ahead. That pile of dirty dishes would be bigger than a barn. The very thought of it would have appalled any woman. And then I said to myself, The reason my wife doesn't mind washing the dishes is because she washes only one day's dishes at a time. I saw what my problem was. I was trying to wash today's dishes and yesterday's dishes and dishes that weren't even dirty yet. I saw how foolish I was acting. I was standing in the pulpit Sunday mornings telling other people how to live, yet I myself was leading a tense, worried, hurried existence. I felt ashamed of myself. Now, worries don't bother me any more. No more stomach pains, no more insomnia. I now crumple up yesterday's anxieties and toss them into the wastebasket, and I have ceased trying to wash tomorrow's dirty dishes today. Do you remember a statement quoted earlier in this book? The load of tomorrow added to that of yesterday, carried today, makes the strongest falter? Why even try it? I Found the Answer by Del Hughes In 1943, I landed in a veterans hospital in Albuquerque, New Mexico, with three broken ribs and a punctured lung. Now, this happened during a practice marine amphibious landing off the Hawaiian Islands. I was getting ready to jump off the barge onto the beach when a big breaker swept in, lifted the barge, and threw me off balance and smashed me on the sands. I fell with such force that one of my ribs punctured my right lung. After spending three months in the hospital, I got the biggest shock of my life. The doctors told me that I showed absolutely no improvement. After some serious thinking, I figured that worry was preventing me from getting well. I'd been used to a very active life, and during these three months I'd been flat on my back 24 hours a day with nothing to do but think. The more I thought, the more I worried. Worried about whether I would ever be able to take my place in the world. Worried about whether I would remain a cripple the rest of my life, and about whether I would ever be able to get married and live a normal life. I urged my doctor to move me up to the next ward, which was called the Country Club, because the patients were allowed to do almost anything they cared to do. In this Country Club ward, I became interested in contract bridge. I spent six weeks learning the game, playing bridge with the other fellows and reading Culbertson's books on bridge. After six weeks, I was playing nearly every evening for the rest of my stay in the hospital. I also became interested in painting with oils and studied this art under an instructor every afternoon from three to five. Now, some of my paintings were so good you could almost tell what they were. I also tried my hand at soap and wood carving and read a number of books on the subject and found it fascinating. I kept myself so busy that I had no time to worry about my physical condition. I even found time to read books on psychology given to me by the Red Cross. At the end of three months, the entire medical staff came to me and congratulated me on making an amazing improvement. Those are the sweetest words I had ever heard since the day I was born. I wanted to shout with joy. Now, the point I'm trying to make is this. When I had nothing to do but lie on the flat of my back and worry about my future, I made no improvement whatever. 
I was poisoning my body with worry. Even the broken ribs wouldn't heal. But as soon as I got my mind off myself, by playing contract bridge, painting oil pictures, and carving wood, the doctors declared I made an amazing improvement. I'm now leading a normal, healthy life, and my lungs are as good as yours. Now remember what George Bernard Shaw said, The secret of being miserable is to have the leisure to bother about whether you're happy or not. To keep active. Keep busy. Time Solves a Lot of Things by Louis T. Montant, Jr. Worry caused me to lose ten years of my life. Those ten years should have been the most fruitful and richest years of any young man's life, the years from eighteen to twenty-eight. I realize now that losing those years was no one's fault but my own. I worried about everything. My job, my health, my family, and my feelings of inferiority. I was so frightened that I used to cross the street to avoid meeting people I knew. When I met a friend on the street, I would often pretend not to notice him, because I was afraid of being snubbed. I was so afraid of meeting strangers, so terrified in their presence, that in one space of two weeks I lost out on three different jobs simply because I didn't have the courage to tell those three prospective employers what I knew I could do. Then one day eight years ago, I conquered worry in one afternoon and have rarely worried since then. That afternoon, I was in the office of a man who had far more troubles than I had ever faced, yet he was one of the most cheerful men I had ever known. He'd made a fortune in 1929 and then lost every cent. He made another fortune in 1933 and lost that, and another fortune in 1939 and lost that, too. He had gone through bankruptcy and had been hounded by enemies and creditors. Troubles that would have broken some men and driven them to suicide rolled off him like water off a duck's back. As I sat in his office that day, eight years ago, I envied him and wished that God had made me like him. As we were talking, he tossed a letter to me that he'd received that morning and said, Read that. It was an angry letter, raising several embarrassing questions. If I'd received such a letter, it would have sent me into a tailspin. I said, Bill, how are you going to answer it? Well, Bill said, I'll tell you a little secret. Next time you've really got something to worry about, take a pencil on the piece of paper and sit down and write out in detail just what's worrying you. Then put that piece of paper in the lower right-hand drawer of your desk and wait a couple of weeks and then look at it. If what you wrote down still worries you when you read it, put that piece of paper back in your lower right-hand drawer. Let it sit there for another two weeks. It'll be safe there. Nothing will happen to it. But in the meantime, a lot may happen to the problem that is worrying you. I have found out that if I only have patience, the worry that's trying to harass me will often collapse like a pricked balloon. Now, that bit of advice made a great impression on me. I've been using Bill's advice for years now, and as a result, I rarely worry about anything. Time solves a lot of things. Time may also solve what you're worrying about today. I was warned not to try to speak or to move even a finger by Joseph L. Ryan. Several years ago, I was a witness in a lawsuit that caused me a great deal of mental strain and worry. After the case was over and I was returning home in the train, I had a sudden and violent physical collapse, heart trouble. I found it almost impossible to breathe. When I got home, the doctor gave me an injection. I wasn't in bed. I hadn't been able to get any further than the living room settee. And when I regained consciousness, I saw that the parish priest was already there to give me final absolution. I saw the stunned grief on the faces of my family. I knew my number was up. And later, I found out that the doctor had prepared my wife for the fact that I would probably be dead in less than thirty minutes. My heart was so weak I was warned not to try to speak or to move even a finger. Now, I'd never been a saint, but I had learned one thing and not to argue with God. So I closed my eyes and said, Thy will be done. If it has to come now, thy will be done. As soon as I gave in to that thought, I seemed to relax all over. My terror disappeared, and I asked myself quietly, What was the worst that could happen now?
Well, the worst seemed to be a possible return of the spasms with excruciating pains. Then all would be over. I would go to meet my maker and soon be at peace. I lay on that settee and waited for an hour, but the pains didn't return. Finally, I began to ask myself what I would do with my life if I didn't die now. I determined that I would exert every effort to regain my health. I would stop abusing myself with tension and worry and rebuild my strength. Now, that was four years ago. I have rebuilt my strength to such a degree that even my doctor is amazed at the improvement my cardiogram show. I no longer worry. I have a new zest for life. But I can honestly say that if I hadn't faced the worst, my imminent death, and then tried to improve upon it, I don't believe I'd be here today. If I hadn't accepted the worst, I believe I would have died from my own fear and panic. And Mr. Ryan is alive today because he made use of the principle described in the magic formula: face the worst that can happen. I am a great dismisser by Ordway Teed. Worry is a habit, a habit that I broke long ago. I believe that my habit of refraining from worrying is due largely to three things. First, I am too busy to indulge in self-destroying anxiety. I have three main activities, each one of which should be virtually a full-time job in itself. I lecture to large groups at Columbia University. I am also chairman of the board of higher education of New York City. I also have charge of the economic and social book department of the publishing firm of Harper and Brothers. The insistent demands of these three tasks leave me no time to fret and stew and run around in circles. Second, I am a great dismisser. When I turn from one task to another, I dismiss all thoughts of the problems I have been thinking about previously. I find it stimulating and refreshing to turn from one activity to another. It rests me. It clears my mind. Third, I have had to school myself to dismiss all these problems from my mind when I close my office desk. They are always continuing. Each one always has a set of unsolved problems demanding my attention. If I carried these issues home with me each night and worried about them, I would destroy my health, and in addition, I would destroy all ability to cope with them. Ordway Teed is a master of the four good working habits. Do you remember what they are? See Part Seven, Chapter Twenty Six. If I had not stopped worrying, I would have been in my grave long ago. By Connie Mack, the grand old man of baseball. I have been in professional baseball for over sixty-three years. When I first started back in the eighties, I got no salary at all. We played on vacant lots and stumbled over tin cans and discarded horse collars. When the game was over, we passed the hat. The pickings were pretty slim for me, especially since I was the main support of my widowed mother and my younger brothers and sisters. Sometimes the ball team would have to put on a strawberry supper or a clam bake to keep going. I've had plenty of reason to worry. I'm the only baseball manager who ever finished in last place for seven consecutive years. I'm the only manager who ever lost 800 games in eight years. After a series of defeats, I used to worry until I could hardly eat or sleep. But I stopped worrying 25 years ago, and I honestly believe that if I hadn't stopped worrying then, I would have been in my grave long ago. As I look back over my long life, I was born when Lincoln was president. I believe I was able to conquer worry by doing these things. One, I saw how futile it was. I saw it was getting me nowhere and was threatening to wreck my career. Two, I saw it was going to ruin my health. Three, I kept myself so busy planning and working to win games in the future that I had no time to worry over games that were already lost. Four, I finally made it a rule never to call a player's attention to his mistakes until 24 hours after the game. In my early days, I used to dress and undress with the players. If the team had lost, I found it impossible to refrain from criticizing the players and from arguing with them bitterly over their defeats. I found this only increased my worries. Criticizing a player in front of the others didn't make him want to cooperate. It really made him bitter.
So since I couldn't be sure of controlling myself and my tongue immediately after a defeat, I made it a rule never to see the players right after a defeat. I wouldn't discuss the defeat with them until the next day. By that time, I'd cooled off. The mistakes didn't loom so large, and I could talk things over calmly, and the men wouldn't get angry and try to defend themselves. Five, I tried to inspire players by building them up with praise instead of tearing them down with fault-finding. I tried to have a good word for everybody. Six, I found that I worried more when I was tired, so I spent ten hours in bed every night, and I take a nap every afternoon. Even a five-minute nap helps a lot. Seven, I believe I've avoided worries and lengthened my life by continuing to be active. I'm eighty-five, and I'm not going to retire until I begin telling the same stories over and over. When I start doing that, I'll know then that I'm growing old. Connie Mack never read a book on how to stop worrying, so he made out his own rules. Why don't you make a list of rules you've found helpful in the past and write them out right now? I got rid of stomach ulcers and worry by changing my job and my mental attitude by Arden W. Sharp, Green Bay, Wisconsin. Five years ago, I was worried, depressed, and sick. The doctor said I had stomach ulcers. They put me on a diet. I drank milk and ate eggs until I revolted at the sight of them, but I didn't get well. Then one day I read an article about cancer. I imagined I had every symptom. I was not worried now. I was terrified. Naturally, this made my stomach ulcers flare up like fire. The final blow came when the army rejected me as physically unfit at twenty-four. I was apparently a physical wreck when I should have been at the height of my physical powers. I was at the end of my rope. I couldn't see a ray of hope. In desperation, I tried to analyze how I'd gotten myself into this terrible condition. Slowly, the truth began to dawn on me. Two years previously, I'd been happy and healthy in my work as a salesman, but wartime shortages had forced me to give up selling and take a job in a factory. I despised factory work, and to make matters worse, I was associating with a group of the most accomplished negative thinkers I'd ever had the misfortune to meet. They were bitter about everything. Nothing was right. They constantly condemned the job and cursed the pay, the hours, the boss, and everything. I realized that I had unconsciously absorbed their vindictive attitude. I slowly began to realize that my stomach ulcers were probably brought on by my own negative thoughts and bitter emotions. I then decided to go back to the work I liked, selling, and to associate with people who thought positive, constructive thoughts. This decision probably saved my life. I deliberately sought out friends and business associates who were progressive thinkers, happy, optimistic men, free of worry and ulcers. As soon as I changed my emotions, I changed my stomach. Within a short time, I forgot that I had ever had ulcers. I soon found that you can catch health, happiness, and success from others just as easily as you can catch worries, bitterness, and failure. This is the most important lesson I have ever learned. I should have learned it long ago. I had heard about it and read about it dozens of times, but I had to learn it the hard way. I realize now what Jesus meant when he said, "As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he." I now look for the green light by Joseph M. Cotter. From the time I was a small boy, throughout the early stages of young manhood and during my adult life, I was a professional worrier. My worries were many and varied. Some were real; most of them were imaginary. Upon rare occasions, I would find myself without anything to worry about. Then I would worry for fear I might be overlooking something. Then, two years ago, I started out on a new way of living. This required making a self-analysis of my faults and a very few virtues, a searching and fearless moral inventory of myself. This brought out clearly what was causing all this worry. The fact was that I could not live for today alone. I was fretful of yesterday's mistakes and fearful of the future. I was told over and over that today was the tomorrow I had worried about yesterday, but it wouldn't work for me. 
I was advised to live on a 24-hour program. I was told that today was the only day over which I had any control, and that I should make the most of my opportunities each day. I was told that if I did that, I would be so busy, I would have no time to worry about any other day, past or future. Now, that advice was logical, but somehow I found it hard to put these darned ideas to work for me. Then, like a shot out of the dark, I found the answer. And where do you suppose I found it? On a Northwestern Railroad platform at 7 p.m. May 31, 1945. It was an important hour for me. That's why I remember it so clearly. We were taking some friends to the train. They were leaving on the city of Los Angeles, a streamliner, to return from a vacation. The war still on. Crowds were heavy that year. Instead of boarding the train with my wife, I wandered down the tracks toward the front of the train. I stood looking at the big, shiny engine for a minute. Presently, I looked down the track and saw a huge semaphore. An amber light was showing. Immediately, this light turned to a bright green. At that moment, the engineer started clanging a bell. I heard the familiar all aboard, and in a matter of seconds, that huge streamliner began to move out of the station on its 2,300-mile trip. My mind started spinning. Something was trying to make sense to me. I was experiencing a miracle. Suddenly it dawned on me. That engineer had given me the answer I had been seeking. He was starting out on that long journey with only one green light to go by. If I'd been in his place, I would want to see all the green lights for the entire journey. Impossible, of course, yet that was exactly what I was trying to do with my life, sitting in the station, going no place, because I was trying too hard to see what was ahead for me. My thoughts kept coming. That engineer didn't worry about trouble that he might encounter miles ahead. There probably would be some delays, some slowdowns, but wasn't that why they had signal systems? Amber lights, reduce speed and take it easy. Red lights, real danger up ahead, stop. And that was what made train travel safe, a good signal system. I asked myself, why didn't I have a good signal system for my life? Uh, my answer was, I did have one. God had given it to me. He controls it, so it has to be foolproof. I started looking for a green light. Now, where could I find it? Well, if God created the green lights, why not ask Him? I did just that. And now, by praying each morning, I get my green light for that day. I also occasionally get amber lights that slow me down. Sometimes I get red lights that stop me before I crack up. No more worrying for me since that day two years ago when I made this discovery. During those two years, over 700 green lights have shown for me, and the trip through life is so much easier without the worry of what color the next light will be. No matter what color it may be, I will know what to do. How John D. Rockefeller lived on borrowed time for 45 years. John D. Rockefeller, Sr., had accumulated his first million at the age of 33. At the age of 43, he'd built up the largest monopoly the world has ever seen, the great Standard Oil Company. But where was he at 53? A worry had gotten him at 53. Worry and high-tension living had already wrecked his health. At 53, he looked like a mummy, says John K. Winkler, one of his biographers. At 53, Rockefeller was attacked by mystifying digestive maladies that swept away his hair, even the eyelashes, and all but a faint wisp of eyebrow. So serious was his condition, says Winkler, that at one time John D. was compelled to exist on human milk. According to the doctors, he had alopecia, a form of baldness that often starts with sheer nerves. He looked so startling with his stark, bald dome that he had to wear a skull cap. Later, he had wigs made at $500 apiece. For the rest of his life, he wore those silver wigs. Rockefeller had originally been blessed with an iron constitution. Reared on a farm, he had once had stalwart shoulders, an erect carriage, a strong, brisk gait. Yet at only fifty-three, when most men are at their prime, his shoulders drooped, and he shambled when he walked. When he looked in a glass, says John T. Flynn, another of his biographers, he saw an old man. 
the ceaseless work, the endless worry, the streams of abuse, the sleepless nights, and the lack of exercise and rest had exacted their toll. They had brought him to his knees. He was now the richest man in the world, yet he had to live on a diet that a pauper would have scorned. His income at the time was a million dollars a week, but two dollars a week would probably have paid for all the food he could eat. Acidulated milk and a few crackers were all the doctors would allow him. His skin had lost its color. It looked like old parchment drawn tight across his bones. And nothing but medical care, the best money could buy, kept him from dying at the age of fifty-three. How did it happen? Worry. Shock. High pressure and high tension living. He drove himself literally to the edge of the grave. Even at the age of twenty-three, Rockefeller was already pursuing his goal with such grim determination that, according to those who knew him, nothing lightened his countenance save news of a good bargain. When he made a big profit, he would do a little war dance, throw his hat on the floor, and break into a jig. But if he lost money, he was ill. He once shipped forty thousand dollars worth of grain by way of the Great Lakes. No insurance; it cost too much, a hundred and fifty dollars. That night, a vicious storm raged over Lake Erie. Rockefeller was so worried about losing his cargo that when his partner George Gardner reached the office in the morning, he found John D. there pacing the floor. "Hurry," he quavered. "Let's see if we can take out insurance now, if it isn't too late." Gardner rushed up town and got the insurance, but when he returned to the office, he found John D. in an even worse state of nerves. A telegram had arrived in the meantime. The cargo had landed safe from the storm. He was sicker than ever now because they had wasted the one hundred fifty dollars. In fact, he was so sick about it that he had to go home and take to his bed. Think of it. At that time, his firm was doing a gross business of five hundred thousand dollars a year. Yet he made himself so ill over a hundred fifty dollars that he had to go to bed. He had no time for play, no time for recreation, no time for anything except making money and teaching Sunday school. When his partner George Gardner purchased a second-hand yacht with three other men for two thousand dollars, John D was aghast, refused to go out on it. Gardner found him working at the office one Saturday afternoon and pleaded, "Come on, John, let's go for a sail. It will do you good. Forget about business. Have a little fun." Rockefeller glared. "George Gardner," he warned, "you are the most extravagant man I ever knew. You are injuring your credit at the banks and my credit too. First thing you know, you'll be wrecking our business. No, I won't go on your yacht. I don't ever want to see it." And he stayed plugging in the office all Saturday afternoon. The same lack of humor, the same lack of perspective, characterized John D. all through his business career. Years later, he said, "I never placed my head upon the pillow at night without reminding myself that my success might be only temporary." With millions at his command, he never put his head upon his pillow without worrying about losing his fortune. No wonder worry wrecked his health. He had no time for play or recreation. Never went to the theater. Never played cards. Never went to a party. As Mark Hanna said, the man was mad about money, sane in every other respect, but mad about money. Rockefeller had once confessed to a neighbor in Cleveland, Ohio, that he wanted to be loved, yet he was so cold and suspicious that few people even liked him. Morgan once balked at having to do business with him at all. I don't like the man. He snorted. I don't want to have any dealings with him. Rockefeller's own brother hated him so much that he removed his children's bodies from the family plot. No one of my blood, he said, will ever rest in land controlled by John D. Rockefeller's employees and associates lived in holy fear of him, and here's the ironic part: he was afraid of them. Afraid they would talk outside of the office and give secrets away, he had so little faith in human nature that once, when he signed a ten-year contract with an independent refiner, he made the man promise not to tell anyone, not even his wife. Shut your mouth and run your business. And that was his motto. Then, at the very peak of his prosperity, 
with gold flowing into his coffers like hot yellow lava pouring down the sides of Vesuvius, his private world collapsed. Books and articles denounced the robber baron war of Standard Oil Company, secret rebates with railroads, the ruthless crushing of all rivals. In the oil fields of Pennsylvania, John D. Rockefeller was the most hated man on earth. He was hanged in effigy by the men he had crushed. Many of them longed to tie a rope around his withered neck and hang him to the limb of a sour apple tree. Letters breathing fire and brimstone poured into his office, letters threatening his life. He hired bodyguards to keep his enemies from killing him. He attempted to ignore this cyclone of hate. He had once said cynically, You may kick me and abuse me, provided you will let me have my own way. But he discovered he was human after all. He couldn't take hate and worry, too. His health began to crack. He was puzzled and bewildered by this new enemy, illness, which attacked him from within. At first he remained secretive about his occasional indispositions, tried to put his illness out of his mind. But insomnia, indigestion, and the loss of his hair, all physical symptoms of worry and collapse, were not to be denied. Finally, his doctors told him the shocking truth. He could take his choice, his money and his worries, or his life. They warned him he must either retire or die. He retired. But before he retired, worry, greed, fear had already wrecked his health. When Ida Tarbell, America's most celebrated female writer of biographies, saw him, she was shocked. She wrote, an awful age was in his face. He was the oldest man I have ever seen. Old? A Rockefeller was then several years younger than General MacArthur was when he recaptured the Philippines. But he was such a physical wreck that Ida Tarbell pitied him. She was working at that time on her powerful book, which condemned the Standard Oil and all that it stood for. She certainly had no cause to love the man who had built up this octopus. Yet she said that when she saw John D. Rockefeller teaching a Sunday school class, eagerly searching the faces of all those around him, I had a feeling which I had not expected, and which time intensified. I was sorry for him. I know no companion so terrible as fear. When the doctors undertook to save Rockefeller's life, they gave him three rules, three rules which he observed to the letter for the rest of his life. Here they are. 1. Avoid worry. Never worry about anything under any kind of circumstances. 2. Relax and take plenty of mild exercise in the open air. 3. Watch your diet. Always stop eating while you're still a little hungry. John D. Rockefeller obeyed those rules, and they probably saved his life. He retired. He learned to play golf. He went in for gardening. He chatted with his neighbors. He played games. He sang songs. But he did something else, too. During the days of torture and nights of insomnia, says Winkler, John D. had time for reflection. He began to think of other people. He stopped thinking, for once, of how much money he could get, and he began to wonder how much that money would buy in terms of human happiness. In short, Rockefeller now began to give his millions away. Some of the time it wasn't easy. When he offered money to a church, pulpits all over the country thundered back with cries of tainted money, but he kept on giving. He learned of a starving little college in the shores of Lake Michigan that was being foreclosed because of its mortgage. He came to its rescue and poured millions of dollars into that college and built it into the now world-famous University of Chicago. He tried to help the Negroes. He gave money to Negro universities like Tuskegee College, where funds were needed to carry on the work of George Washington Carver. He helped to fight hookworm. When Dr. Charles W. Stiles, the hookworm authority, said, Fifty cents worth of medicine will cure a man of this disease which ravages the South, but who will give the fifty cents? A Rockefeller gave it. He spent millions on hookworm, stamping out the greatest scourge that ever handicapped the South. And then he went further. 
he established a great international foundation, the Rockefeller Foundation, which was to fight disease and ignorance all over the world. I speak with feeling of this work, for I probably owe my life to the Rockefeller Foundation. How well I remember that when I was in China in 1932, cholera was raging all over Peking. The Chinese peasants were dying like flies, yet in the midst of all this horror, we were able to go to the Rockefeller Medical College and get a vaccination to protect us from the plague. Chinese and foreigners alike, we were able to do that. And that was when I got my first understanding of what Rockefeller's millions were doing for the world. Never before in history has there ever been anything remotely like the Rockefeller Foundation. It's something unique. Rockefeller knew that all over the world there are many fine movements that men of vision start. Research is undertaken, colleges are founded, doctors struggle on to fight a disease, but only too often this high-minded work has to die for lack of funds. He decided to help these pioneers of humanity, not to take them over, but to give them some money and help them help themselves. Today you and I can thank John D. Rockefeller for the miracles of penicillin and for dozens of other discoveries which his money helped to finance. You can thank him for the fact that your children no longer die from spinal meningitis, a disease that used to kill four out of five. And you can thank him for part of the inroads we have made on malaria and tuberculosis, on influenza and diphtheria, and many other diseases that still plague the world. And what about Rockefeller? When he gave his money away, did he gain peace of mind? Yes, he was contented at last. If the public thought of him after 1900 as brooding over the attacks on Standard Oil, said Alan Nevins, the public was much mistaken. Rockefeller was happy. He had changed so completely that he didn't worry at all. In fact, he refused even to lose one night's sleep when he was forced to accept the greatest defeat of his career. The defeat came when the corporation he had built, the huge Standard Oil, was ordered to pay the heaviest fine in history. According to the United States government, the Standard Oil was a monopoly in direct violation of the antitrust laws. The battle raged for five years. The best legal brains in the land fought on interminably in what was up to then the longest court war in history. But Standard Oil lost. When Judge Kennesaw Mountain Landis handed down his decision, lawyers for the defense feared that old John D. would take it very hard, but they didn't know how much he'd changed. That night, one of the lawyers got John D. on the phone. He discussed the decision as gently as he could and then said with concern, I hope you won't let this decision upset you, Mr. Rockefeller. I hope you'll be able to get a good night's sleep. And old John D.? Why, he cackled right back across the wire, Don't worry, Mr. Johnson, I intend to get a night's sleep, and don't let it bother you either. Good night. And that, from the man who had once taken to his bed because he had lost $150. Yes, it took a long time for John D. to conquer worry. He was dying at 53, but he lived to 98. I was committing slow suicide because I didn't know how to relax, by Paul Sampson. Up to six months ago, I was rushing through life in high gear. I was always tense, never relaxed. I arrived at home from work every night, worried and exhausted from nervous fatigue. Why? Because no one ever said to me, Paul, you're killing yourself. Why don't you slow down? Why don't you relax? I would get up fast in the morning, eat fast, shave fast, dress fast, and drive to work as if I were afraid the steering wheel would fly out the window if I didn't have a death grip on it. I worked fast, hurried home, and at night I even tried to sleep fast. I was in such a state that I went to see a famous nerve specialist in Detroit. He told me to relax. He told me to think of relaxing all the time, to think about it when I was working, driving, eating, and trying to go to sleep. He told me that I was committing slow suicide because I didn't know how to relax. Ever since then, I've practiced relaxation. When I go to bed at night, I don't try to go to sleep until I've consciously relaxed my body and my breathing. 
and now I wake up in the morning rested, a big improvement, because I used to wake up in the morning tired and tense. I relax now when I eat and when I drive. To be sure, I'm alert when driving, but I drive with my mind now instead of my nerves. The most important place I relax is at my work. Several times a day I stop everything and take inventory of myself to see if I'm entirely relaxed. When the phone rings now, no longer do I grab it as though someone were trying to beat me to it, and when someone is talking to me, I am as relaxed as a sleeping baby. The result? Life is much more pleasant and enjoyable, and I'm completely free of nervous fatigue and nervous worry. A Real Miracle Happened to Me by Mrs. John Berger Worry had completely defeated me. My mind was so confused and troubled that I could see no joy in living. My nerves were so strained that I could neither sleep at night nor relax by day. My three young children were widely separated, living with relatives. My husband, having recently returned from the armed service, was in another city trying to establish a law practice. I felt all the insecurities and uncertainties of the post-war readjustment period. I was threatening my husband's career, my children's natural endowment of a happy, normal home life, and I was also threatening my own life. My husband could find no housing, and the only solution was to build. Everything depended on my getting well. The more I realized this, and the harder I would try, the greater would be my fear of failure. Then I developed a fear of planning for any responsibility. I felt that I could no longer trust myself. I felt I was a complete failure. When all was darkest, and there seemed to be no help, my mother did something for me that I shall never forget or cease being grateful for. She shocked me into fighting back. She upbraided me for giving in and for losing control of my nerves and my mind. She challenged me to get up out of bed and fight for all I had. She said I was giving in to the situation, fearing it instead of facing it, running away from life instead of living it. So I did start fighting from that day on. That very weekend, I told my parents they could go home because I was going to take over, and I did what seemed impossible at the time. I was left alone to care for my two younger children. I slept well, I began to eat better, and my spirits began to improve. A week later, when they returned to visit me again, they found me singing at my ironing. I had a sense of well-being because I'd begun to fight a battle and I was winning. I shall never forget this lesson. If a situation seems insurmountable, face it. Start fighting. Don't give in. From that time on, I forced myself to work and lost myself in my work. Finally, I gathered my children together and joined my husband in our new home. I resolved that I would become well enough to give my lovely family a strong, happy mother. I became engrossed with plans for our home, plans for my children, plans for my husband, plans for everything except for me. I became too busy to think of myself, and it was then that the real miracle happened. I grew stronger and stronger and could wake up with the joy of well-being, the joy of planning for the new day ahead, the joy of living. And although days of depression did creep in occasionally after that, especially when I was tired, I would tell myself not to think or try to reason with myself on those days, and gradually they became fewer and fewer and finally disappeared. Now, a year later, I have a very happy, successful husband, a beautiful home that I can work in 16 hours a day, and three healthy, happy children, and for myself, peace of mind. How Benjamin Franklin Conquered Worry A letter from Benjamin Franklin to Joseph Priestley. The latter, invited to become librarian for the Earl of Shelburne, asked Franklin's advice. Franklin, in his letter, states his method of solving problems without worrying. London, September 19, 1772 Dear Sir, in the affair of so much importance to you wherein you ask my advice, I cannot, for want of sufficient premise, advise you what to determine, but, if you please, I will tell you how. 
When these difficult cases occur, they are difficult chiefly because while we have them under consideration, all the reasons pro and con are not present to the mind at the same time, but sometimes one set present themselves, and at other times another, the first being out of sight. Hence the various purposes or inclinations that alternately prevail, and the uncertainty that perplexes us. To get over this, my way is to divide half a sheet of paper by a line into two columns, writing over the one pro and over the other con. Then during three or four days' consideration, I put down under the different heads short hints of the different motives that at different times occur to me, for or against the measure. When I have thus got them all together in one view, I endeavor to estimate their respective weights, and where I find two, one on each side, that seem equal, I strike them both out. If I find a reason pro equal to some two reasons con, I can strike out the three. If I judge some two reasons con equal to some three reasons pro, I strike out the five, and thus proceeding I find at length where the balance lies. And if, after a day or two of further consideration, nothing new that is of importance occurs on either side, I come to a determination accordingly. And though the weight of reasons cannot be taken with the precision of algebraic quantities, yet when each is thus considered separately and comparatively, and the whole lies before me, I think I can judge better, and am less likely to make a rash step, and, in fact, I have found great advantage from this kind of equation in what may be called moral or prudential algebra. Wishing sincerely that you may determine for the best, I am ever, my dear friend, yours most affectionately, Ben Franklin. I was so worried I didn't eat a bite of solid food for eighteen days by Catherine Holcomb Farmer. Three months ago I was so worried that I didn't sleep for four days and nights and did not eat a bite of solid food for eighteen days. Even the smell of food made me violently sick. I cannot find words to describe the mental anguish I endured. I wonder whether hell has any worse tortures than what I went through. I felt as if I would go insane or die. I knew that I couldn't possibly continue living as I was. The turning point of my life was the day I was given an advanced copy of this book. During the last three months, I have practically lived with this book, studying every page, desperately trying to find a new way of life. The change that has occurred in my mental outlook and emotional stability is almost unbelievable. I am now able to endure the battles of each passing day. I now realize that in the past I was being driven half-mad, not by today's problems, but by the bitterness and anxiety over something that had happened yesterday, or that I feared might happen tomorrow. But now, when I find myself starting to worry about anything, I immediately stop and start to apply some of the principles I learned from studying this book. If I am tempted to tense up over something that must be done today, I get busy and do it immediately and get it off my mind. When I am faced with the kind of problems that used to drive me half crazy, I now calmly set about trying to apply the three steps outlined in Chapter 2, Part 1. First, I ask myself, what is the worst that can possibly happen? Second, I try to accept it mentally. Third, I concentrate on the problem and see how I can improve the worst, which I am already willing to accept, if I have to. When I find myself worrying about a thing I cannot change and do not want to accept, I stop myself short and repeat this little prayer. God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Since reading this book, I am really experiencing a new and glorious way of life. I am no longer destroying my health and happiness by anxiety. I can sleep nine hours a night now. I enjoy my food. A veil has been lifted from me. A door has been opened. I can now see and enjoy the beauty of the world which surrounds me. I thank God for life now and for the privilege of living in such a wonderful world.
May I suggest that you also read this book over. Keep it by your bed. Underscore the parts that apply to your problems. Study it. Use it. For this is not a reading book in the ordinary sense. It is written as a guidebook to a new way of life. Thank you.